Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Chicago Board of Education meeting. Today is August 26, 2020. We are holding today's meeting electronically via Zoom. I am Miguel Del Valle. On behalf of my fellow board members, thank you for joining us today. Regular meeting of Wednesday, August 26, 2020 is hereby called to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. President. Member Rome? Here. Member Melendez? Member Melendez? Here. I'm sorry. Did it Thank you. Did Vice you President Revelluri? Here. Member Tad Breland? Here. Member Truss? Here. Member Sotelo? Here. President Del Valle? Here. We have seven members present. There is a quorum. I would also like to recognize Dr. Janice Jackson, our Chief Executive Officer, Joseph Moriarty, our General Counsel, and also note that he is physically present in the boardroom. We have Latanya McDade, our Chief Education Officer, and Chief Operating Officer, Arnie Rivera. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we are on Zoom for this month's meeting out of an abundance of caution for staff and board members. We are hoping that the coming months will lower the positivity rate and we can resume in-person meetings permanently. I personally am in the board office along with most of our staff and some of other board members, but just not meeting in the same room. I encourage all of you to wear your mask, observe social distancing and follow all the CDC guidelines so we can not only get back to in-person meetings, but more importantly, move to in-person instruction. One change I'm happy to announce for this meeting is that we've increased public participation to 30 public participants to increase community voice. We will continue to work on raising that number back to 60 um, as soon as we can. On another topic, uh, I want to remind people how important it is to fill out the census. It's not too late. Uh, we need you, if you haven't done the census, to complete the census. The census is the basis by which resources, federal resources get distributed, distributed to different communities. And Chicago desperately needs those resources. It's critical that all voices are counted you can go to 2020census.gov, that's 2020census.gov, and fill out the form today. The order of the meetings will be, uh, the meeting will be as follows. We'll start with honoring excellence, uh, then move to CEO remarks, committee updates and announcements, public participation via electronic formats, uh, presentations on the FY21 budget, FY21 capital budget, school resource officers update, and COVID-19 update. Discussion of public agenda items, vote on public agenda items, vote on executive session items, and then adjournment. Chief McDade, please proceed with honoring excellence. Thank you, President Del Valle. Good morning. We will begin today's Board of Education meeting by welcoming four inspirational members of the class of 2020. Each of these students is a dreamer. They came to the United States from around the globe and have contributed to our culture and community. These four students worked incredibly hard in high school and are the recipients of the 2020 CPS Dream Fund Scholarship. I wanna thank everyone in our CPS community who has contributed to this scholarship fund, which has been helping our undocumented students pursue their dream of a college education since 2014. That tradition continues with this year's four scholarship winners. Luis Navarez from our Office of Language and Cultural Education will now introduce these accomplished students who will then each share a few words with us. Luis. Do we have Luis Narvaez? Thank you, Chief McDade. 
Um, and thank you, everyone, for recognizing our Dreamer students from the class of 2020. As it was already mentioned, these are some of the best and brightest students across the Chicago public schools. These students come from selective enrollment, neighborhood schools, and charter and option schools. And they're just an inspiration for all of us. They make us proud of their achievements, and we are very excited of what, what is to come ahead for them. The four scholars uh, that we wanted to recognize today include Christian, Moyo, Paula, and Vicente. And there's just an example of the dedication and hard work of our immigrant students. We would also like to recognize their parents, family members, and the educators who help the students achieve the CPS 2020 Dream Fund Scholarship. So at this point, we, I would like to invite some of our scholars to say a few remarks. Some of them, I know we have them actually already starting class, so they were, they were not able to join us, but we have a few of them here with us in this call. So if any of our scholars are ready to say a few remarks. Moyo, we can start with you if you're here, Moyo. Otherwise, if Paula or yep. Vicente are here, go ahead. Good morning. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Luis. It's a privilege to address you this morning as an awardee of the scholarship. My name is Moyo. What can I express how grateful I am for the support I have sent through this opportunity and the support that is to come from this team? It gladdens my heart that students like me are being recognized today, and we're not only being recognized through our immigration status, but also because we are hardworking, relentless students, and we have grown to become positive contributions to the community. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and it's such a blessing to have such thoughtful people like you guys on my side. And not only am I willing to keep working hard and to continue helping other students like me, because it's the right thing to do, but well, it's also a way to ensure that the concerns of the students are addressed. So I'm very open to any ideas, initiatives, volunteer capacities, anything, just to make sure that this opportunity is being taken forward. Thank you very much once again. And I look forward to working with all of you all in the next, in the near future, to bring similar opportunities to those who need it. Do we have any other scholars on the line with us? Paula? Hello, my name is Vicente. Please proceed, and, Vicente. Thank you. And I'd like to say that I'm very thankful for the scholarship, not only because it not only helps me and my family, but it helps other people try, other people who are in the same position as me, be able to have that little bit of extra help to be able to see college as more as an obtainable because as we all know, college could become very expensive for some families. And due to the fact that some students don't even go because it's too expensive, this kind of scholarship kind of like helps motivate dreamers into like, into like basically fighting for the scholarship and looking for more scholarships similar to this in order to like have that extra aid because we don't all have the same financial help as like citizen students. So this is a very great help and I really love this kind of this scholarship and I'm very great, thankful and grateful to have been a winner. Thank you Vicente and I know Paula and Christian were not able to join us as they have already started uh, classes but I know they're very appreciative of the support of the CPS community in helping out uh, raise funds for this scholarship. Thank you very much. President Del Valle, um, would, the, would any board members like to address the students? The board members? I, I, I just, want to um, go ahead. I was just going to say congratulations and good luck to everybody, particularly those who have started already. Um, I started back teaching this week at UIC, and I know that some of our CPS students are on 
virtual campus <laughs> with me um, and that others are all around the country and we're just so very proud of you. I also want to e express uh, my appreciation for, for the students uh, taking the time today to, to share with us uh, their experience and, and to share their, their appreciation for, for the scholarship that's been given. And I want to thank uh, Luis and, and other CPS uh, staff uh, who have worked hard uh, to grow this scholarship and, and help more students. So congratulations to the students and congratulations to, to the staff that are helping make these scholarships happen for some students that uh, are excellent students and whose leadership uh, uh, and the leadership skills that they will be developing uh, or are in the process of developing are very much needed. Uh, so thank you. Uh, other board members. Yes, President Devaya. Yes. The, um, just, I just wanted to join in congratulating the, the uh, award recipients and telling them that we are very, very proud of them for their achievement and for setting example for others that are coming behind them. And also um, appreciation for all the CPS uh, management and staff that makes this possible. President Devaya. Board members, tell them. Great, thank you. Um, first, let me start with by thanking Luis and the team for continuing this uh, Dreamers Fund. It's unfortunate we had to cancel the actual reception, but hopefully we kept the funds and we can use them some other times because we're, we're certainly short of funds, um, which I want to call out two comments, one by Vicente. Uh, first, thank you for all the hard work in earning this, this funds but also your hindsight to also look at other sources of funds because school can certainly be expensive, but never let the cost be the barrier. So continue to look for alternative sources of funds, not just this one and others. And then Moyo, uh, I really love your comment about giving back. If we can all just kind of anchor on something like that by making sure that we uh, certainly cherish uh, the, the sources of funds like this, but then use it as a mechanism to uh, give back to others. Uh, and if we can all kind of learn from Moyo's comments, I think we'll all be in a much better, better place. Thank you. Any other board member? Uh, Mrs. President? Yes, board member yeah, Trust. I just, wanna, I, just, I just wanna make sure they hear my hand clap for their hard work and uh, thank right. you, staff. <laughs> Good, thank you. Okay, Not thank okay. you. Mr. I President, could, uh, yeah, I don't know um, if Luis is member. Rome, go ahead. Rome. I'd like to echo the celebration and the gratitude for Luis and the team for keeping this work going, and um, hoping that you're feeling celebrated, even though this isn't quite the in-person um, honor and celebration that you you would have had otherwise. Um, but we look forward to having you come back and share your successes with us and other CPS students. Um, congratulations on your hard work and your tenacity. Vice President Rebel Lord. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, congratulations to, to both of you and to the other recipients and, and really to all of the students who are in your position. It was an unprecedented senior year. It's going to be an unprecedented first year of college. Uh, I'm confident you'll do great. And thank you for, for raising your voices about helping one another as well and helping the students coming after you. Uh, I don't know if Luis is still on, but if there's any information he could share about supporting the Dream Fund, I think uh, that would be good to, to spread the word. Uh, Hi, sure. I'm here. Yes, um, thank Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to the board. I would like to uh, provide the website where members of the community can donate towards this scholarship fund. It is cps.edu forward slash CPS Dream Fund. We are part of the Children's First Fund, so any donations are tax deductible, and we are very appreciative of all the donations we received so far this year. The work continues. We will always be working hard to support our immigrant student community at CPS, and we appreciate any donations made to cps.edu forward slash CPS Dream Fund. And we look forward to having a gala this coming year to continue uh, recognizing our students and our donors. And as a reminder to all of our students listening, uh, 
you are meant to be here and know that we have an entire community supporting you uh, through the donations that they provide. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Chief McDade. All right, uh, Moyo, just uh, note Moyo is going, will be attending Emory University. Um, well, they've started now um, studying medicine and uh, Vicente will, is attending uh, University of Illinois at Chicago studying psychology. So I'm um, excited for both of you. Congratulations and congratulations to all of our dreamers. We're excited uh, that in the less than two weeks, we will kick off another successful school year. Last week, we released our final reopening framework, which commits to providing students with an engaging learning experience that significantly improves on what students and families experienced last school year. Uh, last week, we also brought together all of our principals and chiefs together for our annual administrator summit. And I want to thank each of the board members that were able to attend this year's summit. Your presence was truly appreciated. We discussed our reopening plan in great detail and the enthusiasm was palpable. Our school and network leaders are committed to making remote learning a success, and we are confident their positivity will inspire teachers and support staff who will be leading this work each and every day. One of the things we stressed most at this year's summit is that our educators are not in this alone. We will continue providing them with the training, resources, and professional development opportunities to feel fully prepared to help students learn at home. And as a matter of fact, we just released a full suite of professional learning um, for all of our teachers to take advantage of, not to mention earlier opportunities that were available like Tech Talk and Google Palooza, which last week offered five days of professional development focused on remote learning. Sessions explored instructional technology, distance learning, and Google integration in the classroom, all of which our teachers will need as they begin the new year remotely. We shared additional professional development opportunities with our teachers earlier this week and look forward to their participation in the days ahead. These workshops will cover everything from the effective use of Google tools to high quality remote instruction to the high quality culturally relevant resources that are now available through Skyline, which is the curriculum suite that came out of the curriculum equity initiative. But our support will not stop with our educators. We are also providing our students and families with the resources they need to navigate learning at home. In the coming days, we will provide our parents and students with easy to understand guidance on everything from how to access their CPS email account to how to obtain computing devices and access high speed internet uh, at no cost. Our goal is to ensure that students receive the same level of academic and social um, emotional learning support at home as they would in the classroom. And we will accomplish this by working together as one CPS team. Mr. President, this concludes my prepared remarks. Uh, thank you, Chief McDade. Uh, we'll now proceed to uh, seal Dr. Janice Jackson's uh, remarks. Dr. Jackson. Thank you, President Del Valle. Um, good morning. I want to start uh, by urging all of our families to complete the child supervision site survey that was administered last week. Um, this survey will help Chicago public schools as well as the city of Chicago determine who may need a safe space for their children to be educated during our remote learning environment. We are currently evaluating sites that can be used for child supervision during the remote learning, um, during remote learning for the first quarter, and we will follow up with eligible families after they complete the survey. All of our school administrators have administered those surveys, and again, we want to encourage you to check your email that's on file with CPS for additional information. I now would like to briefly touch on four topics, some of which you will hear about in more detail um, after public participation when members of my team provide a more thorough update to the board. First, I would like to highlight the changes that we've made to the SRO program here in CPS. As part of a holistic approach to school safety, we're putting these reforms in place in all of our schools to in, in all of our schools that have elected to include uh, SROs to ensure that each school has an individualized safety plan that meets their needs. CPS will also partner with Lurie's Ch uh, Children's Hospital, the University of Chicago, and a variety of student groups to provide SROs with specialized training that will help foster a safe environment, 
uh, they will also help to study the impact of the program on the children in schools with SROs. And also the students will help us identify ways for SROs to better engage with students in the school environment. As part of the intergovernmental agreement that is being presented today, all Chicago uh, Police Department SROs in our schools will now be required to have exceptional disciplinary records in order to serve in a CPS school. Later, you will hear from Jadine Child, Child, the Chief of Safety and Security, and she will provide a more thorough examination of those reforms. But for now, I wanna take this opportunity to say to all of our school communities that your voices have been heard. Um, it's no secret that this has been an incredibly complicated process and we've heard from people all across the city with varying viewpoints. We want you to know that all of your feedback is essential and was used in the decision-making process for this school year. We will continue to engage you after today's um, decision. And we also uh, want people to know that we've made reforms related to their feedback. We've upgraded the program as a result of their feedback. And we've also reduced our reliance on SROs as a result of their feedback. Today, um, we will also be presenting the operating and capital budget for the upcoming school year. We also know it's important to note that due to COVID, all school systems throughout mm -hmm. the country are uh, worried about uh, balancing our budgets. But we're happy to report that we're presenting a balanced budget here today, um, a budget that does rely on additional support from the federal government, which we've talked about. But we're proud to say that we have increased the amount of investment across the school system by $125 million, one of the largest investments in the uh, history of Chicago public schools for our diverse learners. We've also expanded our equity grant to include over 255 schools in the city. These are schools that have been identified as our highest need schools. We're increasing the number of social workers, nurses, and special ed case managers in our schools. Again, another all-time high. In addition to those investments, we're making an additional $653 million capital um, investment to modernize classrooms uh, and spaces in more than 250 schools. Specifically, these schools will see one of the following improvements, uh, new pre-K classrooms, modernized science labs, and new spaces to support the expansion of high quality academic programs such as STEM, IB, world language, and personalized learning. Other capital investments will address key facility needs, including bathroom renovations in elementary schools, ADA upgrades that will move us closer to our goal of making sure that every first floor in CPS is accessible to students and adults with disabilities. This year's capital plan was shaped by the first of its kind equity index, which you will hear more about during the presentation today. This year's budget also includes a $75 million investment to support our students and staff during the pandemic. These funds will help ensure that all students have the necessary computing devices um, that they need in order to engage in remote learning. Funds will also be used for PPE, cleaning supplies, contact tracing, and other resources that will help the district resume in-person instruction when our health experts advise us that it is safe to do so. In addition to those investments, we will continue to work on the Chicago Connected Initiative, which seeks to uh, provide high-speed broadband internet for four years to 100,000 CPS students. To date, we've had about 18,000 students register for the program. We are working um, extremely hard to get the word out to eligible families. I wanna remind families to check their CPS emails because those eligibility letters have been mailed. If you are wondering if you are eligible, please contact your school directly and the principal or clerk will be able to tell you if you're on that eligibility list. If you would like more information, please visit our website, cps.edu forward slash get connected. Again, that's cps.edu forward slash get connected. The fourth presentation that you will hear today will provide another update on remote learning. You will hear from a variety of chiefs and executive directors on our team. I'm in the offices of teaching and learning, network support, and SEL, so that they can explain to you our efforts to educate students um, in a remote environment. The one thing that remains clear is that our North Star is still the five-year vision that has been outlined for CPS. While we understand that this is a historic moment and unprecedented times, our commitment to providing students with a high quality education remains unchanged. In the days ahead, uh, we know that there will be surprises. 
We're trying to work to mitigate those as much as possible. And there will definitely be moments of challenge for, challenge for us as a school system. But I remain excited about the first day of school, just as I have for the past 20 years in public education. And I hope that you share that excitement. We have an opportunity this year to build a new system that leaves behind the inequities that are inherent in the current public education system. It is imperative that all educators and all adults working on behalf of our students work hand in hand to make sure that our kids benefit from our remote learning environment um, this year. Later, you will hear from others on my team uh, who will provide a more thorough update of, on our efforts. Mr. President, this concludes my prepared remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, uh, there will be no committee updates for this meeting. Um, now for announcements, uh, please use our website, cpsboe.org, if you want to seek assistance or want to meet with a board member during office hours. We encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to meet with board members outside of a board meeting. Madam Secretary, please share the details of the next board meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the next board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, September 23rd, 2020. Advanced registration will open at 10.30 a.m. on Monday, September 21st, 2020, and will close on Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020 at 5 p.m. or until all slots are filled, whichever is first. If anyone has any questions about this process, um, you can contact us. Uh, I would also like to note for the record that we will announce if the board meeting uh, will be an in-person or virtual via the website again. Uh, please monitor the cpsboe.org website for more information. Thank you, Mr. President. Let's now proceed with today's public participation session. As a reminder, union representatives will speak before public participation and any elected officials will speak after the conclusion of public participation. Madam Secretary, please share the rules for public participation. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the public who registered to speak were given information to access this meeting by dialing a number and using their phone. We did this so that speakers with limited or no access to internet or who may have weak internet, in internet connection could still participate using their phones. Also, members of the public may submit written comments for Board of Education meetings via the written comments form on the board's website at www.cpsboe.org or mail to 1 North Dearborn Suite 950. Written comments received between the day the public agenda is posted through 5 p.m. the day after the Board of Education meeting will be submitted to the board and published within the five business days on our website at www.cpsboe.org. Speakers, please listen while I provide directions for public participation. In order to facilitate and expedite public participation, I will be calling speakers out of order and grouping them. I will call your name uh, and your number when it is your turn to speak. Once you hear your name, please state your name for the record and then the uh, two minute timer will start. When there are 30 seconds remaining, I will inform you um, so that you can proceed to conclude your remarks to allow for the next speaker to begin. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, we do have some elected officials that will um, start off with public participation and then we'll proceed with the I'm sorry, union representatives will start off um, first and then we'll proceed with the speakers list and then we will have Alderman um, address the board as well. Um, please our call first the first speaker, speaker. Our first speaker, Mr. President, then is Maria Moreno, please. Um, Financial Secretary for the Chicago Teachers Union. Ms. Moreno. Ms. Moreno, can you hear me? Good morning. Thank you, please proceed. Uh, since March with the beginning of remote learning, our members worked hard to create the infrastructure to support our families and teach in a brand new form. In June, the mayor was very clear about the necessity of reopening the schools to in-person instruction, even with the increasing COVID infection rate. Not only did we disagree with this position, but our families disagreed with sending their children back into the buildings. Throughout the pandemic, the mayor has shown terrible judgment with the needs of our school communities. That judgment now extends to the very concept of remote learning as CPS claims that remote learning does not include remote working. 
On Monday, CPS announced that a wide range of our members must work in person in schools, including school clerks, clinicians, sign language interpreters, and more. In discussions with the board yesterday, we learned that CPS still did not have a health and safety plan in place in school buildings to protect workers from the spread of COVID. We learned yesterday that CPS fully intends for our clerks to be working in the buildings the entire first quarter. CPS is putting the health and safety of our members at peril, peril most immediately our clerks who are pushed into unsafe buildings today. Their lives matter and they can do their work remotely. ISBE has told school districts that they must bargain with unions over remote learning conditions. The mayor through CPS has refused. We have made proposals to CPS about how clerks can handle registration and re enrollment remotely, and they said no. We propose following a smart start program like the one negotiated in LA school districts that would ensure all families had the necessary devices and technology to provide assistance and training to par parents CPS said no, they did not have to bargain over that. We've called for more prep time and professional development for educators who are doing twice the work with remote learning. CPS said no. We propose more humane, flexible, and age-appropriate remote schedules for our students. CPS said no. CPS step up to the plate and lead with decency and real concern for students and workers. Anything short of that opens the door to more illness and more debt, and we won't stand for it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Moreno. Mr. Uh, President, I'll continue with the next speaker. Uh, we have Chris Bayron, please, CTU uh, Charter Chair Division. Mr. Bayron. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, Great. we can hear you. Please proceed. All right. Uh, thank you, Chairman Del Valle, members of the board, uh, CEO Jackson, others present. Um, so I, I mean, I'm the leader of the charter division for the Chicago Teachers Union, and as we, uh, as the school year approached, we were led to believe that CPS would exercise some oversight over charter operators, not allowing them to open in a less safe fashion than CPS was opening, meaning that teachers and the parents would not be working in the buildings. Um, you know, clerks as well, we believe, should not be in the buildings. However, uh, CPS abdicated that responsibility, and we have had to fight with operators uh, to not send our members into the building without any good rationale. We get rationales like, well, their internet speed was too low, or people walked in the background, like some really easy to solve for things, uh, which can be solved without putting members' health and safety at risk, their lives at risk. Um, so we have had to negotiate, and all but one charter has now agreed to uh, uh, not force educators to force them to work in the classroom. Um, but we've had to fight for that. And uh, so, number one, the board really should need to exercise oversight over charters. What's happening in the non-union charters? We are hearing about people forced to be uh, in unsafe working conditions, and uh, this board really needs to exercise some oversight. And I would also like to point out that we have negotiated with charter operators who've been in groups done egregiously anti-union things in the past and come to agreements with them uh, on what makes sense, uh, you know, for, for remote learning. And CPS has not done that, has not negotiated in good faith with the Chicago Teachers Union. And so we're asking for some oversight of the charter and to negotiate in good faith to come to an agreement that uh, keeps members safe and allows remote learning to be as effective as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bayer, and thank you for your comments. Mr. President, I would like to note that we did have other individuals um, elected officials who requested to address the board, but they're not online at the moment. Um, we'll continue, and as if they call in, I'll interject and then introduce them to address the board at that point in time. Um, so right now, Mr. President, uh, we will uh, begin with the speakers list, and I'll um, start off by calling speaker number 21, Citlali Perez, please. Ms. Perez, let us, let us proceed then with speaker number one, Natasha Erkstein. Ms. Erkstein, can you hear me?
she promoted? Ms. Erskine? She'll join us in just a second. Ms. Erskine? Can you please unmute yourself? Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. You can proceed. Yes. Um, my name is Natasha. I'm a mom of a rising CPS senior and myself a proud CPS K-12 alum. Today I'm speaking in my capacity as a parent advocate with Raise Your Hand for Illinois Publication, um, Public Education um, Community Group. <clears throat> in the spring when COVID-19 forced the closure of our schools, I facilitated 16 weekly Raise Your Hand solidarity calls attended by over 500 primary CPS stakeholders, LSCs, parents, caregivers, community members. We held listening sessions with students to understand their needs and made remote learning in their movement to learn or, or to improve learning um, during that time. And one of the things that was really important is to hear, you know, what they need um, to improve their learning. Um, and one of the things in this moment has been police-free schools. And so um, we welcome CPS and board members on those listening sessions and appreciate the time that they made um, to join those evening calls. And it is in that spirit that I make the comments today, um, informed and having attended well over 30 LSE meetings around the SRO decision. Listen, one thing that is clear is that SROs are being used in schools that are predominantly black, um, impacting black students at a higher rate than their peers, those with specialized Mr. needs. You have 30 seconds to conclude. Thank you. And so one of the things that the LSE meetings told us was that um, CPS has a need to invest in real restorative and transformative, um, transformative justice. One of the things that um, I'm concerned about <clears throat> is the reforms that were shared from the board um, in terms of um, the SRO. It just doesn't meet the need. Um, and this is a moment to free our schools completely of police. And just lastly, in the final moments as I close, the resolution that was proposed does not, it is vague at best, and it really doesn't give um, um, real substance and foundation for a, a completely involved and immersed um, collaborative process that allows the community to, to say how we keep ourselves safe in our schools. And that you, looks Ms. like Erskine. counselors and other nurses. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, we'll proceed with speaker number 21 now. Nabi Perez, please. Ms. Perez. I'm sorry, she keeps on dropping. We'll continue. Uh, our next speaker is speaker number two, Mr. President, Leandra Khan, please. She'll join us in just a second. Ms. Khan? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. You have two minutes to address the board. Please proceed. Thanks. Um, as stated, I'm Leandra Khan. I'm the executive director of Epic Academy. Epic is a single site charter school located on the southeast side. We serve students from over cities across our city with an enrollment of five So we we'll provide all of our student devices. And we started the pandemic in March with 70% student engagement and saw 90% engagement by June. To prepare for this school year, we convened school-based communities focused around four major areas, building operations, classroom operations, teaching and learning, and family and community engagement. The teams consisted of leaders from the building, teachers, and staff. We worked, worked through three scenarios, all virtual, all in-person, and a hybrid scenario, and outlined 
best practices for asynchronous and synchronous learning. And we had multiple sessions over the summer that informed our remote learning roadmap. We presented the roadmap to our school community and we surveyed staff and parents and students about the following. Their comfort level of returning to the building, the quality of engagement during remote learning in the spring, scheduling options, their top concerns about safety and for feedback on the plan. We hosted virtual town halls for students and families and allowed them to give us live feedback on the plan. Our priorities in North Star are maintaining the connections and SEL for all. We wanna make sure that our students, teachers, families still get what they need from us and that we can support them in this new way of living and learning. So we're gonna focus on power standards for remediation and the use of a new learning management system. This increases our transparency, our communication, and access to resources for our students and families. We know that this time has had an impact on people in a variety of ways and want to make sure that we are checking in our, on their mental health. So we're offering free teledoc services for our employees for this school year. We have increased the size of our social work team to better support student needs. Um, Myself and a lot of other charter leaders have joined with INCS in this charter leaders working group that has informed a lot of what we presented to our school community. And I was part of the staff working group and we talked through a lot of adult support um, protocols for leave, alternate job responsibilities for non-teaching staff and so much more. Ms. We are, yes ma'am. Thank you for your comments. You're beyond your two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, we'll proceed with the next speakers. Uh, we have speaker number three, please, Cindy Wang, followed by speaker number four, Maylene Vasanova. Ms. Wang? Yes, hello. This is Cindy Wang. Cindy Wang, please. Hello, proceed. my name. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Cindy Wang, and I'm a mom of a rising first and third grader at Foganesh Elementary. When my daughter entered kindergarten in 2017, the roster on orientation day had over 40 children on the list per classroom. They're looking in the suburbs to this absurd number. As a result of the booming class size, Saganesh administration moved music to a cart and opened a third classroom. However, is that fair for the entire community, the student body, and the teacher to lose a common classroom such as music? Fast forward, my son started kindergarten in 2019, and yet again, the numbers are staggering at over 90 plus students for the upcoming class. And yet again, another special was moved to a cart. This is not sustainable to continue forcing huge admission per grade to only two homerooms. If enrollment continues to be around 90 students each year for the upcoming kindergarten class, it is impossible to sustain the structure. There are no rooms available. Each grade needs three classrooms and we need this. It is unsafe to congregate large classes in the gym. It is unsafe to hold small groups at landings at the staircase. It is unsafe to have 40 students in a class that can only hold 32 desks. Enrollment has increased 29% in the last 10 years, and it will continue. A new development, the Saganash Glen had 34 new single-family homes. Also, empty nesters out of old, smaller ranches or Victorian homes are being converted to four- to five-bedroom large homes. Surrounding schools are overcrowded or close to being overcrowded on the northwest side. Wang, I, love this, seconds. I love this community where my half-Chinese and my half-Korean children family diversity, cultures, and differences. This diversity combined with family engagement and amazing administration is what makes Saganesh a phenomenal school. Please approve the budget with the capital expansion funds for Saganesh Elementary. Thank you for your time and service. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, our next speaker will be Malin Vasanavant, followed by speaker number 12, Kristen Matamore. Hello, this is Malin Vasanavant. Thank you. Please proceed. You have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Malin Vasavanand. As an alumni of a CPS elementary school and first generation Asian American who benefited from the ESL program, I am proud and grateful for the opportunity to speak to the Board of Education today. I am here to request your support for the capital expansion to reduce overcrowding at Saganesh Elementary School. 12 years ago, we moved to our neighborhood because it was important that we remain in Chicago and that our children attend a diverse public neighborhood school. The beauty of Saganash School comes from its diverse student population and strong sense of community. Carissa and Ella are part of the 45% of students who speak a second language at home. Their differences are celebrated on a day-to-day -day basis and during our international night, which is the most attended event at our school. 
This makes our neighborhood and school desirable. And recently in my neighborhood, empty nesters are moving out and new larger families are moving in. Currently on my side of the block alone, there are at least eight toddlers who will be enrolling at Saganash in the next couple of years. There were 74 students enrolled in kindergarten when Carissa started at Saganash in 2014 and 90 enrolled when Ella entered kindergarten in 2019. I am concerned about the safety of having 664 students in a school that has capacity for 540. The overcrowding is dangerous and we can no longer sustain the growth in the space we have. It worries me to think about what could happen in an emergency. Our teachers are teaching in the hallways and in storage rooms. Our children are learning. You have 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Our children are learning while sitting underneath stairwells. There is no privacy for children who need additional support from our teachers and staff. Music and art classes are now on carts as we needed the classrooms to accommodate the growing class sizes. I commend all the wonderful teachers and staff at our amazing school for coming up with creative ways to address the overcrowding and not having enough space. But with the projected continued growth, the capital expansion is the only solution for Saganash Elementary School. Thank you for your time and for your service. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, our next speaker will be speaker number 12, Kristen Mattimore, followed by 16, Christina Tassoni. Ms. Mattimore? Hi there, my name is Kristen Matamore Burns and my daughter Gretchen attends Saganash School. I'm here today in support of the capital expansion. Our school is currently running at 123% capacity. This is causing overcrowded classrooms, not to mention having no spaces for music, art, science, and technology. Our students definitely deserve better. In this day and age, we encourage women in STEM. Our school will not even have a STEM classroom this year. My daughter is not a high-performing student who will continue to slip through the cracks. How can a teacher develop a relationship with any student when she has over 40 students in a classroom? Many of these students don't even have a desk. Can you imagine not even having a desk? My God, if there is one thing we have learned over these past, past few months is space matters. Even with a hybrid model, our school is having a hard time reducing classroom sizes enough to be an acceptable level of capacity. The virtual model is even more challenging because I don't want my daughter on a screen with over 40 students. She deserves better. While my husband and I both attended Catholic schools, we chose Saganash so Gretchen can experience diversity. We didn't want her to attend a school where everyone looks just like her. We thought it was important that she be exposed Ms. to different Animal, cultures. You have 30 seconds. Saganash households speak 44 languages. Yes, 44. Like many, I moved to Saganash for the school so our community will not accept boundary changes or close enrollment. We are asking for a capital expansion, uh, expansion, including 19 different rooms. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today as a mom of a student at Saganash School. I implore you to consider this expansion. These students matter. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, we'll continue with um, Speaker 16, Christina Tassoni, followed by 17, Sarah Creviston. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. You can proceed. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Christina Tassoni, and I'm an LSC parent rep speaking on behalf of Saganash Elementary School. As you've heard, the following trends we're seeing over the last several years in Saganash and nearby neighborhoods explains why Saganash Elementary is one of the most overcrowded neighborhood schools in the city, along with there are some neighborhood schools, uh, nearby neighborhood schools that are also largely populated. One trend that we're seeing in our neighborhood is an influx of em empty nesters moving out and new large families moving in. Another trend are small family homes are being expanded to accommodate larger families. And a recent development in 2018, Saganesh Glen, consisted of 35 new family-sized homes that were, were added. As you can see, this is why Saganesh Elementary School student population has been increasing at 4% consistently, and last year at 6%. In my block alone, we have 
28 elementary school kids amongst nine families who all moved in around 2010. I mean, do the math for averaging over three kids per family. With the increase of young families, we are seeing mothers with strollers around the neighborhood, and there is and will be more of a demand for preschools to help serve early childhood, especially to support bilingual upcoming students. I was a CPS child who benefited from this, growing up speaking Spanish and English in my home as a first generation Bolivian. Mr. Sony, you have and 30 seconds. Thank you. And, you know, this, with this expansion, we could be compliant with the preschool initiative. Uh, please note, currently 45% of our students speak a second language, 44 languages spoken, 25% of students have ESL instruction. We are grateful for the allocation of funds in the capital budget for an expansion to provide relief to our overcrowded school. I'm here requesting your support in each of your votes on the proposed fiscal year 21 capital budget. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, the next speaker is Sarah Creviston, uh, followed by speaker number 19, Fred Bliss, please. Good morning. Thank you, Ms. Creviston. Please proceed. My name is Sarah Creviston, and I am a parent of three kids at Slogganash School. I am grateful to share my concerns with you today about the severe overcrowding at our school. We started at the school in 2014, and with my two-year-old starting in a few years, my family will be at the school for the next 11 years. I spoke with many of you last week about my son, Leo, in his class of 41 students. And I told you about his anxiety about being helped and, I, and about how uncomfortable he is using the bathroom when it feels overcrowded and unsafe. Thank you for the time. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me again today. Yesterday, I received the kindergarten list for my son, Dashiell, and he is going to be in a class of 40 students. Unless we do something, this problem is not going away. We are out of space. It is difficult to know that soon my five-year-old will be in an overcrowded school, just like his brothers. My two-year-old will be entering preschool next year and Saganash would be a great location for a preschool program, but this is not even feasible because of capacity. A CPS preschool would be in high demand as more young families are moving into our neighborhood. There are a few private school options and some with only two and a half hour school days but there is not an affordable full day option in our neighborhood. The addition of a preschool would allow Saganash to plan and forecast for these growing class sizes as well. This is just another reason Ms. why Travis, this expansion is needed. Thank you. Members thank of the you. board and others present, thank you for the time you've already given to analyze and consider the Saganash Annex. Please keep this positive momentum going and vote in favor of approving this expansion to help many Chicago students and families. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Creviston. Mr. President, we'll proceed with Speaker 19, Fred Bliss, and I would like to note that we, um, he will be followed by uh, Troy LaRivere, uh, President of the Chicago Principals and Administrators Association. Mr. Bliss? Hi, this is Fred Bliss, can you hear me? Yes, sir, please continue. That's great. First, I want to thank everyone for your time today to approve the Saganash Elementary Capital Expansion due to the overcrowding we've heard. I've lived in Chicago for nearly 20 years. I have two daughters, one who's a first grader at Saganash Elementary and a two-year-old who we plan to follow in our footsteps. I'm also a small business owner with a company I started about eight years ago in Chicago that now employs 40 people full-time. We've planted our roots in the city, in this neighborhood, from my business to our family to our friends. We want to be here for the long run. Five years ago, we came to what we call our forever home here in Saganos, but now the heart of it, our school, has set off alarm bells with severe overcrowding and lack of physical space, echoed in detail by many others here. My wife came as an immigrant as a child who didn't speak English and succeeded in public schools in the city through ESL classes held in a private area of the library, which Saganos does not even have because it was converted into a classroom due to overcrowding. Today at Saganash Elementary, ESL classes are taught in hallways, and those essential teachers have no choice but to work out of a storage closet as their offices. I never thought I'd be having serious discussions about leaving our forever home or hearing our neighbors and friends start taking action to seriously do the same thing. COVID has caused people to reconsider where they live, leaving the denser areas of the city to the neighborhoods like Saganash as alternatives to suburbs. 
parents that are new to Saga Nash are shocked to discover that the kindergarten class sizes are nearing 40 and that growth will only continue. The neighborhood has grown while the school's physical capacity Mr. has Bruce, not. you have 30 seconds. Thank you. The physical capacity has not grown with it and we're running out of time. We ask for the capital expansion of Saga Nash Elementary to invest in our school as we've invested in our neighborhood. Without this expansion, we could very well see an exodus from the city and from the neighborhoods we love. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bliss, for your comments. Mr. President, so our next speaker now is uh, Troy LaRere, uh, president of the Chicago Principals and Administrators Association, and he will be followed by speaker number two, I'm sorry, speaker number 22, Tracy Meyer. Mr. Lara Vera. Can you please unmute yourself? Mr. Lara Vera, can you hear me? Can you please unmute? Can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, sir. Please proceed. All right. Thank you very much. Good morning, beautiful people. Um, I contacted several principals yesterday and asked them if they could speak to the board frankly and openly, what would they say? And the following is an amalgamation of about 15 different responses that I got. Uh, I, I just want to make sure our members' voices are heard at this critical time. Every crisis the district has faced could have been prevented if principals had a voice and were seriously listened to when the bells were rung. This includes the poor rollout for remote learning where hundreds of pages with hyperlinks and expectations were rolled out without actual supporting logistics. While the district took months to roll out this haphazard assortment of policies and references, they gave principals a week and a half to turn it into an actual plan. Then our planning was hampered because the district wasted hours of our time on modules and PDs composed of the exact same 20 to 25 slides. On top of that, network chiefs continued to have day-long meetings, which left us with even less time to plan, prepare our teachers and interview candidates to staff our schools, to name just a few tasks that suffered due to CPS's failure to plan and provide the most basic supports to principals. And then they hit us with this on-site mandate. If it's not safe for central office staff to report or for teachers to report, then it's not safe for anyone else. Many of us have children who will be learning from home and we're not COVID immune just because we don't belong to a union. Our lives are no less expendable than our teachers and should not be treated as such. Certainly there will be times we need to be on site, but it should be an as necessary requirement rather than an absolute mandate. Let me manage myself and my staff as I see fit. I know when I need to be in the building and when the rest of my admin team does as well. That goes for my clerk, my AP, my dean of students too. Step aside and stop getting, the, getting in the way of principals making those decisions in partnership with their leadership teams. Stop disrespecting me. Stop disrespecting us. It's simple, extend principals and APs the flexibility to manage their buildings in order to meet students and family needs while also accommodating our own child care, family, and health needs. Now, before I move on to the other principal comments, I need to cite an administration, some administrative compensation data that CPS provided to us several months late and only after our attorneys served them with a lawsuit to plan the file if they did not release this data. The data shows that the average assistant principal makes $54 an hour. The average principal makes $69 an hour, and the average experienced teacher makes $70 per hour. At Curie, their principal gets paid less per hour than 53 of the staff she supervises. Their AP makes less than 170 of the 202 staff people he supervises, he or she supervises. At Green, their AP makes less than 20 of the 21 teachers she supervises, less per hour. At Robert A. Black, their principal makes less than 20 of the 25 teachers he supervises, he or she supervises. And at Jefferson, their AP makes less than 46 of the 48 teachers he supervises. That makes absolutely no sense. 
he makes $51 an hour, and the highest paid teacher that he supervises makes $78 per hour. And what principals have told me repeatedly is they can't get good, good they can't get good teachers to become assistant principals because those teachers don't want to take the pay cut that becoming an assistant principal would involve. Despite this, CPS sent administrators a, a letter yesterday informing them that a, that principals and APs that CPS would not make them whole by addressing these compensation inadequacies. And the following is how several principals responded. This is absolutely unacceptable. We've made sacrifices in the past with furlough days. We endured the insult of 10% hazard duty pay when everyone else got 50%. When teachers and other staff were at home during spring closures, we staffed our buildings to get food and computers to students and families. We worked longer hours than any other staff in the entire last quarter. In the midst of all this, Matt Lyons sends us this email to tell us they won't make us whole by addressing this compensation gap, and they give us this insulting pep talk about how our work is so valuable that they won't pay us for it. I will personally continue to hand out devices at my school because I care about my students, but I cannot continue to do the job of a clerk, a tech coordinator, a nurse, et cetera, and then get insulted. Please fight for us and bring this to light. We are burning out. We are stressed. We are exhausted, and our health is degrading. We are at a breaking point. Principals have made this district. More of us need to be brought into all CPS departments, including law. This means more than consultations. We need a vote in CPS policies and practices. The communication from CPS management is tone deaf and schizophrenic. It goes something like this. We're doing remote learning, so principals, your own school-aged children will be learning from home. Meanwhile, report to your building, but don't bring your children. We appreciate your tireless work, but we won't pay you for it. We value principal autonomy, but we won't give you any. We're going to take all summer to roll out a half-baked remote learning guidance, but then give you less than two weeks to turn it into a workable plan. On top of that, we'll stand in your way at every turn with useless, redundant compliance mandates that will eat up all or most of your instructional leadership time, but be sure to get those tech scores up. By the way, CTU's telling clerks not to report to work tomorrow, but your schedule is doing Aspen ASAP. That, in conclusion, is the life of a CPS principal under this management team that's in place at CPS. They may be competent for another place and another time, but they are certainly not rising to the occasion when you look at what's needed in this district at this moment. The hybrid model was a disaster. The failure to plan for remote learning was a disaster. The rollout of the current guidance is a disaster. And whatever the district does or tries to do in October or November is likely to be a disaster if you leave this management team in place in this district at this moment. Our principals need leadership, but we don't even have good district management, let alone effective leadership. So I ask you, members of the board, to find the courage to do what must be done and remove these obstacles from the path of our principals and replace them with people who can lead or at least not get in the way of the people who do lead, the principals and assistant principals of Chicago Public Schools. Thank you. Our next speaker, Mr. President, will be Tracy Meyer, Speaker 22, followed by Speaker 23, Teresa Court. Ms. Meyer. Can you please unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tracy Mayer, and I've been a proud Saganash parent since 2009. My son, Max, is a sixth grader, and my daughter, Maddie, is a Saganash graduate and will be starting her junior year at Taft. Our neighborhood has changed. When I first moved to Saganash Park in 2004, I remember thinking, where are the kids? I know there's kids here. Well, here we are years later, and the sidewalks are always filled with kids playing. Empty nesters are moving on, and young families are moving in. Several of them are multi-generational families. A new development with 35 single-family homes was recently completed. This development brought more children to our already overcrowded school and more are on the way. 40 students transferred to Saganash from the local private school in the last four years. 16 of our 21 homerooms are overcrowded, some classes with over 40 students. The schools in nearby areas are unable to accommodate more students. 
Shifting attendance would only move the overcrowding issue elsewhere and is not an acceptable option for our families. During a typical school day, we have kids and teachers in makeshift classrooms and stairwells, hallways, storage closets, and outside restrooms. None of these are safe, productive spaces for kids in a normal year, much less during a pandemic. Should our students be given the opportunity for a hybrid learning model, our existing building will be unable to accommodate safe social distancing. In our current structure, we do not have enough classrooms to safely support learning pods of 15 students. We do not even have a Ms. space Mayan, available to use as a, thank you, as a designated care room should a child exhibit COVID symptoms during the school day. If the dream of an annex were to actually come true, the reality is my youngest will have already graduated and will not get to experience it. So why am I spending my time speaking to the board? Because I have witnessed firsthand the struggles of our teachers and administration responding to overcrowding in our school over the last decade, and we are out of options. Thank you for your vote to support Saganesh School, and thank you for your service. Thank you, Ms. Meyer. And the next speaker then is Speaker 23, please, Teresa Court, followed by Speaker 25, uh, Adriana uh, Karasik, please. Ms. Court? Yes, this is Teresa Court. Good yes, morning. Please, please I proceed. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you one more time regarding the needed addition, uh, additional space for Saganesh School. I have been teaching at Saganesh School for over 22 years, and our school has never been so overcrowded. At 123% capacity, we are using every available space, including stairwells, storage rooms, hallways, and even our MDF room. And our growth rate is 4 to 6% yearly. I am passionate about teaching and about Saganesh School. I am passionate about the students at Saganash School. It pains me when there are uh, 40 students in a classroom. And I know I'm missing opportunities to help students or to challenge the students learning the way I want to as an educator. Teaching 40 primary students at one time, getting them set up and learning is hard and frustrating for the students and myself. 40 students all need help at the same time, and it is next to impossible to address 40 students' individual needs in a class period. I know you have heard our story. I hope you feel the sense of community we have. And I hope you truly understand that we really are out of learning space. I am asking for your support in approving the vitally needed expansion at Saganash School. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Court. Thank you for your comments. And the next speaker, Mr. President, Speaker 25, please, Adriana Karasik, followed by Speaker 26, Anita uh, Nikasik. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Karasik, please proceed. Moe Imea Andriana Karacic, Yasem Rodinal Hrvatsku, Imoe Djesa Sudoselenici, Prve Generacije. My name is Andriana Karasik. I'm an ESL bilingual teacher at Saganash for the past 11 years and have two bilingual children attending there. At Saganash, the class sizes have increased year after year as have the social, emotional, and educational needs of them. As teachers, we do our very best to overcome challenges that exist in order to best serve every one of our students. Year after year, we focus on building a strong school and classroom environment and to create a space where our students can learn, achieve, and feel a sense of belonging. While there are always going to be obstacles to face and overcome, having adequate building space should not be one of them. And simply stated, Saganash is overcrowded. Students are forced to sit in pods of five to six students per group with no spare room to move. After a task is given in my class, roughly a third of my class will be moved into the hall to complete their work, while sitting on the floor due to the differentiated needs for instruction and small group work. Groups of stud students are receiving MTSS support at a nearby table, while another group of diverse learners are working with their teachers at a different set of tables, all while music and art are all taking places on the other sides of the doors of our learning. Privacy does not exist in this scenario. Not all students are able to fully participate in these opportunities. Students should not have to experience this type of hardship to be able to access, access their Ms. education. Ms. you have 30 seconds. Thank you. We continue to, to, 
to succeed because of the determination and perseverance of our students, but the overcrowding should not hinder their growth. We believe in CPS's vision and supports the growing of our students as a whole child. We need more space to accommodate them. This vision for all of our future generations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, we'll proceed with speaker 26, Anita Nisislik, followed by 27, Elaine Fitzgerald, and then- uh -huh. Yes, Thank can you. you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Yes. My name is Anita Nikisic. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today in regards to the extreme overcrowding at Saganash Elementary School. I have a son that is entering third grade and a daughter that will enter the school in a few years. I am a proud graduate of Chicago Public Schools and also a former Chicago Public Schools teacher. Saganash Elementary School is currently at 123% capacity and based on new developments and real estate sales in the community, it's trending to grow. Many of the smaller two bedroom ranch style homes are adding additions, thus making them four or five bedroom homes, causing larger families to come into the area. We currently have 664 students and the school's capacity is only 540. I just recently learned we are the most overcrowded neighborhood school in the city of Chicago, and that's not a statistic to be proud of. 16 of the 21 homeroom classrooms are overcrowded. The school has tried their absolute best to maximize the space and are currently out of options. The storage rooms have been converted to general ed rooms, sped rooms, and DL instruction rooms. There has been no library for several years. My third grade son has asked me multiple times why his school doesn't have a library when many of his friends and family member schools do. We do not have a local library in the neighborhood either. So that makes it that much more important that our local school has a library. The fire department has written up 30 seconds for many safety issues. This is one main concern for me in terms of safety for the students and the staff. Our school has lost storage rooms, safe usage of hallways, and safe stairwell usage because these areas are now being used for instruction. I thank you for your time and consideration for the capital expansion for Saganash Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, we'll proceed with Speaker 27, please. Elaine Fitzgerald, followed by Speaker 30, Kathleen Prisnowski. Ms. Fitzgerald. Please unmute. Ms. Fitzgerald, please proceed. We'll proceed with the next speaker, Mr. President. Speaker number 30, Kathleen Prisnowski, please. Hello? Yes, Ms. Kathleen Presnowski. Please proceed. My name is Kathleen Presnowski, and I'm a proud Chicago public school parent at Saganash School. My two daughters will be in fourth and seventh grade this year. Thanks for this opportunity to speak. The entire Saganash community is coming to you with a dire need. The proposed expansion is not a want, and I would say it's even gone beyond a need. As you've heard, we're at 123% capacity with an annual growth rate between four and 6%. The proposed expansion is the only humane thing to do. This past year, my daughter had 40 students in her class. When I volunteered, my heart sank upon entering the classroom. There were tables with smaller chairs to squeeze in more bodies, 40 backpacks on the back of chairs to hold books. I was bursting at the seams with supplies and with humans. This morning, I asked my daughter to think about her class with 40 kids. She said it was hard to focus, that five people were always talking at any given time, and that it was very busy with lots of people standing up, asking to go to the bathroom or to get some supplies. 
When volunteering, I jokingly said to the teacher, I bet you pray for a few kids be sick every day. She responded in a serious tone, no, but it's harder to play catch up and manage the logistics of late assignments while also managing the other 30 plus students. 40 students in a classroom. At what cost? What is the mental health cost Ms. to a Krasowski, student? Ms. you have 30 seconds. Thanks. How much learning is being missed? What is the mental health cost for a teacher responsible for 40 students? Last year on the third day of school, Dr. Jackson visited Saganash and saw our challenges. She was apologetic to our students and staff for the contingent conditions they have to endure. Esteemed Board of Education members, our 664 students speaking 44 different languages, of which 30% are considered economically disadvantaged, are asking for you to vote yes on the proposed capital expansion at Saganash School. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Przesnowski. Mr. President, we'll go back to Ms. Fitzgerald. She's just having some technical difficulties. So when we um, uh, connect with her, we'll, we'll, uh, she'll address the board. Um, the next speakers then will be speaker number five, please. Uh, Jody Cantrell, followed by speaker number six, Matt Major. We do have Elaine Fitzgerald. We'll proceed with Ms. Fitzgerald, Mr. President. Sorry about that. Ms. Fitzgerald? Ms. Fitzgerald? Hello, this is Jody. Ms. Cantrell, one moment, please. We're going to proceed with a, a, a speaker before you. Thank you. Ms. Fitzgerald? You can proceed, Ms. Fitzgerald. Can you hear me? Okay, we'll proceed with Jody Cantrell. Ms. Cantrell? Are you able to hear me? Yes, Ms. Fitzgerald, thank you. Please proceed. I'm sorry. Good morning, board members. I'm Elaine Fitzgerald, 12-year school council member at Saganash. You've heard about the growth rates on the Northwest side, the diversity of our community and our overcrowded classrooms. I would like to talk about a few other perspectives that support the need for an expansion. First, an expansion would bring us into compliance. Given CPS guidelines and CDC requirements, there's not enough room for safe distancing. In session school would put students, teachers and the community at risk. You've already heard examples of current life safety issues in our buildings. Imagine trying to plan from here into the future. Next, an expansion would mean additional money for the Board of Education. Saganash has four to five local preschools that feed into our school that if captured at our elementary school would mean more money in the school district's pocket. But without adequate space, programming of preschool is not possible. Preschool programming would also put an end to the uncertainty of kindergarten planning, something that weighs on the decision-making of families to attend. Year after year, the LSC works through last minute planning and staffing, unable to predict the amount of incoming students. Lastly, an expansion would mean additional money for the city. Over my 12 years on the, on the local school council, we have witnessed a remarkable amount of tax paying families being lost to the suburbs. We have heard stories of people choosing to migrate out of the city and attend schools with smaller classroom sizes and facilities that can accommodate better programming. Where we have strong academics and a great curriculum within the physical constraints of the building, we're limited you, in what Jeremy, we can. Have 30 do seconds. Thank you. Uh, we're limited in what we can do because we lack the physical space. If the constraints were gone, the belief from the community is we could have more, and a lot of families would not look elsewhere. The Northwest side has many city-minded philanthropic families now. Imagine what we could hold on to, and what more we could track. Phenomenal programming. Thank you again for this opportunity, for your patience and my technical skills, and thank you for support of the proposed capital expansion plan. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Mr. President, we will now proceed with speaker number five, please, Jody Cantrell. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Cantrell, please proceed. Thank you. President Del Valle, Dr. Jackson, and members of the board, my name is Jody Cantrell, and I'm the Director of External Affairs at the Illinois Network of Charter Schools. 
I am here today to speak to the dedication and commitment of leaders and educators in public charter schools who have put in countless hours to pre prepare for a very unprecedented start to the new school year. INCS is a membership organization with 117 member schools and CPS who educate more than 55,000 Chicago students. As a trusted voice of the public charter school community for over a decade, we are very disheartened to hear consistent false remarks made by Chris Barons of the CTU on the reopening plans of public charter schools. Like all educators and all of us here today, public charter school leaders in our city take the health and safety of our students and educators very seriously. INCS and our member schools are working closely with the district, the mayor's office, ISBE, and local and state health officials to ensure reopening plans are both safe and meet the needs of our students, families, and communities who remain our top priority. Schools are critical public assets, especially in this challenging time. These remarks simply do not rep represent the entirety of the public charter school community or our, or our dedicated educators who we are in consistent communications with. Sadly, it comes across like the usual politics over our kids, even in a global pandemic. The reality is charter leaders have been working collaborat collaboratively together for many months since remote learning ended last spring through INC's Charter School Reopening Working Group. This group continues to gather to share learnings amongst each other, seek out local and national expertise, and tackle challenges related to reopening schools. The autonomy of charter schools has allowed educators to build plans that are flexible to local health data and responsive to the needs of our school communities. Ms. Students Ms. cannot afford anything seconds? less from our public. Yes, um, students cannot afford anything less from our public school system than high quality academics, differentiated instruction to meet their needs, social emotional supports, enrichment opportunities, equity and resources, and regular family engagement. We recognize the incredible obstacles that lie ahead for all public school students and educators in our city, no matter the type of public school. That is why we must unite as one district. Thanks from the charter community stand by this commitment and are ready and willing to meet and collaborate for the benefit of all Chicago students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cantrell. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker, Mr. President, will be speaker number six, please, Matt Major, followed by speaker number eight, Sam Fickelstein. Mr. Major? Mr. Major, please unmute. Mr. Major, can you hear me? Mr. Major, please unmute. We'll continue with the next speaker, Mr. President. Speaker Hello? number. Uh, there he is, Mr. Major. Yes, thank you. Thank Please you. proceed. You have two minutes to address the board. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Del Valle, Dr. Jackson, and members of the board. My name is Matt Major, and I'm the policy manager at the Illinois Network of Charter Schools. Today, I'll be discussing the district's capital budget. INCS is encouraged to see an increased focus on capital investments on the south and west sides of the city. These resilient neighborhoods have dealt with a lack of investment for far too long. We are also grateful that two charter public schools and CPS owned buildings, Polaris Charter Academy and Montessori School of Inglewood, have been included in the FY21 capital budget. These capital improvements will mean the world to both school communities. However, charter public school students in district owned buildings have seen a general lack of investment in past years as this is the first time since FY17 that charter public schools have been included in the district's capital budget. There are 32 charter campuses serving over 16,000 students located in CPS-owned buildings, or roughly 4.5% of total district enrollment. However, from FY17 to FY21, charter public schools in district-owned buildings have made up only 0.6% of budgeted capital improvement. As shown in the handout I've provided, these 32 campuses are largely concentrated on the south and west sides of the city, serving students that come from those same neighborhoods. These schools are not provided any additional resources for building improvements. So unless they are included in the district's capital budget, they are forced to divert dollars away from the classroom to improve a building they do not own. Under Dr. Jackson's one district mantra, we believe students attending these schools deserve the same opportunity to receive a high quality education in classrooms that are safe, warm, and dry, regardless of school type. We also believe the concentration of charter public schools and district owned buildings on the south and west sides call for increased inclusion in future capital budgets 
in line with Mayor Lightfoot's Invest Southwest initiative. We are eager to work with the district in coming years to increase transparency around the capital budget decision-making process and for charter public schools to see equitable inclusion in those budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Major. Our next speaker, Mr. President, is speaker number eight, please. Sam Fickelstein, followed by speaker number nine, Grace Chan. Good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. My name is Sam Finkelstein. I am the CEO of Legal Prep Charter Academy, which is a public charter high school located in West Garfield Park. I know that the district leadership has been very thoughtful and intentional in its planning for the coming school year. As both a charter school leader and a parent to three children enrolled at CPS schools, I really appreciate that fact. I have heard an unfortunate false narrative suggesting that charter schools have been rushing to push students and teachers back into classrooms without a solid plan. I can assure you that our planning efforts have been every bit as deliberate as those taken by the district and are grounded in the guiding principle of student and staff safety as a top priority. I wanted to provide you with a quick overview of what that process has looked like at Legal Prep, which I believe is a good representation of the process that has taken place at charter schools across the city. My admin team spent hundreds of hours over the summer planning for the three possible scenarios, in-person, hybrid, and remote learning, and creating extensive and distinct professional development plans to support teachers for each approach. These plans were not created in isolation. We surveyed our students and families to gather feedback from the spring and to get input on the proposed plans for the coming year. We created a reopening working group on our team that included teachers, administrators, and support staff that met repeatedly over the course of the four weeks leading up to our plans release. We also leveraged the insight and expertise of those throughout the city. We are grateful to our partners at INCS for creating a charter school working group on the issue that met regularly starting in early June. The meetings were heavily attended and allowed us to share best practices and research from around the country, as well as workshop, workshop each other's draft plans. We did have a strong preference for a hybrid approach at Legal Mr. Prep. Mr. Finkelson, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. But the feedback from our families and staff, as well as the current COVID data, supported a remote start, and that's how we're going to begin our year. Our students will receive two live 45-minute lessons in a small group setting for each class they have every week, which means a typical day will have three synchronous classes. The balance of learning will be self-paced. This plan does differ from the district's plan. We really appreciate the autonomy to design a remote learning school day that meets the specific needs of our kids. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. President, we'll proceed with speaker number nine, please, Grace Chan, followed by speaker number 10, Margaret LaRiviere. Grace Chan. Please unmute. Ms. Chan. Got it. Thank you. We can hear you. Please proceed. Thank you. My name is Grace Chan McKibben. I'm the Executive Director of Coalition for a Better Chinese American Community. I am testifying to support a fiscal 21 CPS budget that includes the cost for a new high school in the Chinatown area. Thanks to the advocacy of Representative Theresa Ma, the Illinois General Assembly already approved $50 million in capital funds towards a high school that serves the Armour Square and Bridgeport communities, which has never had a CPS neighborhood high school in this 166 year history of CPS. Generations of high school students in this area have had to travel to attend as many as 50 different high schools, from Sen to Bogan. CPS's own studies have found that students from Chinatown have one of the longest daily commutes among CPS students. Not only does the long commute negatively impact students' time for study, part-time jobs, and extracurricular activities, the distance from home to school also makes it challenging for parents to be fully engaged with the schools. With the pledged funds in this year's budget, we can begin the process of planning and implementation that will include parent and community voices. The elementary schools and the near South communities in the attendance area of this new area high school already serve diverse populations of white, black, Latinx, Asian, and mixed race students. The high school will also fully embrace this diversity and support the needs of immigrant families at the same time. A school that is intentional in embracing different cultures prepares students for an increasingly diverse world. By approving this budget that will support Ms. such a Chan, school, you have 30 we're seconds. building, we're, thank you. We're building for our children's future and our community's future. I'm submitting this as a written statement uh, for the board and staff to review, as well as a written statement from Mr. C.W. Chan, founder 
and board member of my organization. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Chan. Thank you for your comments. And our next speaker, Mr. President, is speaker number 10, Margaret LaRivere, followed by number 11, Mary Alice. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Thank you. I am Maggie LaRavier, the LSC Chair of Kellogg. We advocated for capital investment on our own behalf. Since that time, we sent an email to the CEO and the board requesting a meeting about a capital investment we heard we received through a press release from the Alderman Matt Hoshea. We are very concerned. It does not appear to address our true structural deficiencies, nor the detached crumbling modular, nor our severe need for an addition. We fear without our input at the LSC, our true needs will not be addressed, and we have already outgrown the building. It was jarring to learn of this investment from O'Shea. Four years ago, he tried to close our school. He did not see it as a real neighborhood school. He tried to give the Kellogg building to Keller, the Keller building to Mount Greenwood for overcrowding relief. O'Shea promised Keller parents that substantial investment would be made to the Kellogg building, noting four years ago the same structural deficiencies that we continue to suffer under today. O'Shea said he and CPS would provide the investment only if Keller moved in. That deal was repugnant. It devalued and dismissed our students. We fought it, true to our word, true to his word, we received nothing. Why was he the gatekeeper to capital funding then? Why is he still playing such a substantial role now? The LSC has not received any information from CPS. O'Shea said in his newsletter that for years he CEO Jackson and McDade have been trying to bring much needed investment to Kellogg. In 2016, what prevented that from happening then? Why don't we know the nature of the proposed investment now? As an example, when CPS and O'Shea worked to bring needed capital investment to Mount Greenwood in 2011, an 8 million annex was awarded to Mount Greenwood. In 2015, a 2.28 million new classroom modular awarded to Mount Greenwood. In 2017, the 2.28 million modular was dis was demolished. I'm sorry, was demolished, and Ian, the Mount you're at your two minutes. Thank you. And Mount Greenwood was awarded 20 million. Uh, we don't know anything about uh, our proposal. Uh, we look forward to a conversation with CPS. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. President. We'll proceed with speaker number 11, please, Mary Alice followed by speaker number 13, Christine Brody. Ms. Ellis, please unmute. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, please proceed. Hi, um, I'm here this morning, good morning board, or good afternoon. Um, I wanna make sure that I start off by saying that there is Absolutely, as I speak today, there's no distinction between Chicago Public Schools and the city of Chicago with the mayor's office. That means anything political taking place in this city where oppressed people can be exploited, Chicago Public Schools is ground zero. At a recent board meeting, um, I heard so much disturbing and frightening data that included child endangerment, harassment, including sexual harassment of black children and black children with disabilities at the hands of school resource officers. Let me be clear, anywhere else that these findings, with these findings would have triggered a call to Child Protective Services. This is state-sanctioned state abuse against black children, period. Lastly, I want everyone in the city of Chicago and the members of the board to know that universal pre-K is a racist policy that started under Rahm Emanuel and Bruce Rauner. There is not one shred of data anywhere, anywhere. I've been to all the meetings at the state, at the city, there's not one. You can't find one that supports a program as a priority for four-year-olds in this city. We have so much work to do in the city of Chicago. Ms. Salas, you have 30 seconds. I serve in so many areas in my capacity as, as parent leadership at the city and state level. And I'm gonna tell you right now, it is sad and reckless what I see the city doing. It's, it's, it's sad and reckless that 
you people don't understand that the SRO policy is racist and that universal pre-K is racist, period. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Um, and just to note for the speakers, when I do call your name, make sure that you are unmuted. Um, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much. So, Mr. President, our next speaker is Speaker 13, Kristen Brody, followed by Speaker 15, Vanessa Lopez, and then we'll have Speaker 20, Gladys Torres. Ms. Brody? This is Kristen Brody. Yes, please proceed. Thank you. I am a CPS graduate, LSC chair, and a parent of a CPS diverse learner student. I urge the board to terminate the IGA with the Chicago Police Department. CPS data is clear that SROs disproportionately target students with disabilities, especially students of color. The Office of Diverse Learner Supports and Services Family Advisory Board was consulted about SROs at our August 6th meeting. Overwhelmingly, the feedback was urging SRO removal in favor of funding for other district services. At that meeting, Jadine Chow shared data showing that students with IEPs make up 30% of SRO referrals over the past three years, even though they're only 14% of the student body. That number is up from just five years ago in 2015, when students with IEPs were 22% of the SRO referrals. It is alarming that per the percentage of students with IEPs among referrals continues to rise, with 236 students with IEPs last year being referred to SROs. Not only are diverse learners being disproportionately referred to SROs, their legal rights to their IEPs and behavioral intervention plans are being violated by school administrators who wrongly call police instead of following plans created by teachers and parents to meet student needs. Denigma Howard is a former Marshall High School student who was denied her IEP and BIP by school administrators and instead violently assaulted by SROs. Ms. Howard is one of many students with disabilities who have been deeply traumatized. When asked if administrators Brody, at Marshall High School, seconds. thank you. When asked if administrators at Marshall have been held accountable, Jadine Chow said that they are not in a position to answer this question. This is a well-documented case from 18 months ago and no one has been held accountable. This will continue to happen. The district already has very clear alternatives laid out in CPS policy. They just need to be fully enacted and fully funded. They must expand restorative practices, uh, training and staff, as well as ensure that schools have adequate numbers of special education teachers, counselors, social workers, and nurses. I urge the board to allocate all CPS dollars there, not to police. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brody. Our next speaker, Mr. President, Speaker 15, please, Vanessa Lopez. Ms. Lopez. Please unmute. Hello, Ms. Lopez, can you hear me? Hi, good morning. Yes, good morning, members of the board. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Vanessa Lopez of Orozco Academy. The English Learners Gifted Program with an accelerated and rigorous curriculum provides my children with the challenges they need to reach their full potential. There is no other program that allows students to preserve and connect to their roots and their native language like the Orozco Academy offers in the Pilsen area. My neighborhood school does not offer this option. CPS is not educating parents as far as the richness and the exceptionality of this culturally based gifted programs. If it wasn't through my child's daycare center and the other mothers, I would not have identified such a rich program like the Juan Orozco, Pulaski, and Greeley offer. Not only Hispanics, but other races can benefit from an EL gifted program. For many years, our Latino families have experienced inequities, lack of transparency, and inconsistencies from CPS. As members of the board, CPS administrators, elected officials, and community-based organizations may already know, parents like me, united and questioned the Office of Access and Enrollment about the evaluation process and selection of students since Hispanics make up the largest student body in the district at 46%, and yet there are only three EL regional gifted centers with very low enrollment. And since the evaluations are administered in many cases, in two to 10 minutes, how can you evaluate a child's gifted and bilingual abilities, historical and linguistic levels? How can you identify his background and or his social emotional development 
in a few minutes. The current policies and practices need to change. The EL regional gifted program can be separated from the regional gifted program. CPS is meeting with us tomorrow, and I ask Dr. Jackson, Chief McDade, and CPS administrators on behalf of Orozco, Pulaski, and Greeley to work with us parents and to follow up to find equity in a resolution based on the community needs. Thank you. Thank you, Lopez. And our next speaker, Mr. President, Speaker 20, Gladys Torres, uh, followed by speaker number 14, Shanai Gray. Ms. Torres? Can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Torres, please proceed. Hi, my name is Gladys Torres. I am an alumni of the gifted program at Orozco and the parents of a gifted student at Orozco. I speak for an organized group known as Concerned Parents for Orozco. We keep hearing callers talking about overcrowding at schools where we are facing the complete opposite. Orozco has an EL gifted program with transportation available from anywhere in the city. Two years ago, Orozco was granted authorization to expand its citywide wall-to-wall -wall gifted program. To date, we have half an empty building and have been experiencing decline in enrollment due to several factors. First is a lack of education to families on the program CPS offers. The CPS website, as well as the Go CPS website, lacks easy to find information on the various programs along with the schools that offer those programs. Second, and most revolting, is the lack of a proper, transparent, and just assessment and selection process. After several surveys and research, in addition to my personal experience, we find that we are putting our children's future in the hands of strangers who evaluate our kids for just five minutes. Concerned parents of Orozco have met with CPS several times over the last few months, and at each meeting, we are left with unanswered questions and unresolved obstacles. Chief McDade, CEO Jackson, we are truly disappointed in both your lack of respect for families and unwillingness to meet. If there had been any real interest in our petition, we would have met to properly resolve this. We followed procedure. We followed Ms. protocol. Torres, you have we were denied seconds. the opportunity to state our case, and because we brought the inequity to light, we are faced with threats of removing the gifted program. It would seem that there is more interest in protecting the status quo than looking at what was presented and considering the greater good for our children. We are familiar with the policy as, as stated and fully believe that our request does not go against the policy. We acknowledge that there is a long-term challenge that, that involves changing policy. We continue to work with different community organizations as well as elected officials to meet this goal. We want to thank board member Melendez for meeting with us and expressing her thoughts. We have kept the entire board included in our communications and requests to CPS. We are on the wait list for office hours and other, with other board members. We urge you to open those emails and learn of the inequities happening in your community. A community thank engagement meeting has been called tomorrow at 9 a.m. and we invite you all to accompany us and hear firsthand of the inequities we are facing. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, we'll proceed with Speaker 14, um, Shanai Gray, followed by Speaker number 18, Alexander Lopez. Ms. Gray? Hi. Hi, yes. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay. Good morning to all. Thank you for listening to me this morning. My name is Shania Gray, and I am a parent at Southside Kellogg Elementary School, a proud parent of two witty, vivacious Black boys. I am here to speak to you about Kellogg, a level one plus successful, predominantly African-American neighborhood school, which has not gotten much needed capital expansion funded for decades, despite pleas over and over again. Capital improvements needed to replace a 20 year old crumbling modular with structural ventilation and sewage issues amongst other issues. This year, at last, we got word that the school has been slated to receive some capital improvements in the FY21 budget. However, to our dismay, these capital improvements, which are funded at one-tenth of what our white neighborhood counterpart, Mount Greenwood Elementary, has gotten in the last five years, does not come remotely close to meeting our needs. Um, in fact, instead of a much-needed addition, we are slated to receive renovations that will decrease precious classroom space. Board in a world where my black boys will have to work 10 times harder than their white counterparts to be the doctors, engineers, and lawyers of this world, with the backdrop of a fight for black lives and equity, my sons need to be set up for success. Kellogg cannot do that with adequate, Kellogg can do that with adequate facilities and support. This is why I am speaking to you today. 
In reality, my black sons do not need an upgraded playground, which primarily appeases the predominantly white surrounding neighbors and the it's private great. white Catholic school across the street. Instead, my sons need a structure that in the age of COVID won't have ventilation and heating issues, give them trouble to breathe and be hazardous to their health. My black sons instead need a capital expansion that will support top-notch learning, such as a STEM lab. My black sons need a dedicated computer and technology lab. My black sons need a library. My black sons need a dedicated warming kitchen and dining space. My black sons need a dedicated gym space where a medical device is plugged in, it won't short circuit. I am therefore here to plead with you today, board, Dr. Jackson, Dr. McNade, to give Kellogg Elementary School the much needed facilities and expansion to help bring equity to my son's education so that we can position them for a successful future. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Mr. President, we'll proceed with speaker 18, please. Alexander Lopez, followed by speaker 24, Brian Orlinski. Mr. Lopez. Please unmute. Hello? Yes, Mr. Lopez, we can hear you. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Lopez. I'm a member of an LSC, uh, also Chicagoans for anti-racist education or care and the parent of three kids who attend a school in Lakeview named after a racist scientist. I originally signed up to speak with you today about removing Louis J. Agassiz's name for a school, but uh, I'm inspired to name what I see happening here. Uh, you know, while the board publishes Dr. Sweeney's equity framework prioritizing racial equity on paper, the actions of CPS repeatedly accept and extend false white supremacist narratives as inevitable while treating racial justice as a second class goal. We saw it when the CPS hybrid, which accepted the narrative that our schools are too crowded to bring back students in safe conditions without talk of reopening the 50 shuttered schools in our brown and black communities, without attempting to rehire all of the veteran educators of color who were laid off by administration's past. CPS perpetuates the white supremacist narrative that police are the only way to keep us safe. When you say LSCs should decide about SROs, but won't let LSCs decide about investing those same funds and alternatives. Today, CPS is sending a thousand school clerks, predominantly women of color, back into school buildings, admittedly without a safety plan, while we hold this meeting virtually for our own safety. And you're telling the parents that reopening will follow the science, but not for these brown and black mothers. Never mind all the early childhood research that the distance learning plan ignores. When we defend the status quo, we preserve and perpetuate historical inequities. And so why is this board cramming a virtual replication of the status quo school day on us without seeking the creative input and experience of the thousands of educators and families who have been prioritizing equity in their classrooms and communities every day? Our elementary school is named after one of the founders of anti-black ideology. And when we try to take his name off the building, we're told to prioritize board policies and processes, the same board which put his name on our buildings in the first place. So if you cannot confront the racist legacy of a dead man in Lakeview, then I hold little hope that CPS is ready to confront the living racism which Mr. permeates Lopez, our school system. 30 seconds. I cede my time. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Our next speaker, Mr. President, Speaker 24, Brian Orlinski, followed by Speaker 28, Marlene Garcia, please. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Orlinski. I am speaking to the board members today to request for leniency for my position with Chicago Public Schools. In June of 2019, when I was teaching at Saban Dual Language Magnet School, I had a medical condition which caused me to fall asleep in my car during lunch. This was based on some, med some medication I was taking. And ever since then, I've been working with my doctor to make sure an incident like this never happens again. I um, would ask the board, since I'm a former tenure teacher, I lost my tenure for leaving the board for one year in 2017, 2018, that they can, see my request for leniency and um, allow me to continue to teach the Chicago Public Schools. Thank you again. And I'd like to finally add that I feel that this action would, if I was terminated, would be a violation 
of my American with Disabilities Act rights. Again, thank you to the board members and have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Linsky. Our next speaker, Mr. President, Speaker 28, Marlene Garcia, followed by the last speaker of the speakers list, 29, Sharon Spencer. Ms. Garcia. Please unmute. Hello, Ms. Garcia. Ms. Garcia, can you hear me? Ms. Garcia, please unmute so that you can proceed. Hello? Yes, Ms. Garcia, thank you. Please Hi. proceed. Okay. Hi, my name is Marlene Garcia. I'm a 2020 graduate from John Hancock College Prep High School on the southwest side of Chicago. Three weeks ago, we were able to get rid of police officers who together had 52 allegations. Lincoln Park, Terry, Mather, Lane Tech, Back of the Yards, Paris. These are some schools that have won in getting cops at CPS. Two days ago, two days ago at a demonstration outside of CPS, cops disgustingly breached on us, suggesting that they were immune to COVID. Make no mistake, cops do not keep us safe. They demean, assault, and harass us. Today's decision is up to you, and we expect a unanimous vote to end the CPD and CPS contract. It is our responsibility to hold you accountable if you don't. I want to point out how incredibly proud I am of the work youth have been doing every single day, not only during their summer vacation, but for the last three years. We have been holding it down on the south, north, and west side of Chicago. We do it all. We protest. We send you emails. We've held workshops. We've met with public officials. We believe in a world where we have a seat in the table to make decisions about our lives. Um, this is to the powerful youth and allies rallied outside of the CPS office right now who are listening. We love you. We, we love you. We love you. We, we love you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Our next speaker then is speaker 29, Sharon Spencer, please. Ms. Spencer, please unmute. Ms. Spencer? You can proceed, Ms. Spencer. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sharon Spencer. I am a parent rep on the Mount Greenwood LSC. I wanted to come to you today to ask the board to reconsider the projected re-eval of in-school classes to be done sooner than November, and if geographical areas of the city can be considered instead of Chicago as a whole. Our community is very frustrated with the sudden change from hybrid to complete remote. Many of us in the community read the reopening plan, and it is obvious that CPS administration did what is necessary to bring these kids back into the classroom. However, the union pulled the plug on all of that. The administration stresses differentiation for our students as none of them are the same, yet the union wants to treat this as a one-size-fits-all for a very large district. This doesn't make sense. For each community is different and should be treated as such. I want to ask you, what is the possibility of reviewing the re-entry plan at five weeks instead of 10? Shouldn't we be looking at the communities themselves and have hybrid for communities with low numbers and remote for communities having a spike? Is any plan perfect? Absolutely not. But 100% of our teachers at Mount Greenwood and 93% of our students want to walk back into our classrooms. It is absurd that the union is bullying these teachers to stay home and remote teach, yet they have all been on vacations or in restaurants or walking around in Walmart. It is a double Spencer, standard and our children seconds. And our children are worth more than that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Thank you for your comments. Um, Mr. President, this concludes the speakers on the speakers list. So we'll proceed with the aldermen. Um, we will first call Alderman Samantha Nugent, please, from the 39th Ward, uh, followed by Ariel Raboyos from the 30th Ward. Alderwoman Nugent.
please unmute. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, please proceed, thank you. Wonderful, good afternoon, President DeValle, esteemed members of the Board of Education and CEO Jackson. It's nice to speak with you all again. Thank you to the Saganash parents and teachers who spoke today. I am so grateful for your continued advocacy. As mentioned, my name is Sam Nugent and I'm Alderman of the 39th Ward. Thank you for this opportunity to speak again today. While I have spoken to you all individually and at the Capitol and budget hearings about Saganash Elementary School, I want to once again reemphasize that the school community is in dire need of a capital expansion. As you know, Saganash is currently at 124% capacity. If we do nothing, they are projected to be at 136% capacity in four years or less. Enrollment at Saganash has consistently grown by 4% every year, and last year the enrollment increased by 6%. According to the Chicago Teachers Union contract, 16 out of the 21 homerooms are overcrowded. That's 76%. There is an immediate need for a capital expansion to reduce overcrowding at Saganash and provide students with a safe learning environment. Saganash is 29.5% low income with 44 languages spoken. 24% of the students are English language learners. Teachers have been used, forced to use storage closets, hallway areas, and stairwell landings for instruction because of the lack of space. The school has been cited by the fire department for code violations. This poses significant safety concerns, and in the event of an emergency, students and faculty would be exposed and potentially be targets. This keeps me up at night. As the former chief of staff for the Cook County Department of Homeland Security, part of my responsibility included preparing and assessing school readiness for a natural or man-made disaster. Children and faculty congregating in hallways because there is no classroom space is extremely dangerous. The 664 students, 43 CTU members, and 20 SEIU members deserve a safe environment to learn and work. Saganash Elementary is a true neighborhood school, but due to size limitations, it cannot possibly serve the current student community nor the consistently growing K through eight student enrollment without an expansion. The neighboring schools are all also either overcrowded or almost at capacity, and they too do not have the space to help relieve Saganash's overcrowding. School communities are like children. They are each unique and have unique needs. I recognize this and I support schools throughout the 39th Ward. I have allocated a half a million dollars to Volta Elementary for a green space and pollinator garden. I have worked with State Representative Jamie Andrade to ensure $100,000 for a science lab. Palmer, Peterson, Northside Learning Center, Von Steuben and Belding are all undergoing capital improvements. I strongly support the expansion of Saganash Elementary to help relieve the overcrowding. I again kindly request your yes vote in approving the expansion and budget as a whole. Thank you all for your time and consideration. I am grateful for your ongoing commitment to all Chicago students. Should you have questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or my office. Thank you. Thank you, Alderwoman Nugent. Uh, Mr. President, we'll proceed with uh, Alderman Ariel Revoyos from the 30th Ward, followed by Alderman David Moore from the 17th Ward. Alderman Revoyos? Alderman Revoyos, can you please unmute? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and, and good afternoon. I wanna not only uh, thank each and every one of you who serve on the board, but for allowing me an opportunity to speak today. I want to commend the Chicago Public Schools and the Chicago Police Department for incorporating the feedback they receive from our parents, our community members, and our local school councils around the school resource uh, officer program. I believe that these reforms have shown significant improvements to the SRO program. Requiring additional training for officers allows for training on CPS protocols and policies, 
around the student code of conduct and by adding the new eligibility and selection process for the school resource officers. Of importance to me, and I wanna say this, I'm gonna repeat this, of importance to me is that the principal of each school will have the ability to participate in the selection of the SRO process. Providing clarity on the roles and responsibilities of the SRO is a great achievement, and I thank you for that. I also agree that the SRO should not should not have involvement in school disciplinary uh, situations. I say this because for many students, schools are their safe haven and the safest place in their community outside of their homes. Principals in LSC know and understand their school communities, and I strongly believe they are equipped to make a decision whether or not the SRO program should remain at that particular school. I also believe that LSCs voted to remove the SROs from their schools, but they should also be support, there should also be support for them to ensure that the safety of each student is provided. And if LSCs voted to retain the SROs, we should also ex accept this decision, but also we need to ensure that continued reforms are also implemented and evaluated to strengthen the SRO program. Uh, and I say this, and I say this, I, that I want to be loud and clear that I support the members of the police department as they deserve to be treated with honor and respect. Uh, I wanna thank uh, President Del Valle, CEO, Dr. Janice Jackson, Arnie Rivera, and the entire member of the school board, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Alderman. Mr. President, we'll proceed with Alderman uh, Moore, please, from the 17th Ward. Uh, followed by Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor from the 20th Ward, please. Alderman Moore. Yes, can you hear Thank me? Thank you. Yes, Alderman, please proceed. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, um, President um, DeValle uh, and the entire board, CEO Janice Jackson and Chief Education Officer Latanya McDade. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for again, allowing us to come before you and speak. When we were here last time, um, I was in support of the SROs, but I was also in support of letting um, LSC um, decide their own fate. And I, I appreciate you all listening and giving them that opportunity. Um, and what that came out of is that a number of schools um, elected to have SROs officers and some elected not to. And I think that's when we talk about a democracy, um, th that shows democracy and people um, having a voice in what they um, say. Uh, I appreciate the LST at the different schools using their voice, but I also encourage the LSTs to trust the leadership of their principals that um, many of them have chosen. And so, um, the principal, I have no doubt, the ones that serve these schools for years and years, even after LSC changes, that they have the interest of those students at heart and um, trust their leadership in, in knowing what their school is like, the, the things that they face at their schools. A lot of times I hear about people talking about what's going on inside the schools. My experience is have been the concerns coming up outside the schools more than anything. And so, um, and a lot of the um, CPS security um, and on many occasions handle the things that's going on um, inside the school. I know um, some evidence have shown some other things and those things needed to be brought to light so that we can make those adjustments and do what's right by our children. So I wanna commend this entire body uh, for listening. Um, but I also want any of those um, savings, I think we went from 33 down to uh, 12 mini, 12 million, any of those savings um, to also let the voices of the community and the LSCs be heard to go towards those resources, whether it's um, nurses, social um, um, workers, library, whatever they need to improve um, on those from those different levels of the school, making sure that funding um, goes there as well. So that's very critical to me. So I appreciate um, the leadership of um, CEO Janice Jackson. She's doing an outstanding job, and I appreciate this board and um, supporting um, her efforts in moving this along. So 
Thank you all so much, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all. Thank you, Alderman Moore. Uh, we'll continue, Mr. President, with Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor from the 20th Ward, followed by Alderman Byron Sincho Lopez from the 25th Ward. Alderman Ta Alderwoman Taylor? Good afternoon, board members. Dr. Janice Jackson. I would like for you all to give a moment of silence to Caleb Reed. Caleb lost his life fighting for safety for young people in Chicago public schools. And while he was, he had graduated and was out, it still was in his heart and in his will and his fight to stand up for young people. And so I ask that you all give him a moment of silence. With that being said, five years ago today, myself and 11 brave folks went on a hunger strike to save Diet High School. Today is the very day that I passed out at a CPS board meeting and was asked by safety and security head Jadine Child to be pushed out while I lay in the boardroom unconscious. Five years ago from today, I felt like I was a voiceless black mother in a school system that not only didn't respect me, but didn't have the willingness to, to listen to me. Here it is, 2020, and the same fight continues. Chicago Public Schools' motto is we put children and young people first. And if that is the case, then why are we not listening to young people saying that we do not want SROs in our schools? I have the pleasure of representing one public high school in my ward, which was Richard. And Richards voted to keep SROs in schools. And while I respect Richards' right to, to um, go through the democratic process to make that decision, the one thing that was missing from that vote was student voice. They did not have a student rep on that LSC and was told by Chicago Public Schools that they had to take that vote. If we're being fair, if we're being honest, and we are being transparent, Chicago Public Schools needs to make sure that student voice is on those local school councils when making that decision. It is unfair and unjust for that position to be vacant and for the school not to be given the ability to make sure that it has a student. But let's go even further. We're in a space where we're protesting police brutality around this country. And while our young people are in the street protesting this, they're actually getting abused by the very people that you all are gonna to allow to sit in our school. As an elected official, I have the right to ask for information that I've yet to receive. And that information is as follows. How many schools that have local school councils were actually able to have quorum? How many officers in the school have complaints? How many officers in the school were removed because of complaints? How many young people have asked over and over again to have resource officers removed and the schools were ignored? And so I ask you all today and know that very soon that we'll have an elected representative school board. And the people who are actually sit on this board will be able to listen to the people who are impacted by decisions. I want to thank Elizabeth who is on the board for actually taking the time out to listen and other board members. Because to me, she is the example of what a board member should be doing. And that's just not listening to the side that she's comfortable with, but it's listening to everybody. I'm just disappointed that five years from the hunger strike, that we're still in a space where parents and young people have to argue, fuss, fight, and protest to get the very things that they needed. It saddens me that a school in 2020 is overcrowded and it's not in my community and has to ask and advocate. Every call that I've heard thus far is about CPS listening to the people who are impacted. Dr. Jackson, you are an excellent teacher, an excellent principal and a network chief. Use all of your hats to make sure that the things that CPS does actually works for young people. Thank you all for your time. Have a good day. Thank you, Alderwoman Taylor. Moving on, Mr. President, we now have um, Alderman from the 25th Ward, Byron Sincho Lopez, uh, followed by Alderwoman Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez 
from the 33rd Ward. Thank you, um, members of, um, of the board. And I want to echo a lot of the comments made by Alderwoman Janae Taylor, not only for Caleb Breed, but also a moment of silence for those who have died in Kenosha in the hands not only of the police, but also now right wing extremists. And that's the kind of violence that we continue to see across the country and in our own city or schools or public schools. An important space for our youth to learn and for youth to be creative and for youth to feel loved. That is what this fight is about. And I wanna commend the parents and the young people that are courageously and tirelessly day after day, meeting after meeting, coming to demand what is fair and just, which is having quality public education across the board. The response of the Board of Education, I think let's, let's remember that these appointments are temporary, but the decisions that this board makes can make permanent effects and they can permanently affect parents, families, and young people across the city. I want to remind this Board of Education of the kind of policies that were done before your time, but continue to happen. There's no coincidence that we have a former CEO of the Chicago Public Schools that now is serving time because of the corruption that affects our public schools. Let's remember those decisions, the contracting, and what's here happening still under your watch. This is not about educational opportunities. This decision to keep SROs in our schools had to do with contracting and the lack of courage to stand up against corruption, to stand up to a Chicago Police Department that is more worried about contracting, that's more worried about capital, that is more worried about making sure that they continue their status quo the same old and business as usual. What's happening to our communities is tragic. We just hear uh, the parents talking here about the overcrowding in our schools when we have empty seats in the schools like Orozco. When not too long ago we had quality, a quality school, and now we have to be begging so that our kids have a, a seat in their, in their own classroom, in their own family, in their own schools. Let's be, let's be consistent and coherent with our decision-making process. We have families right now, parents who spoke right in front of you. Those are your constituents. The parents and young people and the students who are demanding answers from CPS, from the board, from the CEO. No more running around. No more business as usual. No more excuses. Let's get to work on policies that actually work. Time after time, we see these failed policies, failing our students and families and parents. When is enough? What more evidence do we need? I want to commend again the parents and young people for their continuous efforts for fairness and equity. I urge the Board of Education to make sure that we have common sense in our policy. We can use those $12 million in our classroom and wraparound services to address our homeless kids or homeless families that we need to serve. We don't need $150,000 per officer. For what? to continue to recreate the police brutality that we see in our streets. Let's use our common sense and let's have the courage of the moment and the clarity that we need in our time. We need right now, urgently, that our schools reflect the values of people. We cannot continue contracting with software companies. And not too long ago, also the conflict of interest were even selling furniture. Our board members were selling furniture, bankers that make money out of our public schools. Enough, enough of that. Let's have the courage and the urgency that we need to make sure that those millions of dollars go back to the classroom. They go back to open the, the seats on gifted programs that are supposed to serve 
not only the privileged and affluent, we need them to serve our black and brown families as well. It's not acceptable that our kids cannot access our schools. We just heard from three schools at least, and the many others across the district. We need to make sure that our schools, our schools, our public schools, no matter what the zip code is, have everything that we need. Let's make the comparison and let's see what we have or what we have the SROs when we have these policies. And we see the injustice and inequality and the lack of equity, despite the discourses and press conferences that I'm tired to hear. Let's make sure that we bring alternative evaluation methods, stop standardizing education. Let's have curriculum that speaks to black families, to black students or Latino, Latinx students or Asian families, people across the board. We need to make sure that our kids are proud of their identity, of their culture, that they learn music, they learn, they, they, they learn arts. The same thing that we see in other schools, we deserve no more, no less, but the same treatment. I'm sick and tired of hearing, and I've been going through the normal channels of communication, talking to the CEO, talking to the, to the administrators without any answers. So I tell you that these appointments are temporary, but your decisions are permanent. And I commend the young people for organizing and the parents for continue to organize to make sure that we have programs that are for all kids. I'll support as well, you know, the Chinatown High School, you know, so that we can have, of course, the schools that serve, you know, we have, we need to be talking and being creative. We have the opportunity in a city like Chicago to have trilingual programs where kids can be learning Spanish, can be learning Mandarin, can be learning languages, arts and culture, but yet what we deliver? SROs, police repression, how our kids are gonna feel love in this environment. So I say today, I urge you, and if you hear from the parents, there's no need for us, and there's no reason, and it's not acceptable for us to have overcrowding the schools when we have empty seats here. And not because we don't have families interested, we have waiting lines. But let's just stop siding with the software companies. Let's just stop standardizing education. Let's make sure that we have cultural re relevancy, history that speaks to our kids, our cues, our people in our city are desperate for clarity and leadership. Let's not be afraid. Let's not be afraid of the appointment because your appointments, your appointments today are temporary. And again, I repeat, but the decisions that you make will not be forgotten. We Thank will you, not forget the vote today. So I urge you to vote against this Again, another patch to the problem. Let's work on a structural solutions. This is time for you to act board members, and this is the reason why we need an elected representative school board. But Thank our you, communities Alderman. are tired of waiting. Thank, Thank you. you, Alderman. Mr. President, we'll continue with the next Alderwoman, please. Uh, Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez from the 33rd Ward, followed by Alderman Andre Vasquez from the 40th Ward. Um, hello, thank you members of the board for allowing us to speak. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, board member Elizabeth Todd Breland for, um, for her efforts to try to remove SROs from schools. Um, I am an educator myself. I worked as a teacher for a very long time and I would like to think that as people who are uh, in charge of policy in CPS, you are always looking for the best evidence in order to inform those policies. I am deeply disappointed in the fact that the decision to remove SROs from schools was put on LSDs with the knowledge that there are many LSDs that are non-operational um, in Chicago, but, but, mo but, but mostly what is disturbing to me is that when we think about making decisions that are based in the best evidence, like the Department of Public Health has done with COVID, for example, it, it is beyond me how you just delegate that to an LSD in a community. You know what the best evidence is. You know that SROs do not belong in schools. You know that they perpetuate the school to prison pipeline for black students. 
So what we are saying is that we're just going to leave that decision to an LSC independently of what are the particular situations in those schools, instead of focusing on providing the resources that these communities need in order for children to be safe. Um, I have Roosevelt High School in my ward. I'm incredibly proud of Roosevelt High School, incredibly proud, like deeply proud. Roosevelt High School has a restorative justice program that has reduced in school suspensions by almost 70% just by using a restorative justice approach. And this is not about individual officers. There are schools that have good relationships where, where, with their officers. It is not about that. It is about what we are perpetuating by bringing um, the police into our schools. Um, we know, because data tells us, that one in 1,000 Black men will be killed by police. By relying on police for safety unilaterally, what we're saying is that we are okay with a racist approach to safety in our schools. And we cannot allow that to continue to happen. So I really want to encourage you to accelerate the process of getting SROs out of schools and devote resources to having counselors, to having social workers, to having restorative justice programs like the ones that uh, Roosevelt High School has developed. Um, we need so much more in our schools in order to develop whole healthy uh, students. Um, I, I really live for the moment when we can actually see that, when we can see that our public schools are sanctuaries for our students um, to develop their skills uh, and to develop into healthy uh, individuals that can engage uh, with, with our communities. Um, so I, I would really love to see um, CPS taking the lead um, on, on, on that journey. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Have a good day. Thank you, Alderwoman Rodriguez Sanchez. Mr. President, we'll continue with uh, Alderman Andre Vasquez, please, from the 40th Ward, uh, followed by Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa from the 35th Ward. Alderman Vasquez. Alderman Vasquez, please unmute. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Alderman. Please proceed. Alderman Vasquez? Yeah, I keep I keep being muted and unmuted. Are we okay now? You are set. Thank you so much. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, yep, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to speak uh, to the board. Um, I know none of these are easy, easy decisions, especially in listening to all the public comment. Uh, I'm a calling. I am calling in again in opposition to the SRO program. Uh, thankfully, in the 40th Ward, two out of the three high schools um, did vote to remove SROs, and we're looking to see what the other schools will do. Um, I know I could spend time here to talk about anecdotal experiences, about the value set, but I just want to talk data and logic because I but over a month ago when we had the hearing based on the inspector general's uh, investigation and an inquiry into the SRO program where it was shown to be pretty much a failure when it even came to recommendations that were given by the office of the inspector general. Um, I submitted a number of questions and didn't get a response for over two, about, about two months until most recently, maybe three days before this meeting. And looking at the information I got back, we still didn't get answers to what we were asking for. Um, what we did get was a slide deck showing the differences between high schools with SROs and high schools uh, without SROs. And unequivocally, in every category, whether it was notifications of office of by officers, whether it was uh, out of school suspensions, whether it was expulsions, in every category, and it wasn't even close, it was these schools with SROs that had higher rates, almost double in many instances of those occurrences and every single time it was black and brown youth that were the ones who were the victims of, of any interaction so one could try to make the um connection that because more officers were there they were able to able to catch more activity you would be then making the premise that children are criminals and that somehow the police are doing a better job because they're there 
I don't really buy that premise. I think if you have more officers in the schools, you end up with more expulsions, more notifications, more out of school suspensions, and more black and brown students being victimized in the places they're supposed to be protected to learn. Uh, other questions that went unanswered or, or answers that we actually got that were really disappointing. Um, we act, asked what guidance was there for selection of the SROs. And the answer we got is, it's if the principal feels that the SRO is a good fit. So it's up to one individual and their anecdotal feeling and experience whether a person is qualified to be in a school with students while being armed. Uh, I asked another one, what is uh, CPD? They have their own criteria they vet to get people in SRO. We were not provided information as to what the criteria is, and we have enough problems with CPD as it is across the city. Now, as it came to a breakdown of how many complaints, the answer we got is we will need more time because the research is manually intensive. So you couldn't even provide the answers of how many complaints there have been. Uh, there was only a total number of 2,300, but no detail, no information on that. We asked if schools with SROs have more or less involvement in the criminal justice system as it relates to students. CPS does not track that information. CPD does not track that information. So we have no idea if the interaction or the effect we have an SRO program in schools has an effect on whether students end up in the carceral system. And that is just irresponsible for any program you'd let in. We also looked and asked what the budget for restorative justice looks like in comparison to the SRO program. The SRO program is $33 million a budget. The budget for restorative justice, $20 million less at $13 million. Uh, we asked how you track incidents of misconduct and how information shared by CPD and CPS. Uh, on that, let me see, we don't, everything goes to COPA as far as any complaints, which for some reason was introduced as a reform a week ago. If, if this was already the case, I don't know why that was introduced as a reform. The other problem I have with the reform that was introduced is there was a reform that was presented uh, by the board along with the mayor saying that going forward, SROs would not be putting information on students into the gang database. What that leads me to ask is, was that being done prior since now it's a reform? Every time I've asked any party, we get no answers as to if any information of students is in that gang database as a result of the SRO program. I would assume that somebody has that data or else it wouldn't be introduced as a reform. So now we also ask how many SROs have multiple CRs. 36 different officers have multiple, uh, uh, SROs have multiple complaints. Another four have, uh, in addition to five or more, uh, there are five officers with 10 complaints uh, that result, with complaints that resulted in them being suspended for more than 10 days or having discipline. Uh, we asked for a demographic breakdown of the SROs. We did not get that. So I don't, I can talk about the reality that this is clearly, uh, creating a, an environment where black and brown students are feeling criminalized, where they're being treated as such, and how that's not justice by any lens. I can do that all day. But I wanted to make sure to talk about the data and the logic provided by CPD and CPS, which shows how insufficient this program is. If this was any other vendor, if this was somebody who was a contractor, you would shut it down. So it is completely irresponsible for this appointed board to continue to to actually let it go forward. I've heard conversations about the sunsetting of the program. I would hope that is the direction that we're going in um, because clearly we're looking at the results. We're looking at the data. You're hearing from the students. You're hearing from the parents. There was just an investigation after CPS was getting sued by a journalist where they actually gave the information on the survey. And what the survey showed is they didn't have tracking on who did what. It was mostly skewed from schools on the north side of town. And there wasn't enough information to really validate the claims that were being made when we were announcing what those results of the survey was. At every single juncture, there's been a failure of leadership, there's been a failure of execution, and a failure to even track results. I don't even understand why logically this is something that's debatable. So I would ask for everyone on the board here not to search your conscience, because you already should have done that with people and students being outside some of your homes, but to look at the logic, because when we see the results of this, right, when we say, you know, and I'm doing a lot of this because in the 40th Ward, Caleb Reed, who was a student in one of the schools, was uh, tragically murdered 
a couple weeks ago. And he was fighting for this because he had been arrested at Mather just for not having an ID. So when we think about the interactions, when we think about the data, when we think about everything, it is truly irresponsible to be able to support something like this. And I would hope that each of you, not just find it in your hearts, but look in the logic and make the right decision on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alderman Vasquez. Mr. President, we'll continue with uh, Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa from the 35th Ward, and then we'll have um, Alderman Michael Rodriguez from the 22nd Ward. Alderman Ramirez? Can you please unmute? Alderman Ramirez, can you please unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, Alderman, please proceed. Okay, all right. It's not a virtual meeting without a glitch. I wanna thank, thank um, President Miguel de Valle and the Board of Education members for allowing me to testify today. Uh, and all of the parents and community members and union leaders who offered thoughtful testimony on various issues uh, earlier today. Uh, my name is Carlos Ramirez Rosa, and I'm very proud to represent uh, portions of five neighborhoods on the northwest side of Chicago as alderman of the 35th Ward. And I come before you again today uh, to testify in support of ending uh, the school resource officer program once and for all in our Chicago public schools. Um, some months ago, uh, after speaking with students, parents, teachers, and doing the research, uh, I introduced alongside uh, a dozen plus uh, other aldermen, including uh, chief co-sponsors, Alderman Roderick Sawyer and Jeanette Taylor, um, a ordinance to terminate uh, the contract between CPD and the Chicago public schools. I did so after listening to CPS students who complained of harassment, abuse, and violence. And I did so after an extensive review of the research uh, that has conclusively found uh, that uh, there's not much uh, research supporting that police officers improve school public safety, but there is quite a bit of research connecting police officers to lower graduation rates, higher incarceration rates, lower test scores, uh, and the school to prison pipeline that disproportionately impacts black and brown students. And we see that here also with the data for our own Chicago public schools. Since then, I have followed along intently with the conversation that the Board of Education has been having, that the CPS administration has been having, that LSEs have been having, and that school principals have been having. And I've heard from school principals that have said very loudly and clearly that they feel that they need their school resource officers. Um, they have pointed to how the school resource officer plays a role as a mentor, how the school resource officer they feel makes their school safer. In that discussion, I have not heard any real data or any real research or studies that point to police officers actually increasing school safety. But what I have heard is in line with the research that looks at police officers in schools, which finds that adults and school administrators tend to report that they feel safer. And so I hear what the principals are saying, I hear what some parents are saying, but the reality is that there's a difference between reality and perception. And the research finds that while parents and administrators perceive uh, that the school is safer by having an SRO, in fact, there's no real strong data that shows that. What the data does show is that there are other ways to increase school public safety. And the primary way is through a trauma-informed approach that seeks to prevent violence before it even becomes an issue. Meeting with uh, parents and neighbors in my school at a forum to discuss school resource officers that was held earlier this month, we heard from a social justice um, and restorative justice educator who talked about how he was brought into a school to work with two rival gangs using art, poetry, uh, and conversation, he was able to de-escalate violence and prevent uh, a school shooting or school violence from happening in that setting. He didn't need a gun. He didn't need a badge. He didn't need uh, handcuffs to do that. So I'm very pleased uh, with the resolution that the Chicago Public Schools is considering today 
uh, to ask the Chicago Public Schools leadership to come up with alternatives to phase out the school resource officer program and to really come up with a plan for public safety in our Chicago public schools. I'm pleased with the March deadline. I'm pleased uh, that the resolution calls for an end to SROs by August of 2021. I understand that change takes time and that moving bureaucracy takes time. And so um, as one of the chief sponsors of the um, resolution to end the school uh, uh, SRO program, uh, the ordinance in the Chicago City Council that would terminate that contract, uh, I'm very uh, interested in following along what you all do today. I hope that you all will vote on this resolution. Uh, I hear parents and I hear teachers and students that saying it is not fast enough. Yes, I agree with that. I wish that we could just terminate that contract right now and today. But if the board feels that there needs to be time to come up with a plan, uh, I will listen to that and I will respect that. Um, ultimately, we need to get rid of police officers in our public schools. We need to embrace a real public safety strategy, one that is trauma-informed and one that understands that when a student arrives to school with a gun, it's already too late. There's not a ramble police officer that's gonna karate chop the gun out of their hand. The research just shows that that's not the case. If we really wanna keep our students safe, we need to have a trauma-informed approach that is going to be able to prevent that from happening. And that means investing in social workers, that means investing in therapists, that means investing in counselors. So I certainly hope that the Chicago Public Schools can work with the Chicago Teachers Union, can work with um, our parents, our teachers, our students, listen to black students who are saying, get these police officers out of our schools and come up with a real public safety plan. But regardless, I will continue to stand with those parents and teachers if CPS does not do it, I will continue to fight to make sure that the Chicago City Council does it. So I want to thank you for listening to me here today. And lastly, I just want to add that we need to protect Black life, and that includes protecting our clerks that work in our Chicago public schools. Please, 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 let's give them the safety and security that so many white professionals are able to enjoy, that so many white teachers are able to enjoy, and that's the safety of working from home. We have seen how black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic, and that is because in the United States, sadly, working from home during a pandemic has become a privilege reserved for the wealthy and the white, as opposed to being something that is afforded to all of us. So please, please, please protect our Black grandmothers, protect our Black mothers, protect our Latina mothers, our, uh, all of our people, please, and allow them to work from home during this pandemic. We just have lost too many people in our Black and Brown communities in this pandemic. Have a great day. Thank you, Alderman. Mr. President, we'll proceed with Alderman Michael Rodriguez from the 22nd Ward, please. Alderman Rodriguez, please unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, please proceed. Wonderful. Thank you. Honorable uh, Chicago Board of Education members, President Delvaya, Dr. Jackson, and all others who have been a part of these proceedings today, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in your midst. Um, very quickly, um, I've come to this conversation um, as an individual uh, who's been very much engaged on the issue um, as the immediate past president and board member of the Juvenile Justice Initiative as uh, a commissioner for the state's Juvenile Justice Commission as appointed by Governor Quinn, but most importantly, as the proud uh, parent of a CPS student, an eight-year-old who attends uh, Souter Montessori on the West Side. Um, the fact is, is that our country has historically taken very punitive approaches to discipline and as, to an extent, car incarceration as well. Um, it's a fact that our country is 5% of the world's population, but we incarcerate 25% of those incarcerated throughout the world. Uh, we had a war on drugs in the 1980s that led to absolutely no decrease in the number of individuals using or profiting off of drugs, uh, but certainly led to an increase in the number of black and brown individuals uh, incarcerated uh, across our country. But um, times are changing. And I think we need to listen to those changes. The fact is, is that across our state, um, we're closing juvenile detention centers. Governor Pritzker uh, and uh, stood in my community just not a month ago to announce the closing of juvenile detention centers. We've had a concerted effort to reform the GIST cure locally, and we're looking to potentially close that facility in the near future. Our state's reforming laws, our city's reforming laws and policies that are decriminalizing our youth and I think we need to heed this movement 
and think about the first interaction many of our young people have with the criminal justice system and with police in a negative way, and that's at our schools. And our school to prison pipeline is a real thing. Uh, the ACLU conducted a national study uh, within the last several years, and I'd like to quote one of their lead attorneys, uh, Amir Whitaker, who stated, how we prepare for and respond to children in need of support is a choice. And research is clear that providing more counselors is that best approach. We can either provide evidence-based support for students or take overly punitive and police-heavy measures that ho have no demonstrable positive impacts. The report shows school hardening practices disproportionately harm students of color and students with disabilities and fail to make schools safer overall. Uh, lastly, I'd say the school, social, the, the, forgive me, the Social Work Association uh, cites that we are in dire need of uh, counselors in our school. The fact is, is that they recommend one counselor, social worker, for every 250 students. And in Cook County, about 10% of students attend schools with cops with no social workers at all. So again, I'd like to say we need to heed this movement. We need to think about the best evidence in youth development. I think we show what, our young, what we value in our young people by what we put around them. Um, I believe that we should be increasing the number of school counselors and social workers and nurses uh, in the immediate vicinity of our young people so that they see the value that we invest in them in their everyday life and end this program as soon as possible. Uh, I implore you all to uh, um, move in that direction as quickly as possible. Thank you very much for the time you've offered me today. Thank you, Alderman Rodriguez. Uh, President Del Valle, we do have uh, Alderman Michael Scott from the 24th Ward and Education Chair who uh, will be addressing the board, but we are trying to connect with him at this moment. If you give us just one second, uh, as soon as he connects, he'll address the board. Alderman Scott? Alderman Scott, can you please unmute? Yes. Yes, thank you. We can hear you. You can proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, President and members of the Board of Education. Uh, I thank you for allowing me this time to speak. Um, you know, I, I'm very pleased with the engagement that uh, the board and CPS as a whole has done around this issue. Uh, I know that you've engaged local school councils um, and as the chairman of the education committee, uh, we held a meeting uh, to engage the other city council members about this issue. And I know that there are varying arguments and varying issues about this, uh, but I do appreciate you guys putting in the work to hear everybody and making sure that everybody's voices is heard around this. Um, and as you know, uh, 54 schools voted to keep the SRO program. Um, and, and the reason I think that that is so very important is that there are different issues in different communities. The issues that affect me are not the same that affect many of my colleagues that have spoken here today. Uh, and I know that there are many parents that do not feel comfortable uh, allowing their children in and around their schools without officers. I'm going to give you testimony of uh, a school that is on the 4,800 block of Grinshaw, um, which is a very, very good school, and that is Frazier, um, Frazier Elementary, uh, which is a magnet program in my community. And, and I know that um, there are issues in and around that school each and every day. And I have the principal, as well as parents, as well as students imploring me uh, to see if I can get more security in and around that school because of the activity that happens. Uh, there is a major drug operation that is on the 4100 block. Uh, there is crime that happens on the 3900 block and that school is the only safe haven that exists uh, in and around that community. And um, to, to the point that there have, been there have been places or times where there have been shootings and the building has had to be locked down and the officer has gone out and made sure that those children are safe going to and from school. Now, I, again, I know that there are 
arguments on both sides of, of the equation. And, and I, I do believe that uh, we have to look at, at policing as a whole when it comes to the city of Chicago, but I don't think it's an either or proposition. I heard my colleague talk about uh, placing value in counselors and other folks, and we do need to do that. Um, but that does not mean keeping a school in a community like North Lawndale that has a very high rate of violence in and around its community does not feel safe when they have officers in and around that school. Uh, and so, again, I, I, I would like to thank you guys for your leadership in this effort. Um, you know, I was on the call when when you had the first meeting and I had my own city <laughs> council hearing that lasted an, another five, six, seven hours. And, and CPS has done a magnificent job of making sure that all the answers, even though they may not have been the answers that my colleagues want, all of the answers that were at, all the questions that were asked, answers were given to them and provided to them. And so I appreciate your diligence around that. Uh, I appreciate the board's willingness to, to hear me and to hear my colleagues and hear other people who have varying arguments on both sides. But again, I don't think this is a one size fits all model. And I don't think that you can remove all officers from all schools at one time and our communities continue to feel safe in and around their schools. Again, I thank you for your time to speak. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and members of the board. Thank you, Alderman Scott. Mr. President, this concludes public participation. Uh, board members, any questions or comments related to public participation? Uh, Mr. President, this is Board Member Trust. He's me. Mem Member Trust. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I just uh, thank you for all that that participated in public uh, participation and those who were using different avenues such as emails, letters, etc. Um, just a couple things, real quick. I do want to say that I've heard you know from clerks with the concern in reference to uh, proper protection. I just want to just you know mention that, and at the same time, I, I'm confident that 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 CPS will address those needs. But I just want to just say, that, yeah, I've heard some concerns from the, from the clerks from different schools, and also it's no big secret that um, you know how I feel about our principals who are who are working very hard. And quite sure, you know, we all feel the same way. And, um, and we just want, I just want to make sure they stay encouraged that there, there's quiet advocacy that's going on. And, um, but at the same time, you know, management, you know, it, it has a role in, 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 in um, and I trust their judgment of, of really trying to make sure that all our staff members are, are treated fairly. But I just want to acknowledge that, you know, some of those concerns have been voiced and that, um, and just, we just got to keep having those conversations, but in a very respectful manner. Thank you, Member Truss. Uh, if there are no other members, um, you'll have opportunities when, after the presentation, to make comments and, and ask questions. So, so let's let's proceed to the uh, to the presentations. Uh, uh, Dr. Jackson, uh, please begin. Dr. Jackson, please unmute. Sorry. Uh, thank you, President Del Valle. We have four presentations queued up. We will start with a presentation from Heather Wendell, our budget director, who will go over the SY21 operating budget. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Good afternoon, President DeValle and members of the board. I am pleased today to provide an overview of the 21 uh, proposed budget. Can I advance the slide? We can advance the slide, please. Heather, his um, his computer may be frozen. Give us one. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Thank you. 
we'll get that presentation up shortly. Here we go. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so the FY21 budget reflects a first of its kind community engagement process. Under the leadership of Mayor Lori Lightfoot and CEO Jackson, this winter we engaged in a robust community dialogue around school funding. We had over 500 community members attend six public school forum funding workshops in January and February and engage around discussion and presenting feedback on the state of school funding. In addition, we pulled together a working group that was comprised of parents, principals, school funding experts, and other stakeholders, including board members and district leadership, that turned the public feedback into recommendations that informed the funding decisions for this year's budget. Um, some of those included direct decisions on leading us to several key strategies, one of which is providing $100,000 for all neighborhood schools and particular economic hardship areas through the FY 2021 equity grant. We also provided additional supports for principals and LSCs related to funding allocation decisions. And we've provided an ongoing commitment from the district to continue the stakeholder engagement process around school funding this year and in the coming years. Additional highlights of the FY 2021 budget include allocating $75 million in resources to specifically address challenges created by COVID-19. This includes resources that will support both the remote learning model and prepare for an in-person hybrid model, including computing devices, cleaning supplies, PPE, and more. The district will also invest 653 million in building improvements at more than 250 schools. Priority projects include over $306 million to address facility needs and strengthen high quality neighborhood schools throughout the city. 202 million in building improvements to support modern science labs, pre-K classrooms and spaces for new high quality academic programs, and the launch of a five-year commitment to invest $100 million in approved ADA accessibility. In FY21, we were proud to have presented school leaders with their budgets in spring. This year, it was April of 2020. This is the third straight year that schools receive their budgets early in spring and with funding levels guaranteed against any fall changes of enrollment. As Dr. Jackson messaged earlier in the meeting, the school budgets reflect over $125 million in new investments. This includes the ongoing commitment to the equity grant, which increased to $44 million this year. Increases in special education funding by $97 million, which is the district's single largest year increase. We've invested an additional $18 million for the continued expansion of the free full day pre K program, invested additional dollars in FTE and high need schools to fund restorative justice coordinators, librarians, additional counselors, and other school selected positions. And we've continued the district's multi year investment in case managers, nurses, and social workers, reaching all time high levels for each of those positions. Next slide, please. The 21 budget as proposed also reflects funding for school resource officers. The FY21 level will reduce by over 50% compared to last year's budget. We've also included $343 million in anticipated federal revenue, which is necessary to close the short-term budget gap created by COVID-19. The anticipated federal revenue represents a conservative estimate of the potential federal funding. Proposals from both parties include K-12 funding patch packages that would well exceed the amount that we've included in our 21 budget as proposed. And this federal funding provides necessary support to cover emergency expenses related to remote learning and school reopening and short-term losses in anticipated revenue that are further driven by the state's financial position and the COVID crisis. Following these highlights, we want to take some time to take a look at the overall components of the budget. Um, the chart in front of you provides a high-level overview of the combined budget as presented. The pie chart represents the three components the operating budget, the capital budget, and the debt service budget. The total CPS FY21 budget as proposed is $8.4 billion. The largest portion of the budget is the operating budget, which pays for day-to-day -day operations. This totals $6.9 billion. This is primarily funded through local tax revenues and state and federal funding. The operating budget also includes non-discretionary items 
um, for $3.7 billion for salary and benefits, which is largely governed by collective bargaining agreements, and $886 million in teacher pension contributions, which is governed by state statute. The second largest component of the budget is the capital budget, which represents 9% of the overall. This pays for renovation and expansions of existing schools, and 85% of the funds here are generated through the issuance of bonds. The third component of the budget is the debt service budget, which is $711 million as proposed, or 8% of the overall budget. The debt service budget pays for interest and principal on bonds. This is primarily funded through state revenues and personal property replacement tax dollars. Looking next at the revenues, this chart illustrates the sources of the dollars that we have on the operating budget. State revenues comprise 27% of the overall operating budget with federal representing 19 and local being the largest share of our operating budget at 54%. The local revenues comprised of local sources including property tax, personal property replacement tax and TIF surplus represent $3.7 billion of the operating budget. State funding represents 27% and is $1.85 billion as in the proposed budget. These dollars come from the state and include the evidence-based funding or EBF formula funding, teacher pension normal costs, and a variety of categorical grants. The state revenue in Illinois and CPS in particular represents a lower portion of operating revenues than in other districts, which increases our reliance on the local share of dollars. Additionally, in the 21 budget, we have a uh, composition of federal dollars, which adds up to $1.3 billion. The federal funding this year is the continuation of federal title dollars and lunchroom services that we receive annually, categorical funds that support primarily low-income students, and the anticipated federal, federal revenues, both under the Committed CARES Act and the anticipated additional stimulant st stabilization funds. In all, 95% of our operating budget directly supports schools. As you can see on the chart, district schools at 48%, charter schools at 11%, comprise 59% of the budget that is directly allocated to schools. These are dollars that are provided to schools for school level local decisions. In addition to those dollars, 36% of the funding is allocated through citywide allocations which are provided centrally and managed centrally, but support schools directly. This includes custodians, security, and other functions that are allocated and provide supports on a daily basis to schools, as well as any fall enrollment funding adjustments or potential grants that might be managed centrally, but allocated out into school buildings. The remaining less than 5% of the CPS operating budget covers the central office and network costs. While the previous slide shows the budget by location, this slide provides an illustration of the dollars by account. You can see from the largest portions of the pie, the gray teacher salary, the red teacher pension, and the blue benefits, as well as the blue ESP salaries and other benefits, that salaries and benefits comprise 77% of the CPS operating budget. When you include funding for charter schools, which is, primary also, which is primarily also allocated for salary and benefits of those staff. The remaining 23% of the operating budget are used to pay non-personnel expenses, including commodities such as food and utilities, instructional supplies, student transportation, and various contractual services, including facilities management and safe passage, which benefit schools on a daily basis. Moving into another view of the operating budget, this slide provides an overview of the operating budget investments by FTE. The CPS 2021 proposed budget includes over 39,000 FTEs, 97% of which directly support schools. Teachers, school support staff, and school administrators make up 84% of the CPS employees, while another 13% are citywide staff that provide services directly to schools. These are comprised of the yellow, gray, orange and blue sections of the pie chart. The remaining section in the green and in the blue central office 
is less than 3% are, excuse me, the blue central office piece of the pie represents less than 3% of the positions, which are central office administrative positions, with 97% of the positions uh, being provided directly to schools through citywide or through network offices being in schools every day. Moving on to slide 11, the chart in front of you highlights the district's net cash position. Despite an approved overall financial position, the district still must borrow to meet cash obligations. The gray center line represents zero. And as you can see, since FY14, the district has consistently ended the year with a negative cash position, including the year ending June 30th, 2020. As of 630, the district's net cash position was negative 234 million and consisted of 266 million in cash balances and minus 500 million in outstanding tax anticipation notes or TANS. 18 million of short-term interest costs is included in the 2021 budget and we are projecting a net negative cash position during the majority of FY21. Now looking specifically at the debt service component of the proposed budget, the bar chart here illustrates the district's long-term debt. Payments on the district's 8.1 billion outstanding long-term debt are used to fund capital improvements. And this is what the $711 million of long-term interest costs that has been included in the 21 budget will go to service. To date, we have $8.1 million in outstanding debt that continues to support capital projects and the portion of the obligation of that that will come in 21 is represented in the 711 million that is part of the debt service budget as proposed. Moving into pension costs, the bar chart here illustrates the state's contributions and Chicago's pension contributions as well as those of other districts. The bars on the left side in the green represent state funding per student for teacher pensions outside the city of Chicago, while the blue bars represent state funding per student for Chicago teacher pensions. As you can see, as there has been continued investment in the pension costs, there continues to be an inequity across the pension costs within Chicago versus other districts outside the city of Chicago. The comparison point here for FY21 is $3,262 per student equivalent for teacher pensions outside of the city versus $742 for FY21 for pensions per student within the city. And continuing with pension costs, this chart shows that the teacher pension obligation will continue to grow for the next 40 years through 2059. Even though the state provides only a portion of the funding, we, CPS, now have a dedicated property tax levy that will grow over the next 10 to 15 years to allow us to pay the obligation without diverting operating dollars to cover these costs. The budget as presented includes $343 million of federal support under stabilization funding. In the event that the stabilization funding should not be realized, the district would utilize a series of financial strategies, including the use of debt service stabilization funds, grant contingencies, and other one-time funding options to cover costs in FY21. Any such financial um, utilization strategies would require us to have a significant impact on the district's financial position in FY22. And we may need to revisit funding decisions as this budget as proposed fully funds schools and department functions. It is essential for the federal government to protect schools across the country and provide the additional stabilization dollars necessary for schools to reopen and for instruction to occur. Finally, I'm gonna provide a high level overview of the third component of the budget as proposed, which is the FY 2021 capital budget. The FY 2021 capital budget provides an overall investment of $758 million. The largest areas of investment, as you can see from the table, are investments in facility needs and in educational programming. This includes prioritization of facility needs in neighborhood schools, as well as ongoing investments in labs, classrooms, and other upgrades necessary to help us achieve the academic priorities. To support schools throughout the city, the capital plan also provides funding in six main areas, which is the critical facility needs, interior improvements, 
programmatic investments, overcrowding relief, site improvements, and IT security upgrades, as outlined in the table. The FY 2021 capital budget funding strategy includes $653 million in guaranteed resources that are backed by anticipated bond offerings and other committed resources. We've also included 50 million in state funding and additional 55 million in other potential external funding um, for a total of $758 million as proposed in the capital plan. That concludes the presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, we have four uh, very long presentations, um, but uh, since they cover different subject matter, I, I think uh, at this point, let me suggest that we maybe take a couple of questions and then uh, uh... Mr. President, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, we have uh, four very um, long presentations here. Uh, I suggest we hold up most of our questions till, uh, till until we get to, to the vote on these different matters. But I, I think it's important to uh, allow for a couple of questions at this time. Um, okay. I, I, I've, uh, I, I have one, one question and one comment uh, for Heather. Um, when, given, given the uncertainty at the federal level, um, uh, how much time do we have uh, before the time comes when we will have to amend this budget uh, if there are no federal dollars coming uh, to cover the $353, that $343 million that we anticipate at this time will come from the federal government? What, what, what kind of time frame are we looking at here? How much time do we have? Um, I don't know if Heather or, okay, go ahead, Heather. Sorry, no, certainly. Um, so I was trying to get myself up mute. Um, so thank you for the question. I think, um, you know, in terms of the timing of it, um, the assumption that we have built on here is a matter of it being a not if, but when. And so continuing to monitor and working with our legislative team, um, we have every reason to believe that the funding will be imminent within the coming weeks and months. Um, I think to continue to monitor this in terms of the operating costs overall, we do have options available to us um, if things should go beyond the fall or things of that sort. Um, but, you know, defer to, um, in some regards, some of the legislative pieces to play out. Um, this will allow us to continue the work of the district and continue with the services that are imminent and immediate um, while we continue to look for ways to solve longer term should we need to do so. Um, but there, um, at this point, this is the uh, best path forward in terms of the plan and the timing. Um, and we'll continue to, to monitor like everyone is, you know, what's going on at the federal level um, and make that decision um, when, when and if it becomes necessary. Uh, yes, as you indicated, we do have options and we've talked about those options and, and so we do have a backup plan. Um, but I, I want to urge the public, I want to urge uh, elected officials and everyone to, to really, really pay attention to what's happening um, in Washington uh, because without these federal dollars uh, that we are assuming at this point we're going to get, um, just like school districts throughout the entire country, um, we will have to be made, we will be making some very, very tough decisions, some very, very tough decisions. Uh, and so I think uh, it's important that everyone dedicate some time and energy towards uh, ensuring that we get that federal response that, uh, that every school district in the country desperately needs at this time. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yep. So I, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, uh, Elizabeth? Yes, I was just going to um, co-sign what you just said, really. I mean, I think all this energy around advocacy certainly right now needs to be directed at the federal government um, to make sure it's not just us, right, in CPS. All around the country, school districts are going to suffer if they are the only body that has the borrowing ability to provide the funds that are needed. And so I just think it's so important that all of us find ways to advocate um, at the federal level. And I also just wanted to lift up the work that um, Heather and her team 
um, did over the course of the last several months in really going out into communities and talking about the budgeting process, talking about um, you know, various ways to make the budget more equitable, showing us the ways that those conversations then impacted the plan that was put forward for this year. I think it was just um, a really great strategy um, and it was really uh, informative for folks. And one of the things, Heather and Mike and the whole team that I think really came out strongly in those conversations with the community was that our communities are ready to advocate for funding for this district. Um, and that, that at the time, I think we were talking less federal and more state. Um, and I think it is still important to talk about that, those adequacy targets and the fact that we're not where we need to be. And I know that clearly the state is, is dependent on the federal government, but that's not a reason to stop the pressure at that level. There are ballot initiatives around a graduated income tax that are coming up that we can be advocating for. There are all these different spaces to tr start advocating and continue to advocate for um, progressive revenue at the state, local and federal level that is so important now it's always been important, but particularly because if COVID has taught us nothing, we are the last part of the social safety net. Schools are on the front lines of making sure that young people and their families and our broader communities are okay. I'm so proud of the work that the district has done to feed families, right? And yet are continuing to do to feed families. That's a basic provision of social services that schools are doing. And so for the federal government to be dragging their feet on funding, this, these essential services feels unconscionable. And so I just feel like that momentum that we were building in those community meetings, I just wanna encourage us wherever we're located to continue that advocacy, to make sure um, that we're providing what we need um, and that the district can continue to do the work that they're doing. Vice President Revolori. I, I Thank you, Elizabeth made it easy. I wanted to agree with everything she just said. Also the question that you asked President of I, I um, really appreciate all the work that the entire budget team did uh, from the process of uh, providing information and education for us as members of the working group, for members of the public who engaged, for taking in all that input, making sense of it, and then connecting the dots about what that means for our plan going forward. Uh, I had two questions. One, um, President Devaya asked sort of the what if we don't get this funding? I wanted to ask a, a more basic question. Uh, where does that assumed amount come from? Um, and then the second question is, will the work of the, the school funding working group continue and how will it be different given the new uh, situation and the new uncertainties that face us? Yes, thank you for the questions. Um, so in terms of the assumed amount for the federal funding, um, because we're working with what are a variety of proposals, just like every other school district in the country, we're using what is considered to be a conservative estimate based on the amount of money that the federal funding uh, garnered us under the CARES provisions. And so the CARES Act funding was around $13, million, $13 billion allocated at the federal level, which resulted in our um, allocation of just over $200 million. And so based on the proposals that are happening at the federal level being much, much higher for K-12 than the CARES dollars, we've taken a conservative approach on something that, assuming that it comes out anywhere um, near what is being currently discussed, our number will be conservative for, for what those dollars are. And so uh, felt confident that we could reflect that um, here uh, safely in terms of with the assumption that the federal government does indeed do what they need to do for us and for every school district in the country. Um, in terms of the second piece related to the school funding forums and the working group, um, as you'll recall, the intent was always to pass the FY21 budget and then re-engage in both of those sort of forums, both the working group and the uh, public engagement sessions. And so in the last few weeks in particular, we have started the discussions about what that work could look like going forward um, and you know, revisiting the uh, recommendations and assumptions that we made in the working group report. And so we are excited to be able to relaunch and get some of those items going uh, by end of first quarter um, is, is the current plan within this. And I think in terms of of being able to give direction to that. Some of it is picking up on where we left off um, in terms of the advocacy and some of those other elements um, and exploring some of the other data pieces um, that we had committed to in the report, but then also engaging folks in such a way that 
indicate that it is a slightly different conversation than we left it in February and March. So I think there will be, um, you know, the opportunity for us to sort of shape what that looks like in uh, re-engage authentically around the way that it, we're in uncharted territory. And so um, being able to engage people, because um, I agree with Elizabeth, there's absolutely an enthusiasm for getting involved um, and being able to go back out and, and sort of get that going again. So um, so appreciate the interest in that. Um, and very much look forward to getting into round two of that work. Great, thank you to you and your team for all the work you've done. Thanks. Any other questions or? Yes. This okay. board member Melendez, I just have a clarifying question. Yes, member okay. Melendez. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, uh, pertains to uh, first, thank you for all the work that you're doing for engaging the community. So making sure that each board member has a clear uh, understanding of the budget. Uh, I want to join my fellow board members in thanking you, Heather, and all your team. Um, and my, my question is very minute. Um, it's the 1.9 million anticipated um, federal funding includes that uh, 343 million that we are hoping to get from from the um, from the feds. Correct. So the oh. assumption of the revenue in the pie chart of the 1.9 billion includes the higher level and the additional stabilization funding that we're anticipating. Yes. And my other question, it's a little bit um, more forward looking. In the graph that you showed about the pension um, the funding, the teacher's pension funding and the state contributions and you um, pointed out something that we are increasing some alternative ways of funding to uh, not be so reliant. The, the other one, the, the one that shows uh, I think it's a couple of slides. The next after one after that, probably. I, I think. think yes. Yeah, yeah, that one. So it shows um, that the state contribution is either going to, um, you know, stay the same, or after 2044, about start to decrease. And uh, in in view of the, uh, you know, the inequality in regards to state contributions to teacher funding for CPS. I, you know, I just want to call attention again to that issue. And um, although I agree uh, a thousand percent with my fellow board members call to advocate for the, you know, the need for current federal additional federal funding um, to meet our needs, also to, you know, start looking ahead and um, coming up with ways in which this situation maybe can be addressed at some point. It won't be immediate, but it it it, con it continues to concern me uh, um, as a as a former teacher and now as a board member. I think that that is something that you know deserves to be continued paid attention to. Thank you for highlighting that, Member Sotelo. Yes, this is a this is a great segue, and we did not tee it up with Luciana, but uh, I I do want to kind of uh, bring all of this back to. The, the priority and the sources of funds and then the likelihood to have the funds, right? So uh, first, thank you to the team. Um, and, I, and I also want to acknowledge the Civic Federation for their independent analysis. Uh, you should know that we actually have been requesting a lot of scenario analysis a uh, couple of months in advance to make sure that we, we pressure test uh, the budgets in front of us. And the team did a, a great job of scenario planning and, and laying out the scenarios. That being said, uh, it is a risky proposition to rely on uh, unconfirmed funds, but that's the lower end of, of the band. So I feel comfortable with that dependency on, on the federal side. Uh, however, uh, we cannot ignore uh, what Louisiana just said. Uh, we cannot ignore the inequality of the state uh, pension contribution because if that was at the same level as all other districts, we'd be balanced, right? Um, and, and then some. Uh, so we need to make sure that we keep that uh, front and center as well in our advocacy to ensure that we get our equitable share of the revenue to ensure that we actually provide this state mandated, state mandated quality education to our students through the great educators that we have to make sure that we properly fund their pensions uh, as well 
uh, as we as you have done for all the rest of the districts. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any, any other board member, if not uh, Dr. Jackson, we can move to the next presentation. My questions and concerns have all been addressed, and I'm not going to belabor them, but I do want to really quickly echo the gratitude of um, Heather for Heather and Mike and the community engagement. And I think it was a model process of listening and authentically engaging people and then really showing the work of how that engagement resulted in um, changes in practice and ways of thinking. Um, so thank you so much for this work. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jackson. All right, thank you. Um, our next presentation, my apologies on between screens. Um, our next presentation um, accompanies the budget presentation. We have Lindy McGuire, Ivan Hansen, and Maurice Sweeney to walk us through the capital budget for next year. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Board President, Vice President Revoluri, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Jackson, Chief Education Officer McDade, Chief Operating Officer Rivera, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to present the proposed FY21 capital plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks to the process with that began in January, the proposed FY21 capital plan provides necessary investment rooted in the district's commitment to equity and continues to ensure our students have a warm, safe, and dry environment in which to learn. Next slide, please. Working closely with our chief financial officer, we identified a capital budget of $650 million. Of that $650 million, $213 million were already committed to multi-year investments. Phase three in our efforts to bring universal pre-K to all four-year-olds in Chicago. The third and final year of the high school science lab initiative, which ensures every CPS high school is equipped with a state-of-the-art science lab. Continued capital support for programmatic initiatives, inclusive of schools selected by the RFP as supported by the data of the district's annual regional, regional analysis and our multi-year investment in school technology modernization program. $440 million remained to be invested. The district faces $3.4 billion of deferred maintenance needs. $1.8 billion of that is deemed critical. As with previous fiscal years, our capital needs far exceeded our capital resources. Thus, we need to prioritize projects that are critical in keeping our students safe, projects that continue to invest in communities that represent our student body and that have not seen investment previously. We began this prioritization process in January with the school building conditions and the Mayor's Invest Southwest initiative. With Dr. Sweeney and his team, we set out to create an equity index that would prioritize necessary capital projects in areas of our communities that had not seen previous investment. We also embarked on community conversations to in inform our stakeholders of our capital needs, the capital planning process, and to engage in authentic dialogue about what our stakeholders wanted to see prioritized in the FY21 capital plan. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maurice Sweeney, our Chief Equity Officer, to discuss the community engagement and the equity index. Hello, everyone. Good evening or good afternoon to all of you. Um, thank you, Lindy, for setting terms and just um, gearing us up for what has been, honestly, a really enjoyable process for me in the Equity Office. Um, on the screen, you can see the list of um, organizations and schools who are involved in a community engagement process. This work actually stems back, like Lindy said, to the school uh, funding working groups where people said they wanted to engage and talk more about the capital budget. And so there were two critical areas. One, which is around how do we prioritize need? Uh, how do we think about funding in that way? And then also, um, what should we use to help to prioritize that need? And I wanna give a special thank you to um, Kids First, Natalie, um, who really helped us with the presentation that we use in those capital engagement sessions. And then in between time, we also had the ARA sessions for um, the annual regional analysis to give more people an opportunity to weigh in on programs in their community. And then following up with our um, last um, capital hearing session. So thank you to everyone who participated. Um, as a result, you can skip um, the next slide. That's just a reminder of where we were and who we talked to. 
But this is the really important part here. Um, what were the critical factors that we used to determine um, the equity index? And I will say that the Office of Equity was involved last year in helping to determine um, how do we spend the money? How do we use it effectively? And so what we asked from the community during this time was what are the important factors that we should consider when talking and thinking about equity? Um, we consulted with the Kerwin Institute. That was um, some advice given to me by um, Candace Moore, Chief Equity Officer for the City of Chicago, because they're known for building equity and opportunity indexes across the country. So we talked to them, we came up with a list of factors we got in front of community, and we asked them to prioritize um, which of all the factors that they saw would be most important. And so here are the three areas and some percentages that were um, determined for each one. You can see capital investment, like where did we spend money the last 10 years? Demographics, thinking about race, students with limited English proficiency, our diverse learners and uh, low-income families are students who are um, in economically disadvantaged situations. Demographics are important. I think everyone knows that our district is over 85% black and brown. And then finally, the community index factors, which take into community hardship, um, thinking about compound investments or for where the mayor is investing in Invest Southwest. Also life expectancy. Um, this came up actually as one where we were really thinking about um, you know, Chicago has a history of segregation. And so if we want to make sure that people are living long lives, how do we consider that as a part of the investment strategy? And last, um, students experiencing homelessness. And I just want to thank all the family and communities who made sure that this was a part of the equity indices um, that we're using, partly because people were responding to the needs of our young people and their families as people are impacted by COVID. Um, that was one that was not originally on the list. Um, it was among a list of factors, but through community input that was raised. And we also recognize that students who are most impacted also fit in the demographic areas. So with all of that, this is what happened. Um, we took the facilities needs, we took the equity index, we added them together to create a prioritized list of pro uh, projects for us as a district. And this is important for two reasons. One. We do know that older buildings have critical needs, but we also recognize um, certain communities have been historically underserved and we need to make sure that we have a strong balance in where we're investing within our city. And so the equity index um, and the community or the facilities needs index created that prioritized list that we came up with. And I'm um, pretty excited about it. Um, if anyone has any additional feedback, we wanna make sure that every time we come back in front of you um, as a board, we wanna make sure that we're improving the process. So. Thanks in advance. And if you have any questions, I guess I will answer those when Lindy's done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sweeney. We have been so fortunate to work in tandem with you and the Office of Equity team in crafting this proposed FY21 capital plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. Members of the board, you will note the proposed FY21 capital plan includes a proposed annex to relieve the overcrowding at Saganash Elementary. Working in close concert with the portfolio office, we have been monitoring Saganash over the past few years to confirm the, the projected growth trajectory. The growth projections have come to fruition at Saganash. 99% of those enrolled in Saganash live in the, ten in the attendance boundary and the building is currently 123% utilized. The school population is projected to grow by 20 to 30 students this upcoming year and will continue beyond school year 2021. Saganash added 28, approximately 28 students per year the last three years and in 2019 saw the largest increase in a decade. The anticipated utilization rate for Saganash two years from now is over 130%. The recommendation for new construction is not made lightly, as it is always the option of last resort. I am happy to explain the process by which this recommendation was made. When a school is determined to be overcrowded, the capital team with the network office and the office of portfolio first seek to identify solutions within our existing portfolio. Are there spaces in the building that can be repurposed to accommodate classrooms? If not, are, those, are there schools nearby with space that can be utilized or neighboring schools with available space that are equally or higher performing? In the case of Saganash, all existing spaces in the building are used and all neighboring schools are efficient or overcrowded and unable to accommodate the projected growth. 
The next potential solution is to identify nearby lease space. Four different locations were reviewed, but did not meet the space needs for Saugan Ash. Having exhausted solutions within our existing footprint and potential lease spaces, we are recommending the construction of an annex to relieve the existing and projected growth at Saugan Ash. At this time, I would like to invite Chief McDade to share more details on how we will continue to address overcrowding through the lens of equity. Thank you, Lindy. I wanted to share just a little bit more uh, context uh, for the board as we think about how we ensure equity as it relates to capital. In the spring of 2019, we launched an annual board uh, policy review. And the purpose of the annual review uh, process is to facilitate regular review and revision of board policies to ensure that we're compliant with both state and federal statutes and that we're aligned with our district's uh, mission and vision. The review process intentionally includes an ex explicit equity step which asks policy owners to consider equity implications of their policies, both as written, meaning does the policy have a fair positive impact on our greatest needs groups and as implemented, such as could the policy contribute to an inequity in resource allocation to our greatest needs groups within or between schools. Related to the steps that Lindy outlined to mitigate overcrowding, it's important to note that our board policy on controlled enrollment will be up for review and presented to the board for amendment in late winter, early spring, around February, March of this school year. And this is another way for the district to make equitable decisions in addressing overcrowding and capital needs. Thank you, Lindy, for allowing me to share uh, this additional information. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Chief McDade. Next slide, please. The next slide illustrates the historical capital spend by priorities outlined in the Educational Facilities Master Plan. From the community engagement Dr. Sweeney discussed earlier, we, are, we were able to incorporate the feedback from our stakeholders and increase the percentage of dollars allocated to the facility needs category from 44% to 52% of the proposed capital budget. I will now turn it over to our Executive Director of Capital Planning and Construction, Ivan Hansen to discuss the plan in greater detail. Thank you, Lindy. Next slide, please. Uh, our FY21 capital budget includes $758 million of capital investments that will focus on primary facility needs at neighborhood schools, full day pre-K expansions, ADA accessibility, and the continued expansion of technology upgrades modern science labs, and other academic priorities. To support our schools throughout the city, this plan provides funding in six main areas, critical facility need, interior improvements, programmatic investments, overcrowding relief, site improvements, and IT and security upgrades. As you know, our facility portfolio includes 522 campuses and 798 buildings. Our average facility is over 80 years old, and the total CPS facility need is over $3 billion. Since FY16, CPS has invested in over $2.1 billion in the capital improvements across the district. These projects included major renovations to ensure our schools stayed warm, safe, and dry, facility construction to relieve overcrowding, security cameras to provide a safer environment for our children, and renovations to aid programmatic investments, among others. Additionally, CPS is investing $100 million over the next five years to ensure all CPS campuses are more accessible. The FY21 capital budget is funded by bond proceeds backed by evidence-based funding, potential state capital funding, and potential outside resources as they become identified. Next slide, please. I will now take a deeper dive into specific budget categories. The facility needs group. The FY21 capital budget includes over 314 million to address critical facility needs. The first subcategory in this section is the exterior envelope repairs, which include roofs, windows, and exterior mason repairs. All these items directly affect our ability to provide warm, safe, and dry facilities to our students, staff, and communities. There are over 20 projects proposed in this category in this year's budget. The mechanical projects focus on core mechanical systems, essential heating and cooling, associated electrical and plumbing infrastructure to improve the indoor thermal environment in our buildings. This budget includes 
This budget area includes seven proposed mechanical projects. Projects in both these categories also include repairs to the interior finishes that may have been damaged as a result of the deficiencies in these two categories. The emergency unanticipated facility repair category is to address emergency situations like fire, floods, and freezing. And the unforeseen facility repairs like those result in rain or windstorms like we've all recently experienced. Also included in this category are programs to repair or replace obsolete critical building systems like fire alarm systems, chimney stack stabilizations, critical masonry remediation, and building automation system repairs and replacements. As we discussed during our community engagement meetings, this budget also includes $20 million for our ADA program that will continue for years to come. This plan will update the accessibility at schools to be both first floor usable and usable. This, in addition to the accessibility work already performed at new construction, the annexes, classroom modulars, student accommodation projects, board of election improvements, and critical repairs for vertical transportation equipment. The interior improvement category includes 9 million for restroom modernizations that Dr. Jackson mentioned earlier. This is a new category added as a result of the feedback collected during our capital community engagement process earlier this year. Projects in this category are prior prioritized based on our equity index and need. Over the next five years, CPS is committed to renovating at least one male and female and staff restroom in all district elementary schools. On the program, the programmatic investments ensures that every student in Chicago has access to a high quality education in a 21st century learning environment and also helps to ensure our students receive the well-rounded education they need. This budget proposed investing over $200 million in modernizing classrooms throughout the city. These funds are focused on the following areas. The universal pre-K classrooms will move the district closer to our goal of providing free full day pre-K. This category includes $100 million to develop new pre-K classrooms throughout the city. This is phase three of the UPK expansion. While phases one and two focus on interior renovations, phase three will primarily focus on lease spaces. The science lab modernization ensures all CPS high schools have modern science labs. This year is the final year of the district's initiatives and includes the final 31 high schools. The programmatic initiatives include space for new high quality academic programs. Like earlier this year when CPS announced that 22 schools would receive new high quality academic programs as part of the district's annual program. In this program, schools communities apply for new high quality programs, including IB, STEM, and dual language. The FY21 budget also includes a $50 million investment for a new state-of-the-art athletic facility to serve students in the south and near south areas. We're still finalizing a location for the facility and we'll work with the community to identify programmatic and sports offerings. This is one of two new constructions in the proposed plan. Next slide, please. The overcrowded relief group is unlike prior years where significant portions of the available capital funding was devoted to new construction, the majority of available dollars in FY21 is being allocated to modernizing and repairing existing facilities. However, some buildings within the district cannot efficiently serve their, their currently enrolled or projected enrolled population due to limited space and require a leaf by the way of new capacity or expansion. In FY21, the district is proposing one expansion project as Lindy previously explored. The IT and security uh, infrastructure is, helps as the district works to provide devices and home internet access to support remote learning. We are also continuing our multi-year investment to modernizing school technology and strengthen high-speed internet throughout the city. As part of this plan, we are allocating $35 million to promote equity by increasing the student to device ratio at the district's highest need schools and improving network infrastructure across the district. In addition, 2 million will be allocated for security investments and upgrades. Next slide, please. In this proposed budget, CPS invests over 22 million in site improvements to develop new playgrounds, play lots, and turf fields at over 25 schools across the district. These investments also leverage external funding and partnerships with the Department of Water Management and MRD, MWRD to help ensure students can benefit from a well-rounded education that promotes healthy and active development while also providing a resource for the surrounding communities. This category also includes site upgrades such as parking lots, turf fields. 
Parking lots was another area prioritized by many during the community engagement sessions. Critical upgrades in this area will be addressed based on the, upon our updated facility assessment reports. The capital service project service support includes 26 million for support services necessary to, to implement a capital program as well as support facilities projects. This includes management, planning, design, facility assessments, cost estimating, and more. All of this is needed to successfully implement a capital plan of this size. In addition to the proposed 653 million, the FY21 budget includes an additional 105 million in potential outside funding. The 105 million includes a 50 million allocation from the state of Illinois to plan and design a new high school for the near South community. Also included is 55 million from sources like TIF, Aldermanic Menu and Grants. As I stated earlier, our deferred need is great and we do not have the resources to cure them all, but this, this budget will touch over 250 schools and over 91,000 students. Thank you and I'd like to turn it back to Dr. Sweeney. Thank you everyone. Um, so the last time we were all together, I showed a map of um, where programs are and what we wanted to do with this one is just do an overlay of the UIC Economic Hardship Index that shows us essentially the darker the red, the more the disparity. And so you can see where all of the programs, um, all of the investments are laid out over the city. So if you have any questions about those, I can respond to them, but you can see um, the, the, uh, quite a few of the investments uh, that we are making within the district are in the spaces um, that have been historically underserved. All right, next slide. Thank you, that concludes uh, the update on the proposed FY21 capital plan. Thank you, questions, uh, comments from board members? Any questions at this time? Or if not, Dr. Jackson will proceed to the next presentation. I just, sorry. You have a question? Yes, oh, uh, Elizabeth sorry. has a question. Yes, I just wanted to make a quick, it's more of a comment than a question, but I just wanted to say that I really appreciate um, the work in particular that went into the equity index. Um, and also I think what you can see is the overwhelming focus in this plan on the modern, on modernizing, um, on repairs, on deferred facility needs, which we know are you know, so many um, and maintenance projects and that as the map shows, right, that this is happening in communities across the city and using this equity index to try to prioritize those that have not been invested in or have been historically disinvested in. Um, so thank you for that in terms of the overall plan. I do think, and I'm, you know, I'm sure this is part of why the presentation went as it was, um, that the Saganash project does stand out in this respect. Um, I think just as a board member reviewing this, it was sort of difficult to get my head around. You know, the school had an annex just eight years ago. Um, there are schools nearby that are experiencing declining enrollment. So what is the reason why an annex is necessary? And I just think, because I've heard, I'm receiving the emails, I've heard the comments, and I just want to say, and I, I think I speak for everyone here, but no one is okay with overcrowding, right? No one is thinking that it is okay to have this many children in a classroom, to have the safety concerns that that, that, that provides. I think the real question um, before us was about remedies. And I think that part of what I'm, I'm hearing is being addressed, and I'm very happy about that, is um, the need for an expanded set of remedies um, for these circumstances. And also that, you know, we can't keep jam, folks can't keep jamming themselves into an attendance area and expect annex after annex as the solution to the problem. Um, I was on a webinar with former Secretary of Education John King recently, and he was talking about communities of opportunity hoarding. And I think that we need more flexible tools to disrupt institutional inequities that show up. Um, and so you know, our tools in this case, for example, were limited by the fact that we couldn't really move attendance boundaries because of SB 630. And SB 630 is an important law, right? It's this policy that says that we can't move students to a lower performing school as part of a school action. I think that's important, but I think it's also perhaps time to talk with our legislators about some of the unintended consequences of what tools that are available to us because of that in situations like this. Um, and then also just the broader need to expand our tools. And so I was really happy to hear Chief McDade um, talking about the fact that a controlled enrollment policy is going to be coming up before the board 
in time for community input, of course, for a policy and policy revision and back and forth, um, but that that will be able to happen prior to the next time that we go around this cycle. Um, and so thank you very much for you know, prioritizing that and adding to the set of tools that we have at our disposal moving forward to try to address these kinds of circumstances. Thank you, member Todd Breland. Uh, any other comments or questions before we move on to the next presentation? Yes, yes. I have a comment. Yes, member yes. Melinda. Uh, I also wanted to um, show appreciation for the announcement that Chief McDade made regarding, you know, moving forward in finding more creative uh, solutions to the issue. I personally am one of the board members that have been, um, let's say, troubled uh, about this decision for Saganash, not because I think that this, this community and these children don't deserve to be in the best learning and the safest learning environment um, that CPS can offer. But um, I've, I've had questions and issues that have kept me up at night, as a matter of fact, um, thinking about how do we best um, invest the, the, the limited dollars that we unfortunately have as a district in regards to, to overcrowding. And, and I have also been concerned by the potential budgetary um, um, limitations, uh, increased limitations that we may be uh, facing in, in, in the next five years, four years, one year. Uh, and, and of course, the, the fact that in 2008, there was an annex that was made to Saganash. So although I, am, I absolutely recognize and acknowledge the right, the, not only the need, the right that the Saganash community, its parents, its teachers, um, and to particular students have of a, of a um, having a, a safe and not overcrowded environment. I just want to acknowledge that this has been a hard one for me, one that I have a struggle um, with, uh, and and I appreciate all the time, all the individuals and um, and the management that met with me and answered questions uh, and uh, really, really worked very hard to provide um, answers to, to some of the, the uncertainties that I had. Thank you, Member Melendez. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. President yes, oh, sorry. Member Rome and then uh, Vice President Rivalor. Thank you, President Devay. Um, I want to build a little bit on, on comments from uh, Louisiana and also Elizabeth and just share that <clears throat> my reflections about overcrowding, um, I have grown to be sympathetic for sure. I don't think anybody wants to have kids in overcrowded spaces um, and certainly don't want safety concerns, but have really um, grown to understand with the help and support from the capital team um, and Dr. Sweeney and other folks who have really worked hard on this. Um, to understand that there were no other options here and that the tools were really limited um, for Saganash. So really understand where we are. But in thinking about moving forward, also really excited that um, Chief McDade agreed to review the policy for um, closed enrollment and, and other tools to really build out a toolkit. In particular, as a, as a white person, I'm reflecting on how issues like overcrowding play out in more in wider and more affluent communities and feel like it's our job um, to really reflect and was, was um, moved by a recent New York Times podcast called Nice White Parents um, that refers to uh, white people in these kinds of situations really needing um, to respond to the call to action to be not just concerned customers and advocates for our own children, but to be outraged citizens about equity um, and inequities in our city. And so really feel like there's a call to action here to be generators of and collaborators in spaces to really learn about our system as a whole and to be a more equitable system of schools. So this is not a critique or a push for our capital team and our equity office who really modeled some great collaboration here to consider equity and apply an equity lens, but to communities who will really have an opportunity as we move forward to, um, to consider policy revisions. 
And so I think it's important to recognize the different experiences of students. And while art and music on a cart um, certainly you know, is, is not ideal, um, I think to really look at the experience of historically disinvested um, communities and that there are even more dire choices um, in terms of even being able sometimes to afford any specialist programming or, or just one that they will pick. Um, so when we move to a community for school and demand those resources for that school is the only option to participate in the system, it perpetuates what Dr. Todd Breland just referred to as opportunity hoarding. Um, and we must be open and willing to solutions that may involve sacrifice and broaden our own willingness to participate in improving all schools. And I look forward to the community engagement in relation to board policies that will expand the district district's options and tools in relationship to overcrowding. Thank you. Uh, Vice President River Lewis. Thanks, President Tove. I, I, I want to echo what um, <clears throat> Elizabeth, Luciana, and Amy just highlighted. I think it is important that we have more tools and also that we have more understanding of how these different pieces come together. And uh, on that note, I want to thank you for the engagement, both the, the sharing of the information and the process with community members and listening and showing us how you connected the dots from what you heard to making adjustments to the process. I feel like the process was far clearer, not just to me, but to members of the community who aren't board members um, this year than last year when we had the, the capital hearings. Um, and I feel like it was more transparent. Um, I have two questions. Um, they're both maybe at earlier stages of, um, rather than looking at specific projects, uh, or at overcrowding specifically, um, one is about the, the process and how it incorporates not just an evaluation of individual um, needs and projects, but how it connects with a portfolio strategy. So whether that's about accessibility, whether that's about capacity, uh, whether that's about a facility need, is there a role to consider what do other schools in the neighborhood or other schools with similar programs um, already um, offer or what their needs are? Or is it always going to be um, each site and each building kind of standing on its own when you're evaluating um, the relative priority of these different needs? And then after that, I'll ask my second. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and, and, and thank you, board members, for your, your comments and, and your encouragement. Um, uh, Vice President Revoluri, uh, again, a great question. Um, you know, I would certainly point to the district's efforts and commitment to the annual regional analysis um, that began under uh, Dr. Jackson's leadership. Um, that really, to your point about not focusing on one school, but, but the surrounding area and the surrounding community, um, that really has... Um, has, cha has challenged our focus. Um, and so uh, as you see with the programmatic uh, investments and the capital support for those, right? Those, those programs are going uh, to schools in areas based on what we learn from the annual regional analysis. And um, I know a lot was, has been uh, shared today. Um, certainly we see, uh, we certainly saw our capital engagement as the midpoint of the engagement that the district was doing this um, this winter and then again in the spring into the early summer. Uh, starting uh, with the budget uh, and the school uh, funding uh, uh, public engagement and then moving on to the capital engagement and then um, you know and then uh, mm -hmm. concluding with the annual regional analysis um, and, and the ARA uh, outreach. Um, so that is certainly a, a golden thread um, that I would like to lift up. Uh, certainly it, it has challenged our thinking and looking at our por portfolio um, and the programs offered in a holistic, uh, in a holistic way. Um, thank you. That, that's a great explanation of how those programmatic investments are being made with a portfolio and more of a neighborhood and even system-wide lens. I guess I'm wondering if that lens is also relevant to uh, the deferred needs that we've spent some time, you, you've spent time educating us yeah. on and that you've mentioned today. Yeah, certainly, thank you. Um, as we've stated, um, and you might be tired of me stressing this, um, 
$3.4 billion worth of deferred maintenance need, uh, 1.8 of that, uh, 1.8 billion of that is deemed critical. And I, as Dr. Sweeney had said earlier, we find this throughout the district and we don't have enough capital resources to meet our capital needs, especially when it comes to, as you referenced, um, those facility needs category. 80% of our, of our critical needs fall within that facility needs category. And so we were very thrilled uh, to receive the feedback from our engagement sessions to say, hey, CBS, you should be prioritizing your funds there. Um, so you saw that increase from 44 to 52% of the uh, proposed capital budget. But with that said, um, there is more than enough need to go around. And what we have, what we have tried to do um, and, and successfully uh, this year uh, with Dr. Sweeney and his team is to how do we prioritize that need? It's so great. We could, we could spend we could, you know, if in a perfect world, um, in a perfect world, we would have enough dollars to meet the need. Um, so we really look toward our partnership with the portfolio office and with the Office of Equity to ensure that those in, those investments in our infrastructure, while needed across the district, go to students that represent our student body and go to areas in which have not seen previous investment. Um, and so that is a way of us looking holistically at, at the district at large. Um, and um, and we, remain, we remain committing to building on the success that we have had this year. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, Member Revolori, did, did you have a follow-up question? Or I, I do, comment? if that's okay, Dwayne. Yes, yes, and then we'll go to Member Trust. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the second question is really, if you could unpack a little more, um, you mentioned that with the CFO's office, you determined the overall amount of the capital budget. I know in prior years, um, the amount has been highly variable, going from roughly 100 million a year to 800 million a year, and then back and back. Um, looking forward from this year, I think the plan is for a very steady or flat um, annual allocation. Um, so I guess the, the question is, how did we figure out the amount? Why did it vary so much before? Why is it not anticipated to vary in the future? Are there any risks to that longer term or, or years, out years plan? Certainly, um, I'm happy uh, to make a brief statement and then uh, defer to our CFO uh, and her expertise. Um, in terms of uh, the varying levels of previous capital um, uh, plans in previous years. As you know, um, just a few short years ago before uh, the state came in to um, assist uh, the, the board um, and uh, CPS, uh, we were not in great fiscal shape. And so you certainly see that reflected in uh, the difference, uh, the, different, the different amounts of our capital budget throughout the last six years. Um, so we really uh, credit that, that support and, and that fair support um, that we had received from Springfield to, to um, at least get us on better fiscal health. I'm happy to turn it over uh, to our CFO for greater detail. Uh, good afternoon. Um, for this year, President Re Revoluri, we work very close with the capital construction group, our treasury group. And one of the things that we did is go back to all our capital programs mm -hmm. and, and evaluate what are the things that were pending and what were the things that we needed to do. And out of that process, we developed a cash flow that is really informing what do we need to have cash on hand for the next year. Mm -hmm. So that's been a very good tool that helping us because we, as you know, if we go to the market, it's at a 5%, but if we then save that money, we pay a 1%. So we wanted to make sure that we total what is the money that is needed for the next year. And then what are the projects that are in the pipeline or are going to enter the pipeline? And, and then we will program to have that capital allocation ready for our capital group to do the work that they need to do. And do you foresee um, risks to the, the current plan for coming years, whether that's in the, the borrowing market or on the revenue side, or do you feel pretty comfortable with the projected um, roughly uh, level amounts for a capital investment in the next several years? 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling, I, I am comfortable right now, President Ropoluri, that's the reason, one of the reasons is that we have waited, the market is still um, a little, it, it's functioning, but as you know, CPS ratings are junk funds rating. Uh, so, and the state of Illinois pay a penalty for, the, for where they are too. Uh, so we've been waiting. We've been very cautious with our money. We have part of the process that we went through is to make sure that we use all the outstanding money that we have on hand right now before we go to the market. So our, our timing right now is to go to the board sometime in October for the resolution to go to the market sometime in, no, in November. And we think that that will be a good time for the CPS to go to the market. Um, and, and we feel that it's a good time and talking to our financial advisors, we, we think that we will be able to get uh, the amount of money that we we'll require for the projects that are on the pipeline. Thank you. Right. Member Truss. Uh, good afternoon again. Thank you team for the, the hard work, all of you when it kind of came down to um, preparing the, both the budgeting uh, operating budget and capital budget. I want to uh, piggyback on what uh, Member Todd Breland talked about in reference to shared sacrifice and the fact that, yes, SB 630 has to be revisited because SB 630, and in, in, in you heard me use references to sins of the past, and, and now, I, and I always said at the same time, we need to also focus on moving forward, but we, we can't ignore the fact when we're talking about capital and, and what we're going to do in terms of a por portfolio strategy, because there needs to be a, a strategy, not just, you know, when we have these issues like with Saga Nash come up, it has to be an intentional strategy because I'm not going to sugarcoat the fact that that you have schools on the west and south side of Chicago, for instance, that, you know, per CPS policy, they're underutilized. But by the same token, there has been some additional schools constructed in neighborhoods in which schools were closed. And, 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 you know, and there's different set of rules. So like some schools have open enrollment and going to be aggressive with their recruiting and some schools are restricted by boundaries. And they're not going to get that. They, they may not get the scale of students budget wise to say, well, we need this type of investment. We need that type of investment. So, it, you know, we, we do have to, you know, also keep in mind with, you know, construction portfolio is all interconnected as far as I'm concerned. Um, and another question, like for instance, we have in the budget, you know, thank you, uh, State Representative Ma, uh, for uh, 50 million for, you know, New Chinatown High School. So the question is, what's going to be the impact on, let's say, like Tilden? I think that's the current neighborhood school in the area. And that, you know, that, that, that look, look and long term planning, that has to be part of the conversation versus, okay, there's the $50 million for a Chinatown High School. What's, that, what's the impact on the surrounding schools from a strategic strategy planning point of view? And, and lastly, when it comes down to the capital budget, um, you know, there were some more detailed items that, you know, should have been brought to like my attention and some of the other board members' attention that, you know, we got kind of late. And, um, and, 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 and I, I commend my colleagues also for, let's say, bringing up some of those issues because we, we shouldn't, let's say, take a budget and say we're going to vote it up or down if there's some questions and concerns about some of the different items in there. And, and, and we should look forward to look towards next year to maybe with the capital budget do a little, if there's some concerns that we adopt a policy that we would vote on those particular pieces separately versus an all or nothing kind of approach when it comes to the budget. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Any response to... Uh... Member Trusts. Yeah, let me weigh in here. You know, I, I, I certainly want to thank all the board members, you know, uh, for their for really pushing us in regard to this process. I think, you know, from the get go, um, the process, uh, you know, certainly prioritizing engagement, working really closely with Dr. Swinney and really putting a, a prioritization around equity, uh, you know, really made this uh, a much stronger plan than in the 16 years that I've been here. And, and I think, uh, you know, we, you know, we as a management team feel very, um, you know, encouraged by the progress that we've made. Uh, with that being said, we know it's, it's progress, it's not an end goal. 
and certainly, you know, the focus on engagement and, uh, you know, even starting the engagement process earlier is a focus as we head next year. Uh, certainly, we encountered uh, an environment where we were solely focused or, or, or so, solely fo forced uh, to engage uh, electronically given the pandemic. That's one of those things that, you know, if we continue in this environment as we head into the fall or early next year, we really need to get even more creative uh, and figure out uh, alternative ways to engage with the public um, to ensure that we're, we're not just meeting some of the communities um, and getting their input, but also uh, making sure that we're, we're casting a wider net on this. Uh, certainly in regards to visibility and transparency around uh, the prioritization, how we get, how we start, how we end, certainly uh, have areas of improvement on that. Uh, and then certainly lastly, you know, making sure that we're connecting this work uh, to our overall portfolio strategy. Um, you know, I, I think we've made a lot of strides as we head into uh, this upcoming year, but those are certain areas uh, that we know that, um, you know, are still areas of improvement. Uh, and we're excited to start uh, the, the, the FY22 process uh, as soon as we can. President Talbot, I just wanted to make one quick comment. Um, yes. I, I think folks across sectors um, have seen uh, that we can adapt uh, some some eat more easily some less so to having to work remotely and virtually whether that's bringing people together or getting their input or making decisions or sharing information um, our, our teachers will certainly be doing that uh, very soon um, i would just call on us to as people in other sectors have done to think about not just what we're forced to do right now because we don't have an alternative, but what other options have we been accelerated into that we may not have considered or felt we were not ready for before. So if it's a question of what um, you know, over and under enrollment looks like across the district or um, the distribution of students or classes or teachers, there, there are things that uh, by necessity both educators and students and families um, have what will have experienced in the spring and in this coming year. And those might give us more options about how to move forward that we were not ready for before. Honestly, we didn't think about before. And so I would just put that on the table as something to consider. Um, it's especially pertinent to me for the capital conversation because the capital investments by their nature are very long-term and immovable. And um, we can't necessarily adapt to the, the changes that happen in our city or the changes that happen in the curriculum. Um, you know, what's taught in, in these school buildings that were built 80 years ago has changed and it should because our students need to know and understand and be able to do different things to succeed in today's world than they did before World War II. Um, and I think this is also an opportunity as we um, are trying to be nimble and handle the uncertainty of the current moment that we also try to leverage what we can to, to learn and adapt for the future as well. Any other comments or questions? Yes, from the board? Uh, yes uh, Member Sotelo. Yes, thank you. So uh, thank you for, for everyone's uh, input and, and uh, Lindy and, and uh, Dr. Sweeney, thank you for all the all the work that you have done to answer all our questions. Uh, and as, 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 as Duane mentioned, uh, we all have a very inquisitive mind. There's a lot of things that we uh, are inquiring uh, a lot of information about. Uh, certainly the Saga Nash School was, was one of them. But I wanna bring back both budgets, right? I wanna bring both the operating budget and the capital budget, right? So uh, 8.4, uh, 8 Four billion dollars is a lot of money, and I actually want to commend the team in the thoughtful process they have taken to also include uh, actually putting into action a lot of the things that we were talking about uh, in terms of equity, in terms of the equity grants, in terms of uh, putting in the uh, investments that we committed to in more social workers, in more counselors. Uh, and more nurses. Uh, and these were commitments were made early on so that we can start to plan, right? 
Uh, I know that I've questioned a lot, Dr. Sweeney, and he's probably going to get tired of a lot of the questions, but I want to know the fundamentals of that equity index. I want to ensure that we understand uh, that it truly is not creating any adverse uh, actions and that really is driving equity in all the communities that need it. Uh, and that applies to both operating and capital. Uh, and, and Sandal brings up a good point that we, we the current environment certainly is pushing us to rethink that model. Uh, but we also need to be careful about how do we think about that model because we still don't see quality in that model, right? And it's going to be a long time before we see quality in that model. So I want to make sure that that we look at it, but I also want to make sure that we are thinking about the communities and how they feel and how they work within that. Uh, I do want to make sure that when we look at this, we do take a portfolio approach community by community. I love what Duane said, right? We need a coherent strategy that ring fences all of these uh, investments that we're making on both the operating side as well as the capital side, community by community to ensure that quality education happens at each zip code. I know we've said it and it sounds great uh, for the headlines, but we're making progress towards it, right? And we wanna make sure that it actually happens in each community, that it happens in Little Village, that, group, that happens in, in Longdale, that happens on the west side, it happens on the south side, and it happens on the north side as well, right? And so I think uh, as we go forward uh, in these investments, a coherent portfolio strategy that looks at both the operating side as well as the capital side is something that we need to continue to see and push for, and it cannot be just one community. It cannot be just one community doing uh, another pilot. I wanna make sure that we have that kind of engagement in each community where we have line of sight to quality education and quality programming and quality options in each single one of those communities and not just another large investment to open an large, large, another large school for yet another community, right? I won't name anyone, but I wanna make sure that we have that line of sight to each community. So quality options are inherent in each community physically, not just virtually. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jackson, we'll proceed. Thank you for that. Um, at this time, we're gonna transition to our- Can you turn your video on? Okay, can you give me one second? Sorry about that. We're going to transition to a presentation from Jadine Chow on the reforms to our SRO program. Jadine. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jadine Chow. I'm the Chief of Safety and Security. And this afternoon, I'm here to present information and update on the CPS School Resource Officer Program. Um, just a refresher, school resource officers are also known as SROs, and that's what we'll be referring to during the course of this presentation. They are the full-time uniform CBD officers that are assigned to work in a select set of our CPS high schools in the district. Um, before we go into the presentation, I just wanna start by reiterating uh, what Dr. Jackson said earlier. We wanna thank all of our stakeholders in this very important process. Um, we especially wanna thank our students, parents, teachers, principals, and local school councils who have been so dedicated to sharing their perspectives, engaging in this process. We know that this has been a very complex and difficult experience, and we really appreciate all of your hard work. Um, the, the, the district's commitment to provide safe and supportive schools is based on a comprehensive safety strategy that incorporates strategies, including social emotional supports with a strong emphasis on restorative practices. My team's partnership with the Office of Social Emotional Learning supports schools in implementing strategies to ensure that all of our students feel safe and welcome. And throughout this, we are committed to continuing to do that. Uh, two months ago at the June 2020 board meeting, we presented program updates on the process that each local school council that had the program 
would um, use to assess whether their school would remain in the SRO program. Today, these are the items that I'm going to review since we last spoke. Uh, we'll go over the local school council vote results, um, discuss some of the improvements that have been made to the intergovernmental agreement as a result of feedback that we've received, go over new arrest data that we have received from Chicago Police Department to show the progress that the district has made. Um, would like to uh, review upcoming partnerships that we propose will help strengthen the program even further. And I'll close with additional commitments. Next page. So throughout the summer, um, if you recall, we asked local school councils that had the program to make the decision on whether they wanted their school to maintain the program. Um, over the past couple months, we used multiple layers of engagement to collect input and feedback on where school communities stood on the program. We conducted listening sessions with various stakeholder groups, including student groups, parent groups, and other community-based organizations. We conducted a survey to collect input from students, parents, staff members, LSCs, and administrators. School-specific results were sent to principals along with discipline data to help LSCs in the process. A summary report was then also issued um, at a district level to show the results, but also um, show the school by school data. We created and shared an LSC toolkit that included the process and shared samples of research as a starting point that would support LSCs in conducting robust engagement sessions with their individual school communities. Um, in addition, I just wanna add that many schools did also conduct their own follow-up with their own listening sessions. And many schools also followed up with their own surveys specifically for students in order to do a deeper dive on what was happening. And so these are the results. Um, we've seen 55 schools have opted to maintain the SRO program and 17 schools have opted to remove their program. For all of the schools who have opted to remove their program, we've already begun to work with those schools to create updated safety plans. And we're gonna work with all of the schools to make sure that all of our uh, plans are optimal, especially in light of where we stand um, with our return to school this fall. Want to just reiterate that any local school council uh, can revisit their decision to remove SROs at any time during this coming year. Next page. So one of the most important pieces of feedback that we've had um, was that we really needed to strengthen the intergovernmental agreement on the SRO program. So these are the key areas that we'll be discussing and I'll go through each one, one by one. Next page. We'll start with the eligibility and selection criteria. Um, in the past, um, we've had basic um, disciplinary history in the IGA through feedback that we've received through best practices from experts around the country. We've heard that we should be looking at excellent disciplinary history. So I'm not gonna read through each and every one of these, but the net result is that we are looking at SROs to be vetted through all of these uh, different criteria in advance of their consideration as uh, SRO in one of our schools. All of the SROs will be vetted through the Chief of Bureau of Operations and ensure that um, they are providing us with a written attestation that they have met these criteria. That includes new candidates as well as incumbents. In addition, consistent with last year's IGA, principals will have the opportunity to interview new candidates or interview their current candidates if they wish to change out their SROs. Next slide. An important new um, item is prohibiting the use of the criminal enterprise information system, which also has previously been known as a gang database. Um, let me start by saying it was never the intention or the mission of the presence of SROs to submit into or access any sort of gang database. And yet this new item formally prohibits SROs from doing that. It's important to note that this is something that we heard loud and clear in our feedback sessions and from our board members. And in addition to ensure that this is in place, all CPD terminals will be removed from CPS schools so that SROs will no longer be able to access this information. Next page. 
We've also formalized the complaint process. We had announced this last year, but now it's formally going into the intergovernmental agreement. Going forward, all complaints on our SROs will be directed to COPA, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability. In doing so, this will allow for centralized tracking to allow CPD to report back to us on when they've received uh, any complaints and also give us status on the handling of the investigations. Um, information on the complaints will be shared during our regular uh, CPS CPD meetings. Next slide. Some additional changes that we have planned in the is, as a result of the, the new IGA is we're going to be really strengthening the training. In addition to the 40 hours of baseline school resource officer training, we are supplementing the training based on feedback that we've heard. Uh, topics such as cultural sensitivity and implicit racial bias, LGBTQ awareness and associated policies, uh, Office of Dis Diverse Learners uh, Support and Services Awareness and CPS policies, additional de-escalation protocols based on youth development, um, and additional restorative justice uh, training, as well as training on our code of conduct, as well as this IGA. We have added explicit language around protection related to immigration concerns, particularly on ensuring that SROs are adhering to the city's welcoming city and welcoming schools ordinances that protect our students from discrimination and allow our undocumented students to feel safe and protected in our schools. Um, CPD will also immediately notify CPS of any incidents involving an SRO's use of force in connection with his or her duties. They're required to let us know that immediately. And as stated in previous announcements, we will see uh, significant savings and reductions of costs based on billings for only those days where schools are in session. Uh, this coming year, we're also going to see savings based on the removal of costs associated with our mobile patrols. All in all, the new IGA will uh, be at a level of approximately $12 million for the coming, coming school year, which is a reduction in our budget by over 50%. Next slide. Um, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about how we're going to monitor this. Um, we've gotten feedback that this is something that the board wants to hear about more frequently. And in order to do that, we're going to be meeting with CPD every two weeks to go over um, the adherence to the IGA and make sure that we are incorporating the require or we're implementing the requirements that we set forth. Um, in addition, we're going to be meeting with the independent monitor who is overseeing the Chicago Police Department consent decree every single month to review the key performance indicators that are required as a part of the consent decree. And then we will report back to the Board of Education on a quarterly basis to give updates on this information. I will say that before we leave this page, that in addition to this, we are working with principals to make sure that principals that have the SR program are giving regular updates to their local school councils as well. And we'll be conducting workshops with principals to discuss that format to improve consistency around the information that is shared. Next page. So I'm now gonna go over um, some new information around arrest data. I know that people have been asking for arrest data and we understand that this is an extremely important consideration in reviewing this program. And I want to start out by saying it is absolutely our ultimate goal to eradicate the school to prison pipeline. We believe that um, some of these steps will, ha will help. We've taken significant steps through our code of conduct, through training, um, but we acknowledge that there is much more progress needed. Um, the robust engagement and conversations about SROs has only further amplified the importance of this conversation. And we're committed to making sure that we will not rest until this gets to zero. Um, in addition, um, I'll talk about in a minute, we are going to be doing a partnership with the University of Chicago Education Labs that will help us better understand the root causes of what drives this pipeline within our district and what levers can be affected so that we can make progress towards our ultimate goal. So this is what the arrest data looks like. Next page. 
Over time, we have seen a steady reduction in student arrests at CPS schools. This data shows that starting in school year 11-12 through school year SY19, which was the most recent full year school year that we've had, um, because SY20, we um, closed early due to COVID, um, we can see that reduction. Um, next page. But the important part to note though, is that when we look at that breakdown by um, racial demographics, we can see as others have stated previously, and as we have known, that there is an unacceptable disparity among children of color, particularly African-American students. And so while we've seen the significant decline, you can see that they still make up a significant portion of the arrests that are taking place at our school. Next page. And this graph is just to show really a graphic of just that unacceptable level of racial disparity. Um, and so even though the absolute levels of arrests are declining, the percentage of arrests attributed to students of color remains persistent. And this is the work that we're going to be doing and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, when we talk about our partnerships in working with the Office of Equity and outside partners to understand what is going on, what we need to do to affect this, to make sure that this is mitigated and again, heading towards eradicating the school to prison pipeline. Next. And so let's go into those upcoming partnerships. So um, we're very excited to announce that um, we will be working with uh, the Center, of Ch Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's Hospital um, to really uh, take a whole school safety approach. So in working with, um, with them and the Chicago Police Department, um, Office of Social Emotional Learning, and the Office of Equity, we are looking to conduct brand new training that will include the fundamentals over the impact of exposure to trauma and violence on children, as well as what is necessary to support the adults in the building on de-escalation and linking students to needed supports um, before we take that uh, next step of enforcement. We do not want to, we have to say it this way, we want to avoid anything on enforcement and taking a trauma-informed lens in supporting our students. This is something that is new in bringing SROs together as part of the solution um, and keep in mind that we are, while we are prioritizing those schools that have SROs, this is something that we believe will be beneficial to all schools in the district um, because we want to make sure, again, that we are minimizing those unnecessary interactions and, again, looking at our supports for our children um, before a serious incident happens. The next partnership is um, we're looking forward to working with. Um, youth from the MICMA Challenge Youth Safety Advisory Council. We're looking to develop a training and measurement system that will help ensure that student voice is a part of everything we do to hold us accountable in making sure that the SRO program is not harming children and is supportive of the goals of the district. In looking at this monitoring system, we are talking about focus groups potentially additional surveys and other ways to capture student feedback. We're looking forward to tapping into student voice committees um, at schools across the city. Uh, I met with a student voice committee last evening and um, there is a lot to say on this topic and we wanna make sure that um, we are incorporating that feedback into our plans. And as I briefed a minute ago, the last uh, partnership I wanna announce is the University of Chicago Ed Labs. Um, the data is very complex, and when you look at um, the arrest data that sits with Chicago Police De Department and the student data that sits with Chicago Public Schools, we want to make sure that we are getting the right technical assistance that helps us to analyze these disparities and help us to understand what, by a year-by-year -year basis, what's going on at each school, whether there's a SRO present or not, um, People mention students with IEPs. These are all things that we want to be studying, um, and we will need their help to help us do that. Next page. And so finally, on our last page, um, the commitments that we are making on this program. 
And so, as I stated, we are working uh, with safety with schools that have opted to remove their SRO program. These meetings have begun. It is not a one meeting effort. Um, it's going to involve an all hands on deck. We are soliciting feedback from all members of the school and creating the safety plans because it does take the entire school community um, to understand what makes them feel safe so that we can make sure that we are incorporating the appropriate strategies. Um, we're gonna continue to measure the program effectiveness, including with some of the partnerships that I just mentioned, quarterly updates to the Board of Education, um, and most importantly, continued engagement with students and school communities on the future state vision of school safety at a local level. I think it's come up in a, a few times in comments um, from speakers, from our elected officials, and from our board members. Um, community by community, um, we want to discuss what works for them on a local level from this entire experience through the summer. I mean, we've heard different things from different schools, and it, it would appear that, you know, people, that each school moves at a different speed. Each school has a different perspective. And what we're trying to do is respect those perspectives and make sure that we're supporting schools based on their unique needs. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to the last page, which is thank you for your time. And um, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, President Dean. Uh, yes. Um, questions or comments? Uh, this is for Men Member Melendez. Member Melendez? I have, yes, I have a couple of, of uh, questions and uh, a couple of comments. Can I proceed? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So um, first of all, I want to really thank uh, my fellow board members, uh, Elizabeth Todd Breeland and Amy Rome for all the work, their effort, and for bringing this um, issue to um, everyone's attention. I also want, I want to particularly appreciate the work of Jadine Chow and um, our very many conversations around this issue have been invaluable to me. Uh, and of course, um, I want to also thank the, the individuals and uh, um, organizations that have sent, I imagine every board member, thousands and thousands of emails on, um, you know, advocating on both sides of this issue. I continue to believe that um, school safety and security does not demand the presence of police officers in, um, in schools. I think that, that, but I also acknowledge through all these complicated conversations that it is a, it, it's, it's not a, um, a, it's not gonna, it's not an issue that's gonna be resolved overnight. I welcome the changes to the IGA and the reduction in the budget and particularly congratulate uh, those 17 schools that have uh, chosen to move ahead with alternative safety and security plans. And I also want to comment um, on, uh, you know, something that has permeated through many conversations um, that uh, SROs, whether a school chooses to um, keep them or as a, a school board, we move forward forward to in the near future, just uh, not having at all inside schools, their role is not one of, dis of discipline. They're not disciplinary, that's not the job. That's the, the, the responsibility of um, administration, teachers, uh, uh, social workers, counselors. So, and I know that has, at least for me, being a, po a point of contention and uh, that arises in the, in the data that sometimes they are either called on or take the initiative of engaging in disciplinary matters that should not be uh, their purview or their role within schools. Um, so I, 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 uh, I also want to um, call, um, you thank President Revoluri for all his efforts on a resolution that we're gonna get to know in a few minutes about moving forward on this issue. And, um, you know, I also wanna thank all the principal students and uh, that uh, met with board members and really 
personally brought such insight and clarity to this issue, which is continues to be very complicated. And um, uh, and I, I my, then my last comment is actually a question. For those 17 schools that voted to um, not have SROs, will the alternative um, plans be uh, continue to be part of, of the central um, CPS budget? So, yeah, I mean, so we're working with these alternative plans um, that are mostly based on improvements and protocols at the school level. And so if you have a need for um, police, how do you reach out to those police? Um, where there are requests for additional resources, we are talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure that schools have what they need and we're committed to working with them ongoing. And as I stated, it's not a one and done. Um, and so it takes time. I mean, I personally have met with one of the schools who has voted to remove three times in one week. And so there's a lot of iterative around it. And, um, and I think that as we actually return to school in person, I think we're going to need to revisit these plans yet again. Um, though keep in mind that the plans take effect immediately because we do have people in the building. Yes. And so, um, you know, if that means administrators, teachers, our food service workers, everybody, everyone needs to be safe. And so even though SROs wouldn't have been there anyway, we wanna make sure that the safety plans are intact and we will continue to evolve them as well as for all the schools, by the way. So not just the schools we're talking about here, the whole district, um, we're, we're looking at all of our safety plans. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you've done. I mean, and I know this is like you say, this is not over. Um, it, and it, it continues to be very complex. But I also want to say publicly that I really believe that if we move forward on an strategy that would allow us to continue to be safe um, and secure within schools and continue to develop relationship with the police in the community, not necessarily inside the schools, that funding for um, whatever alternative plans that are that is central, I think is one of the issues that really needs to be considered. So thank you. Member Trust. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, JD, I want to thank you and your staff uh, for your hard work. Uh, again, I have to remind people up there, you know, prior to my appointment to the board, this is the issue that JD and I, uh, we've been participating in for a while, right, JD? <laughs> and, um, and, and, and yeah, it's just, there's this old saying I, I heard from somewhere where no matter what, how thin the pancake is, there's always two sides. And, and I hope to always keep that pancake thin because when we keep it thick, the further we get away from each other. And, uh, and, and I wanna make sure that, that no matter, you know, we gotta keep talking, dialoguing. I believe that this dialogue and all these conversations have, have, have made some improvements. Uh, this is gonna be people that's gonna believe all the way around. Um, one question I got real quick before I get back to some additional comments, if I forget, you know, I've seen your moments during my midlife crisis. Um, are the safety plans for the other 17 schools like going to be kind of like shared in a sense? Because I, you know, I believe that information may be important for other schools as part of the decision-making process of saying that, okay, if there's an alternate, does this alternate plan fit what we might want to uh, adopt as a, our safety plan if they choose to remove SRO? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm expecting that that will definitely be part of the long run conversation. Um, it's something that I'd like to update um, the board with. It's something that I'd like to update other schools with to give people ideas as we talk about these workshops. I mean, so one example, um, we have one school that we've been working with where the majority of their issues with that they needed SROs for was outside of the building. Actually, that's coming up a lot is the incidents are happening not in the building, but outside the building. And so what are some ways that we can partner um, to with other people, um, with school communities to do that? So in one case, um, we happen to have safe passage at that school. And the partnership between the community-based organization and the school is extremely strong. And so we're working out a protocol that would 
even further involve the safe passage workers in helping us to look for incidents before they happen. And so that's just a very simplistic way of describing it. It's actually much more in depth than that. Um, but that's just one of the ways at that school. There's several things that we have still have to work on at that school, um, but that's just one of the ways. And so we've already met with a community-based organization um, and they're going to roll that into their work that they are currently do again in partnership with the school. We're very excited about that. And I think that for them, it does work. There's a little bit of uneasiness by some of the school members, but you know, it's my responsibility to make sure that we have plans in place to keep people safe, especially our students um, inside and outside of the building. Uh, quick comment. Uh, you know, with this, the one, the one thing that was disheartening to me is the fact that even though we had the 54 schools that voted, and yeah, they're pretty much probably on the west south side of Chicago, it's, it's kind of reflective of our conundrum in terms of just the things that, that that's dealt with that, yeah, it seems to be simplistic to some other lenses, but for those of us, you know, who, who you know, and this is not, again, we all have different experiences, you know, no matter where we live and the issues are pretty much similar, but it's just that it was always has been important to me. And I don't think anybody have ever known me to say that we should always let communities have a voice in anything and everything that we do. Um, I'm not, somebody asked me, you know, the other day about picking a side. It's not about picking a side. It's about maximizing participation, different voices. And, you know, it, it can't be this zero sum game where it's, it's so absolute. You can have your different viewpoints and lenses and that's okay. It's just that what concerns me the most is that it's, it's, it's the, if you don't agree with me, Somehow you, you you don't like kids, you, you know, you're not concerned about kids' safety. And I'm, I'm human just like anybody else. Yeah, I get in that shape of dating. You know, we go way back when it comes to, you know, always constantly looking at the safety of the students, all of these, these, these different issues. And, um, but I just want to encourage everyone, no matter what the vote is, what the attention is, we got to keep talking. There's always going to be an ongoing conversation, ongoing dialogue you know, about this and, you know, in the disparagement sometimes of some comments I heard about the local school councils, you know, black parents take, took this seriously. Not, it's not perfect, but black parents, you know, were very intentional. They, they look, they look at it. Do, do any of us want, I, I talked to almost, every, you know, not the parents I talked to, would they want an officer in the school? No, they don't. Honestly, they really don't. But however, by necessity, it, 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 you know, you hope that it is not in the school, but again, I don't know every community. Uh, and that's why I say it is, it's for my position, it's like lead that discussion up. Now, when it turns to reallocating resources for different supports for schools, yeah, why, why stop at the SRO money? You know, it's like as, as the budget gets, our budget position gets uh, more, much more clear down the road, especially hopefully for next year, that we look into, finding dollars to allocate them to those programs that make sense, but also be mindful of the fact that we need to make sure that those resources are connecting, not just dealing with the student, but also dealing with the family. We, we have to bring families along with the child because it's, it's such a complex issue. And, but I want to be cautious like that, you know, having a social work in school and, you know, and I worked long and hard in years in schools trying to, do the best I can from, for all communities is that we got to be really intentional and thoughtful and, and just having a plan. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, board members. May I speak next, President DeValle? Yes, uh, Member Brom. Um, I too want to recognize the movement since our last discussion in June on the IGA and the work that our CPS leadership team did along with the mayor's team in navigating really tough waters um, to get to the point um, where we are with this current IGA. And it's been, in, it's been responsive in the funding so that it now is structured in a way that we pay for services we use as an approach um, and it's been responsive in many important ways to the voices of young people around more transparency um, 
and uh, the process to mitigate the risk of having an unqualified adults in the building and taking a stand about protection of student information and privacy and more clarity on the actual role of SROs and trainings of, um, for SROs. So I really appreciate that. I think these are important scaffolds to reform and I think they're necessary, but they fall short of addressing the research and the evidence that has been discussed for a long time now by youth activists and that we discussed at the last board meeting in June. Um, there's also been movement in terms of the, uh, the process with LSCs. And um, to Dwayne's point, um, I, I don't think it's an indictment of like LSCs who voted to keep the SROs. Um, I don't think that parents were making bad choices for their kids. I think it was a really hard vote and a really hard decision with not great choices. Um, and I think everybody voted with the intent to keep their school community safe. And um, the result, however, is that we have 55 schools that retain their SROs and they're disproportionately serving um, historically over-policed students and targeted students, um, primarily black students and diverse learners. And student voice in that process was recommended, but optional. And so some schools did do surveys and did include some student voice but we still hear from students that they did not have participation in the process, um, either through a student rep on the LSC or via survey or focus groups or other ways to really authentically engage students and learn from their experiences. I believe this underscores that while LSC involvement is critical, it does not uh, take a necessary whole system view of what's an issue of justice and a civil rights issue. If we pay attention to the data and the evidence about the school to prison pipeline, pushing this vote to the LSCs was not the right approach, in my opinion. Um, I will also want to mention principals and just thank them for their work here. Um, I think they've been incredibly engaged in this process. We've had principals meet with us and really share their perspectives about how they're implementing restorative approaches in their building and how that's transformed school culture and increased the safety of students. So I appreciate um, their belief in students. And as a former principal, I know that um, that work is hard and important and it is prioritized. So when we're talking about which schools are gonna work on a safety plan to Jadine's point, we know that every single school works with Jadine's team and works locally to make sure that there is a safety plan in place. And that has been happening for a long time. And that is hard work of, of principals and just wanna make sure that we acknowledge their courageous leadership and their commitment to keeping their kids safe. Um, the youth have tire tirelessly had the energy to resist. And I think this is a powerful example of a brilliant enacted curriculum. It's abolitionist, it's liberatory. And um, we have seen our youth make incredible sacrifices uh, with time away from their families and other obligations and, and endure lots of risk of bodily harm um, we've seen kids pepper sprayed, arrested, and as we're watching what's happening north of us in Kenosha, um, we're seeing kids in, in the street who are even risking their lives um, to really voice their concerns about police. Um, and all of this during the, the middle of a global pandemic, they're still showing up to claim the safety that they want and deserve. Um, they're doing strategic evidence-based work and uh, exhibiting so much courage and sharing their stories. I still believe very, very firmly that it is this board's duty to listen to the research and the research is conclusive that police and schools perpetuate trauma and harm and contribute to the criminalization of black students. I think it's this board's duty to pay attention to the evidence um, in our own internal da data that show the racial disparities of arrests and police notifications and that it disproportionately is harming black students. And I believe it's our work as a system to collaborate with our students and families and communities to identify and fund appropriate wellness, trauma-informed restorative practices that meet the needs of every school community. Um, I believe we need to follow the lead of other school systems and school boards across the country who are doing the same and to listen to our students and to vote no to this IGA. Yes. Any more board members? 
comments or questions? Board members, comments or questions? Mr. President, I have one more question for JD just real yes, quick. Yes, member trust. Um, the, the, the staff staff at each school who, who depend on what, what happens, if there's an SRO at the school, there's going to be training for the staff also to understand the roles of the, of the SROs? Yes, we're looking at um, school-wide, so whole school approach. Um, mm -hmm. the, the training that we're building with Lori Children's Hospital is focused on the direct um, interactions between staff and SROs from a trauma-informed lens. Um, we're looking to, in addition to that training, hold workshops with principals as well as um, their staff on how to move forward um, with the SROs. And we, we've learned from this experience that we really have to continue to improve our communication around ways to optimize the program and make sure that all the adults in the building understand what they're there for and what they're not there for. Um, in addition, we've gotten feedback from local school councils that this training is also important for school communities. And so it's our intention to work with uh, local school councils to bring this information to their sessions. Um, and we can design ways to make sure that people have access to that information. Um, for example, putting it on our website, um, attending meetings, attending workshops. And so we've learned a lot from this experience and we've heard people loud and clear um, that they really, they, they wanna be more engaged on this as chief of safety and security. Um, it's been very um, important to me to see so many people talking about school safety. And so it's my intention to keep that going. Um, and whether or not it's an SRO at the school or not, um, this has gotten a lot of attention and um, it's my responsibility to make sure that people have the information they need and that long story short, schools are safe. And um, to board member Rome's point, um, we're going to continue to up our, up our game and making sure that we're incorporating student voice in that. And um, I commit to this board to continuing to give you those readouts on how we do that. Any other board member? Okay, then Dr. Oh, Jackson. I'm sorry. Yes. I was oh. having trouble unmuting, my bad. Uh, Board member Todd that. Breland, please. Thank you. Um, I also just wanna say that I really appreciate the efforts um, that were made in the new IGA, um, particularly the issues around erecting new guardrails, um, recognizing also the difficulty in trying to get some of this data between agencies and the work that you put into trying to get some of that um, data out of sister agencies. Um, the efforts to try to mitigate harm um, that I think are, are evident here, and also the significant defunding of police and schools that's a part of this. And I think I also appreciate, you know, the young people and their allies who's organizing and protests really created the political context and space to even make these types of reforms. So my comments today are not actually questions for management about the IGA. I've said this to you all before, and while I, I really do appreciate the efforts that are made, um, I cannot vote for a measure that continues to keep um, armed police in our schools, who in my view are systemically criminalizing our children and particularly black children. Um, so my comments that I'd like to make today are really for my colleagues um, and some things to sort of think about as we find ourselves once again voting on this issue this summer. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about in the last couple of days is what's changed since June. So the research and evidence that police and schools exact harm on students, particularly black students, particularly students with IEPs, that hasn't changed since June. Um, the ways that SROs enter students into the school to prison pipeline, that has not changed since June. The data has not changed. And in fact, as we get more data, the racial disparities are only starker. And while, as, as Jadine pointed out, we see these overall downward trends in police notifications and arrests overall, which is really important. These numbers are still higher in schools that have SROs. And nearly 80% of arrests at schools are of black students. Police notifications for black students are double their proportion in the district. And so the research, the data and the evidence is clearly showing that police and schools are disproportionately harming our most vulnerable students. So again, what has changed since June? I think about LSEs and I'm a former LSE member myself. Um, LSEs have grappled with this decision to remove SROs from schools and 17 did choose to do so. And I'm confident um, that Jadine and her team will help those school communities to create new safety plans 
as they do for the 86% of our schools, now 89% of our schools that do not have SROs in the building. Again, the vast majority of our schools. But I also recognize that those who, um, you know, those Alyssies who voted our SROs out weren't given money for some of the restorative healing centered wellness supports in their place that have been part of other demands. Moreover, because of these individual LSC votes, Black students, the students already disproportionately harmed by police, will have SROs in schools at significantly higher rates than other schools in the district, meaning that the groups most impacted by police harm will continue to be more policed and criminalized in schools proportionally. And to me, this is why these incremental reforms and incremental reforms of policing in particular they often research those, they often lead to greater racial disparities and harm. And that's why to me, this is an issue that ultimately it should be decided by the board. We cannot solve a system-wide civil rights issue by shirking our responsibilities as a board and pushing it onto the backs of individual schools. So again, what has changed since June? The police have not stopped killing black people. Just this weekend, an hour and a half from here, Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back. When do we decide that the historic and ongoing racism of an institution policing that has proven itself incapable of reform, if not in our society, at least has no place in our schools with our children? This to me is not, again, and the research shows, this is not an issue of bad apples. This is an institutional problem. And the IGA is fundamentally saying that we agree to have this institution and the members of this institution with our children. So I ask this body, the Board of Education, what is your threshold for police harm? And when will enough be enough? Watching our student Denigma Howard be dragged down the stairs and tased by police in front of her father was not enough. Since June, the Chicago police have punched out the teeth of one of our recent graduates. That was not enough. Since June, our students have been corralled and intimidated by our local police officers in the loop using tactics that have been challenged in court. Was that enough? In these very same protests, a member of our CPS Student Advisory Council narrated the beatings of her peers by police, pleading for them to stop in the streets of downtown. Was that enough? What is the threshold to decide that enough is enough? And yet, and yet, in a city that greets our young people with raised bridges and riot gear, our students lead with joy and they dream a better future, a future free of police an institution that's historic origins rest in the protection of property, not their lives. These young people are deeply inspiring to me and doing what I think as educators on our best days, we hope they would be doing, right? They're advocating, they're calling out injustice, they're speaking truth to power, they're presenting data and facts to back their demands. Our young people, particularly black young people, and I think this is something that Duane was referencing, are sandwiched between violence at the hands of police and the interpersonal violence that is driven by poverty and disinvestment in their communities. But the policing hasn't helped. We have more police per capita in our city than any other city of our size, and that has not kept us safe. That has not made interpersonal violence and community violence go down. You know, I think about, and he was talked about earlier, our CPS student, who has also been a frequent speaker before and outside of this board, uh, the board offices, Caleb Reed, was tragically killed before he could see his work for police free schools become a reality. He's an inspiring young man who was trapped in that sandwich, but we have a way to address one side of that. We should be honoring and listening to our youth rather than serving as barriers to their data informed demands and rather than extinguishing their freedom dreams. What is the threshold? What more do you need to see to know that reforms are not enough we have the power to reduce the systemic harm and a systemic harm that requires a systemic response. And that is our responsibility. What has changed since June? The decision of this body can change. We cannot wait more months, more years to do what is right. We must act now in our duty and responsibility for the well being of all of the students in our system, but particularly our most vulnerable students. I see no other choice than, than for us to vote down the IGA and to remove police from our schools. That's all I got for President, uh, President Delvaro. Any other board members uh, comments? Uh, if not, we will proceed, uh, Dr. Jackson, with the next presentation. All right, um, the last presentation is an update on uh, school reopening plans. 
also you're going to hear from Chief McDay um, as well as Chief Chikumbaba over our Office of Network Supports and Helen Antonopoulos, who is the Executive Director for our SEO department. I, I, Dr. Jackson, I just want to check with the others. Are, are you having a hard time hearing Dr. Jackson? Am I the only one? Uh, I see Luciana shaking her head. Uh, maybe we can check that. Yeah, her, her, uh, I can hear her, but her tone is very low. Right, the same here. Yeah. Very, very low. Mr. President, I'm checking on that right no, now. Latanya can take it. She's presenting. Yep. So um, Dr. Jackson was introducing the next presentation, which is the reopening update. And I will be uh, sharing information regarding reopening. Um, I have with me our Chief Officer of Teaching and Learning, Shirley Chavaria, as well as our Executive Director of the Office of Social Emotional Learning, um, Helen Antonopoulos. And I also uh, will have our Chief Operating Officer, Arnie Rivera, share a few uh, brief updates in terms of safety regarding um, receiving our, our staff into the building. So I want to really just start by um, sharing a little bit about our reopening efforts. What is there, Danny? We have been working diligently to prepare for the start of school. The pandemic has changed almost everything about the way that we work and live. But one thing it must not change is our push towards the CPS vision. That vision remains our North Star, and we are as committed as we've ever been to providing every child from every community in Chicago with the high quality education they deserve. And at least for the start of this school year, it will mean helping children learn at home. We must be responsive to this moment in history without allowing ourselves to be undone by the roadblocks ahead. And we must remain fully committed to academic excellence and robust social emotional learning for every child, no matter where the learning is happening. I wanna share a little bit of information related to the rationale for remote learning. The decision for remote learning in the fall was informed by the feedback from the parents, 40% of elementary school uh, parents and 37% of high school parents did not plan for in-person learning. There was a variation in the decision by race and ethnicity where our black and Latinx families were less likely to send students to school. They shared concerns about student and family health. Those interested in in-person learning cited factors such as childcare, work schedules, and challenges with remote learning in the spring. And our staff also shared concerns about returning uh, to in-person learning. The other factor was public health data, specifically positivity rates approaching 5% and increase and an increase in rolling average case of, of cases. Although we will be returning to remote learning in the fall, it will not look as it did in the spring. We do have some lessons learned from the spring. This past spring, we were forced to rapidly pivot into an instructional model none of us had, had ever imagined. Can we please change the slide? While we are proud of the work done this past spring to swiftly respond and meet the needs of our students, there's an opportunity and a need to strengthen remote learning. The feedback we heard this spring was consistent across students, parents, teachers, and school leaders. One, we need to consistently provide live instruction to students. Secondly, we need one platform to facilitate student and parent engagement. We also need to capture attendance as well as provide clear expectations for a teacher engagement during remote learning. And we need to help teachers implement remote learning best practices that are responsive to student needs. In the year ahead, we seek to collectively respond to these lessons learned. Can we please move to the next slide? We must ensure that we provide students the opportunities that would typically be afforded to them during in-person instruction. This includes direct instruction, peer-to-peer -peer interaction, small group instruction, structured intervention, as well as multiple means to demonstrate mastery and direct teacher support. Providing this experience to every single student in our district will be no easy task, but it is the right North Star to set. We are no longer only responding to a crisis. We are carrying forward our mission and vision for this district. So I want to share some instructional priorities uh, in, the years ahead, in the years ahead. Can we please share the slide on instructional priorities? We have six key instructional priorities. 
that will be critically important to student success, no matter what learning model we are in this year and should guide all of our instructional decisions make decision making and provide us with a common focus. We're not only opening the year learning remotely, we are responding to disrupted learning in the spring, racial unrest in our city, the impact of prolonged social isolation, and the need to continue to close the opportunity gap. For this reason, we must remain focused on the following. Prioritizing social emotional skill development, relational trust and building strong classroom communities as the foundations for learning, providing all students grade level standards aligned instruction, regardless of their starting points, ensuring curriculum materials are high quality and provide coherent academic experiences for all of our students. We also are committed to increasing the relevance of instruction, use assessments that meaningfully collect, connect curriculum and provide teachers with the information needed to help students access priority grade level work. And finally, anchoring instruction in equity to meet the needs of all students. Our Chief Officer of Teaching and Learning will provide us with some expectations on remote, remote learning, but before I invite uh, Shirley to share that, I would like to ask our Chief Operating Officer, Arnie Rivera, to just share a few brief updates on how we are prepared to ensure the safety of our staff as they return to our buildings. Thank you, Chief McDade. As we prepare to receive a small number of staff members back into our buildings in the next couple of weeks, we continue to take a number of steps around ensuring the health and wellness of our staff as informed by guidance from CDC, IDPH, and CDPH, and implemented in conjunction with our Office of Health and Wellness led by Dr. Fox. These include the issuance of cloth face coverings for all of our staff members, the use of a symptom screener questionnaire each day they are planning on entering a CPS building, along with temperature checks, a contact tracing system implemented in partnership with CDPH, upgrades to our HVAC and building automation systems at all of our schools to ensure that the systems are operating properly, including the replacement of all filters, stringent cleaning and disinfecting protocols every day in each of our schools. With these investments and protocols, we feel confident in our ability to keep the relatively small number of staff members safe as they enter our buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Arnie. Now I will turn it over to our Chief of Teaching and Learning, Shirley Chavaria, to walk us through the remote learning expectations. Thank you, Chief McDade. This year's expectations for remote learning were informed by the lessons learned from this spring and feedback received. Further, they're designed to advance and support the instructional priorities previously articulated. This year, we are focused on seven key expectations. Number one, Use the Google Education Suite to facilitate remote learning. By focusing on this, we'll be able to ensure that parents and students receive streamlined information about how to access remote learning and also allow us to provide centralized supports to teachers, students, and parents to ensure the advancement of best practices. Expectation number two is to provide daily remote learning that meets instructional minute requirements for all content areas for all students to ensure that all educators provide live video instruction and are synchronously available to students during the entirety of the contractual day. By setting this expectation, we are seeking to ensure that students receive a comparable instructional experience to that of in-person learning. Number three, focus on grade level standards, aligned instruction and students' social emotional needs. We want to ensure that we remain committed to academic progress while acknowledging and attending to the social emotional impact of this moment. Number four, submit and monitor student attendance daily. Through this expectation, we will comply with ISBE requirement while also having an accurate, accurate capture of student daily participation. Number five, ensure every student has digital access. We want to make sure that every student has access to daily instruction and we will do so by committing to supporting every student in having access to a device and connectivity. Number six, ensure clear communication with family and students. We wanna make sure that the district and school level communication make it easier for families to understand how to engage in remote learning and also how to support their students' continued academic progress. 
Finally, expectation number seven is to establish effective structures to facilitate professional development, staff collaboration, planning, feedback, and continuous improvement in the remote environment. We know that adapting to this moment will require a collective commitment to continuous learning, and we're prepared to support these new learning demands at a district and school level. Next slide. As part of our remote learning guidance, we have set synchronous and asynchronous expectations per grade band. We recognize that different developmental stages require different thresholds for synchronous learning. We have provided sample schedules that are linked in the remote learning guidance. Here on this slide is a sample of some of that guidance. On this slide, you can see that in K through two, students will spend their day evenly split between synchronous and asynchronous learning, three hours for each. We are recommending and guiding schools to ensure that synchronous time is not delivered as a continuous block of time, but rather that it be chunked throughout the day. On this following slide, you'll see an example of a third and fifth grade morning. You can see the sample in our remote learning guidance. In grades three through five, students are expected to engage in 205 minutes of synchronous instruction and 155 minutes of asynchronous instruction per day. In this example, students start the day with 60 minutes of synchronous literacy minute instruction and 30 minutes of synchronous social science instruction. Then students move into an hour of asynchronous independent practice. This does not necessarily have to be screen time. Students may engage in non-digital tasks such as independent reading. However, during this time, educators may be doing various activities such as pulling students into small groups for structured intervention, providing small group support to students who need support with asynchronous tasks or offering structured office hours. In this schedule, the student then moves into a break for their day before they then engage in their special arts time. Through this schedule, we show how students can receive a full day of instruction while allowing for ample breaks and multiple modes of student engagement. On the next slide, you'll see that our guidelines for high school do not set specific daily minute thresholds. This is due to the fact that each high school in our district has unique schedules with varying lengths of time for course. Instead, we have set a threshold of ensuring that on a daily basis, each course represents 80% of its time as synchronous instruction and 20% as asynchronous. High schools should keep their transition periods in their schedule so that staff and students can still transition across courses and have opportunities for breaks. Through this structure, we aim to guarantee that high school students will receive daily instruction from all of their teachers, have meaningful structured learning opportunities to engage with their peers, have opportunities for collaborative work and receive direct support from their teacher. I'd now like to turn it over to Helen Antolopoulos to share with you more about our planned supports for students and staff. Thank you, Chief Shevaria, and thank you to everyone, and good afternoon. As Chief Shevaria mentioned, and even as Chief McDade acknowledged, um, and as you may have even seen in our instructional priorities, social emotional learning, skill development, supports are more important than ever and are a critical element of our school reopening plan. It was very important for us uh, that these plans, as we put them together, honored our shared commitment to our students, to one another, and our commitment to our collective care. In developing the guidance that school leaders and educators have received, our office, along with many of the other departments that contributed, recognized the impact of our current and historical events in shaping the experiences and impacting our lives, and especially the lives of our students. Nonetheless, uh, we do see this, although it's an uncertain time and an unusual time, as a time of opportunity. It's a time that we can re-emphasize our commitment uh, and value for social emotional learning and for our students' mental health and to foster uh, the environments, the relationships um, that help to promote the protective factors that strengthen their resilience, their recovery, and that foster our repair. Most importantly, it is truly an opportunity for us to become healing centered. And as we'll see on our next slide, um, the timing is appropriate for us to focus on this. So I'm pleased to share with you a little bit about our Healing Centered Project. This is actually an initiative uh, through the vision leadership of Dr. Jackson and Chief McDade that we began a year ago, about a year ago this time. And the purpose of it was that we would develop a framework 
for responding to trauma across our district and across our stakeholders. Certainly since um, our first meetings, uh, the vision and the purpose um, and the evolution of this project has been impacted by many things. But when we started, our first priorities were to ensure that it is aligned to our five-year vision, to promote the development of a whole child, to support talented and empowered um, educators, uh, and to support all of our um, collective stakeholders. We also wanted to make sure that the Healing Centered Project was aligned to our equity framework and recognizing that um, the work of the Office of Social Emotional Learning and that the projects of the Healing Centered Framework really are meant to be a lever towards that equity. But so much has happened since we first started. And one of the most recent things certainly is the impact of COVID. So as we began to design the supports or services we would make available to students and staff, when we began to think about the impact of trauma and what that looks like, we had to also consider the impact of COVID um, and our most recent and continuing social and racial injustice um, and unrest as we developed our plan. Ultimately, however, and without um, loss of focus, uh, our ultimate goal is to help our district to become more trauma engaged and culturally responsive as a school district. There are things we are already doing towards this goal, but we wanted to make sure that we truly were meeting that vision um, of our five-year vision, as well as the mission of our equity framework. So what I'd like to share with you now in the next slides are some of the ways in which um, we have used and relied on our trauma data to inform our plans, as well as then ultimately share with you some of the resources and steps we're taking to support our schools and staff and students in school reopening. First, to share a little bit about the research behind this project. We know that the research around trauma, and I, I was listening as, as you were just discussing, um, has an impact on our students both in the present and in the future. It impacts their learning and their life outcomes. And so for those of you familiar with ACEs, as adults, we see the impact of early childhood and trauma on adult health um, outcomes and lifestyles. We also see though the generational impact that it has on our students and their families. What we really know and what's most pressing for us is recognizing that trauma is fundamentally an equity issue, especially for our communities that have a long time been disinvested from um, where there's high rates of unemployment and violence and stress. And so the urgency for this work um, is ever present and our current context makes it all the more important. However, we also know that research shows that there are ways that we can mitigate these impacts. Um, the mitigating factors truly are relationships, environments, and interventions. And for those of you familiar with the work of our office, that is the core work and the mission of what we do. It is to build safe and stable adult relationships between and among students and staff and relational trust between staff as well. Safe and supportive um, school environments are also part of the ways in which we help to protect and build resilience. Again, one of the key features of our office. And without a doubt, we do know that despite sometimes those places and relationships, that there are some students that do need additional care and support. And that's when it's incumbent upon us to provide those targeted resources. So we know the research is out there. We know the impact this can have on our students, but we also know that there are things that we can do to mitigate that. Relationships, interventions, and services for support. Um, they are the things that will promote resilience, recovery, and repair. And these were essential elements to our school reopening plan. So what are we doing? How are we doing this? Um, our Healing Centered Project is a multi-year project. Um, and as you'll see on our next slide, we are certainly launching it this fall um, in a different context than where we began. But as I mentioned again, um, the guidance that was released to educators and leaders included information and resources around building supportive relationships, building safe environments, whether in person or in virtual worlds, um, how to support fostering those communities in that space for students, and how to continue to build students' um, social emotional skill development as another way for building protective factors. Each interaction, our message has been that each interaction between adults and between students, generally within each other, contributes to our collective success and resilience. For our students, um, we've made some other um, commitments and offered additional resources 
especially around supporting students who've experienced trauma. We know that maintaining routines are really important. And there is guidance, again, um, that we provided to schools and that we'll continue to support them with to help create those stability um, that's stable and uh, routine for our students and even for our staff. Um, we've also provided them resources for fostering that social emotional skill development and especially for addressing our students' mental health. One of the things that's unfortunate, um, one of the many unfortunate things that has come out of COVID and our current unrest is um, the social isolation and the increased stress um, and the trauma that our families and students are exposed to. And for us, when we look at our data from our students, we know that the call to action is even greater now than ever. In 2019, our district facilitated the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, and that's meant to be a representative sample from our students. They told us then, at that time, that they were engaging in behaviors that were concerning. We see that our high school students shared that they were feeling sad for long periods of time. We see that our high school students are telling us that they have seriously considered suicide, that our middle school students are feeling the same at twice the rate of our high school students. And if we think about our students who are GLBT, that rate is nearly 60%. So having that information, things that we were already planning to act on and knowing the impacts of COVID and unrest, it is a calling for us to do more and to do sooner. And so we're starting the year by making available to um, at least 150 schools, uh, a new curriculum uh, to support grief and trauma. It's known as rainbows and silver linings. In addition, we are committing to um, two specific cohorts of training uh, for our high schools, especially around um, structured supports for our adolescents experiencing chronic stress. And we're developing guidance and resources for suicide prevention and awareness. We know though that caring for our students also means caring for the adults around them. And so on our next slide, you'll see uh, some of the other initiatives connected to the Healing Center Project and to school reopening to support families, caregivers, and community partners. In particular, our Office of Family and Community Engagement has relaunched the Adopt-A-School model, where our faith-based institutions will be providing youth mentoring um, to separate cohorts of schools. In addition, uh, we're building a agency network, a community partner network, to help our schools connect to agencies that can provide supports and resources, and vice versa for those agencies to connect to our schools. Together, what we hope to achieve is for them to have sustainable and successful partnerships that support our students and their families. Ultimately, as we close out in our next slide, we'll see. Our instructional priorities are grounded in high expectations for all students, um, both rigorous instructional priorities, meaningful learning experiences, and accelerating learning, but also including the importance of social emotional learning, positive environments, and supports. And then lastly, that social emotional learning is important for all of our stakeholders. It's a top priority, not just for our students, but for the adults around them. We care for their wellness as well. And we are focusing, um, as we always do, but with greater urgency and intensity in school reopening around building those relationships, creating consistent and welcoming environments, and fostering those SEL skills. Thank you again for your time. I hope to, um, to continue to be able to provide you updates on our successes and services and welcome any questions or comments you may have. Does that conclude the presentation on COVID-19? That concludes the uh, reopening updates. Reopening? Okay, uh, let's uh, open it up for questions and comments. Board members? Uh, Mr. President? Yes, Member Truss. Yeah, uh, like some of these, uh, once you kind of develop this uh, resource guide, will um, like those families who have, you know, emails uh, within the system, like this is permission to be like email to the families or? Are you referring to the resource guide for um, community partners, for example? Or? Yes, for instance, yeah. any, any resources for the parents? Um, is it something we're gonna, is it something plan to send it to them proactively or something they have to request? Yeah, there's actually already a hotline established. And so um, where our parents can reach out for supports as well as um, a resource list uh, linked to our district websites. Um, we are currently curating another resource specific around mental health um, that we've made available to schools. 
It is on our SEL website, which is open to parents. Um, so that will continue to be available and continue to be updated. Yeah, I understand that it's, it's available to parents, but what about like, you know, like practically pushing it out, like with like whether it be robocalls, emails, et cetera? That's certainly something we can add to our agenda for sure. Any other questions or comments? I have a, a couple of questions then. Okay. Um, my first um, comment is to Chief Chavaria. And, um, you know, I was, I think, relieved to see that pre K is not included in the um, time that students need to be online because four and five year olds, that's it's quite demanding, but I still continue. And this is in no way a reflection of a, a negative on the wonderful work that I have written to everybody, I hope, saying that how much I appreciate the effort that every single person at CPS has put into this, um, creating a remote learning that um, allows to learn from what we, we uh, experienced in the spring, but also, and, and gets better. I, I do, there's something that I do worry about the K second amount of time. And although I, I celebrate that you are indicating that those, those three hours don't have to be synchronous, uh, you know, right next to each other, that they can be broken up. And that does bring an additional challenge for families because even for six, seven, uh, five to eight to seven year olds, which is more or less the average age of kindergartens through the third, second grade, adult mediation of learning through a screen is critical. We know that. There's a lot about what we don't know about, you know, uh, remote learning with young children, but that we know they do need an adult to be able to mediate and support and scaffold their engagement online. So um, I, you, I, I, I just wanna, I, I think I know, but I want to stress that this is very, very much in your thoughts and considerations as we move forward. Of course, there's things that are gonna be, have to be tweaked and adjusted, but that is one of my major concerns with remote learning and young children. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and uh, it, it demands a, a lot from the families and that are already stressed. The second comment uh, or question is um, to Helen. And I, I, I am delighted to hear that uh, social emotional learning and skills are being such an important part of this come back to school under um, the circumstances. Now, the emphasis on relationship, I think is so important for all students, but for younger students, again, that can be hard to develop relationship with a trusted adults through a screen. And I just want to, number one, recognize that I know that's a consideration and encourage you to continue to keep that very much in mind, um, particularly at this juncture of opening schools where the teachers don't have an existing relationship with the students. This is new. They're, you know, most students were promoted or this is the first time in school for the younger kids. So, I, I, you know, those are things that um, those, uh, many of you have heard me say this and I sound like a broken record, but I think this is, key to, um, you know, to, to keep very, very present as we move on to the actual start of the year. Thank you, absolutely, and we will. Um, one of the main, uh, we're offering many trainings, of course. Um, the key training that we've been offering with resources is around community building. And so exactly what you described is how to build relationships amongst new students um, in a new environment. And so that has by far been our most popular and that's something we'll continue to do throughout the first quarter. Um, and to your point about our early childhood, um, I also wanted to share the grief and trauma curriculum that we've selected mm -hmm. goes across all the grade bands. So it is as young as pre-K all the way through 12th. And that was one of the reasons we chose it because we recognize the impact of trauma and stress across all those ages. 
and the importance of relationships for those very young children who are um, sort of um, going out into the world. Uh, for many of them, this may be the, the first time in a group environment. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? How does this remote learning impact those experiences? So thank you. Board member Melendez, this is Janice. I just, um, I appreciate your comments earlier. One thing I wanted to just uh, clarify or was to get your uh, advice on, I guess, what is it that you recommend? You gave Shirley some things to consider with regard to the early childhood um, amount of time for synchronous and asynchronous learning. Um, do you mind sharing what your recommendation is? So I, you know, I, I think for young children, for pre-K students, three hours is way too much in front of a screen. Uh, the, the, what the little research that we have in regards to uh, young students with screen and screen time, I think gives like the top number, like half an hour and always with an adult mediating that relationship with. That I know may not be um, feasible or practical in this current circumstances. So um, my recommendation is to the, you know, the extent possible, continue to co talk to teachers what worked well during the three months that, um, that when they had to engage with their, particularly the pre-K students uh, uh, virtually. And we know that that engagement was slow, but some teachers were very successful and um, there were experiences that they were able to, um, to sort of create for the children to take full advantage of, of learning. Um, there's, I think, an increasing number of resources that are available. For example, videos, short, very short videos, no long, not long things, but where they can take maybe a virtual walk through a garden and then uh, share experiences. It's, it's to the degree possible, keep it in small chunks, provide opportunities for kids to talk about those experiences and encourage um, a, a lot of parental support and be very flexible in, you know, maybe a parent is working and cannot be while they watch the video with the class. Be flexible so parents can have that, uh, 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 that option of maybe walking there or taking a walk outside if they have, and then join the conversation at, at another moment. There's a lot that we don't know about this, but again, what the, what we don't know about young children um, and, and virtual learning is so. Uh, the Latino Policy Forum is going to put a, a document that I had the pleasure to facilitate a, a convening where some recommendations were given, but again, um, these are broad things. I think that in, in regards to the young children, we have to remain flexible and open and I think have a a, a, a way of, of hearing from those teachers that are engaging with, with families and, and children. And also talking to the parents, what is working? What, what would make it easier for you to continue to support the learning? Because families are a key element in this particular moment, but for young children, they're an essential element. They, they, we can't, the children will not be able to learn without their um, concerted support, in my opinion. So not, you know, not a lot of specifics, but um, some, yeah. some, some thoughts about young children. And, um, you know, I think that this is a conversation that is going on nationally, and I'm sure that CPS has already been engaging with some districts and even some institutions of higher education that are doing things around this topic um, of young children and remote learning. Thank you, Member Melendez. Uh, Dr. Jackson, did you? Oh, oh no, I was that? no, I, I think we were still hearing from other board members. I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. You know, I, I have a question uh, about the, the uh, 
the trauma and, and dealing with children, you know, it, a week doesn't go by and it's, it's very painful um, for me. Uh, and I do it anyway uh, because I have to know almost on a daily basis uh, to read the paper and, and look at the addresses of, of teens who have been shot um, and, and others who have been shot, children and teens. Um, and uh, that affects entire families. It affects brothers, sisters, uh, cousins, uh, neighbors. Um, how are we, particularly during this remote learning period, uh, how are we tracking, how are we then connecting with, with our students who are victims of gun violence and, and their relatives, their families, their brothers and sisters who are our students also? Um, are, are we using community organizations, uh, including the, the groups that are out there doing intervention work on the streets um, to provide the, the kind of uh, counseling and, and the support uh, that is needed uh, during this period of remote learning, uh, because I, I've lost track of the number of, of teens who have been shot in the city of Chicago um, since January. The number is huge. Um, and I don't hear enough people talking about how we reach not just the teens that are, that are survivors, uh, but also those who have been killed in, the, in their families and their brothers and sisters who are traumatized, of course, by, by the violence that continues um, on, on our streets and in neighborhoods across the city of Chicago. So how, how is it that, that we're connecting with those individuals? I know that, that uh, we place calls to, to families when we learn that a CPS student uh, has been a victim of, of gun violence. Uh, we place calls to the families and, and we make a connection, but uh, what's the follow-up after, after that call is made? I can speak a little bit to that. I'm not sure if Jadine is still on the call um, because her team is also part of that support process. And so the response to that kind of community violence and the impact that it has on our students um, is not the responsibility of one department, but many departments across the district. Jadine's department is often the first to hear about that or to learn that information. And she activates a process by which the rest of us become informed and involved. And so um, if Jadine's here, I'll let her speak a little bit. Um, I will also share with you some of the, the steps that I'm aware of and that our team is involved in. Um, so the first was, of course, that it is a partnership across the district, uh, including Jadine's team, the Office of Social and Emotional Learning, um, including the Office of Diverse Learners, um, even the Office of Counseling, and FACE, our Family and Community Engagement. So all of us collaborate uh, to wrap that student, that let, family, let, and that school yes. around. Let me ask you. We've done a lot of talking today about data. Yeah. And data is important. Do we have data on the number of CPS students who have been shot, uh, injured, and, or, 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 or killed um, in, in, uh, during this school year? Yes, we, we keep that. My office keeps that. Yeah. Thanks, JD. Um, JD, do you want to add anything before I talk a little bit about community partners, um, circles of support, or any of those things? Yeah, yeah I mean, just really quickly, just um, you know, and this is not unique to um, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this is something that affects our students, um, you know, even outside of the pandemic. And so the process, the way it works is um, whether we learn about it from the Chicago Police Department, whether we learn about it from a family member, from a principal, um, our team, my team is the intake. And so as Helen stated, we will activate the process. So once we become aware um, we send notifications out and um, the principal's notified, um, the Office of Faith Base is notified, um, and we create a plan. Um, social emotional learning is involved to the extent that we need a support plan for the school. Our crisis team is the first point of contact to the school to make sure that um, the school has supports they need. If, if there is um, an incident where a student's a victim of, of gun violence or a you know, worse homicide, um, we will create a plan that supports the staff, the children who knew the kid, um, as well as support the family and making sure they have connections to the right supports. The Office of Faith-Based Initiatives will also reach out um, to support the family on financial 
funeral support in the event that a child has passed away. Um, from there, there is an ongoing plan to make sure that um, the affected individuals, be it the family as well as the friends um, and the staff members who knew um, the affected child, um, that we have a, a crisis support plan and an SEL plan in place. Thank you, Jadine. In addition, as Jadine mentioned, um, one of the roles that we play in this is supporting the school. Um, and sometimes that means brokering resources for the school. An example I can offer and share with you is um, we do maintain relationships with many agencies, um, all of which have been approved by the district and gone through a vetting process. And so when we do learn of a, of a disconcerting event, of a sadness, of some sort of loss, or other needs that a school may have, oftentimes we become involved to connect the school to the agency. And so in the case of a student loss, um, we may connect them to family resources for counseling or other supports through those agencies. Um, this is something that Jadine's team also does. Uh, another example I can provide you is that when we um, needed to go remote, we were concerned that students who were already receiving supports might be disconnected from their therapists or mentors. And so the district made the swift and decisive decision to put safeties in place so those people can continue to support students in remote learning and even over the summer. And so those supports are still in place, those protocols, so that our students can receive mentoring and therapy in this virtual space without interruption. And so part of this process is if there are new students that are identified over the summer or through remote learning, that those students too are connected either to our internal staff here in the district or to external staff who may have a specific um, expertise and then lastly, one of the other supports that we provide is that we know it's not just the students who are affected. And so we do work with agencies, including our sister agencies in DFSS and CDPH to broker and connect um, families to services, as well as for agencies like Alternatives or Emoja to do circles of support for the staff. Um, you know, one family may be impacted, but that impact has ripple effects. Um, and I can give you an example of one of our networks that experienced many student losses and deaths this summer and injuries. And so we have created a new pilot where we've connected a mental health agency specifically to that network. And whenever there is a loss, that agency is sort of activated to respond to those schools. And so, um, as I mentioned, this is an unusual time, but we've also been more creative um, and innovative in trying to meet those needs. And those are some of the steps we've taken. But during remote learning uh, and because of COVID, uh, we don't have social workers going to the homes, do we? We um, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, I mean, my team has done done it both ways. So we have met with families remotely, but we've also gone to the home. You've done so. It really course. depends on what works best for the family. And in, in well, some and case. that's that's why I asked because right. if you can't make that connection, we need someone to go to the to the home and to the neighborhood and and find the persons that we need to work with. Right, I mean, that, that is one of the um, most important things throughout all of this experience is making sure that we have that connection, um, which means having the family contact info, um, having a phone number. Um, those are things that, again, are bigger challenges during um, COVID, but um, it's, it's either way, I mean, we, we have to find a way to connect to the family. The schools have been very helpful in um, knowing how to best reach the family. So even if we can't reach the parent directly, um, we often can reach another relative who they've been in conversation with. And so this is our goal. I mean, we're continuing to work to improve this process the longer the, the situation continues. Um, but you know, as Helen stated, it is truly intended to be a wraparound process. Mm -hmm. Uh, board members, any other questions or, or comments on this presentation? President Tov, I, I, I had yes, a uh, couple. Vice President Reverend okay, Thanks. thanks. Um, first, uh, I, I think someone was making a joke that this year, the word of the year should be unprecedented, but that would be true. Um, and I wanted to thank you for all your work through this truly unprecedented time through the spring, when, as you said, there was emergency remote learning through summer school, learning from all of that and coming up with a plan for the fall. Um, I'm really happy that you really foregrounded that the, our vision is about our students learning 
and we are keeping our eye on students learning this year. It, it's not just a question of how to get through a very unsettled time, but really making sure that they continue to learn and to progress. Um, I, I also wanted to especially applaud all the work that the team did to engage the community. Um, I, in conversations with people from other school districts, um, I think CPS has been unique in the degree to which uh, community input was not just heard, but actively solicited that both the plan, the options, the reasoning were shared. Um, and I really wanted to express my thanks for all your work to do that. Um, I had two questions looking forward. They may not be answerable now, um, but the, the first is basically how will we continue to, to learn and adapt and provide further supports as we see how this works and we recognize there might be rooms for improvement. And the second is how and when will we assess the, the health situation? How will we decide? How will we communicate the shift to a hybrid model if we're fortunate enough to be able to do that this year? The, the first question, um, I think you, you kind of answered with the question is that we will have to begin this process of engaging and learn as we start to implement um, some of the, based on the lessons learned from the spring, we're implementing some new things and we'll continue to capture data to make determinations on how we can continue to improve. Um, but we, we have to start the process to, to kind of capture feedback and understand better what's working and what's not working. The second piece in terms of making determinations for returning to in-person learning, as always, we're um, under the advisement of our health experts. So we work closely with uh, uh, CDPH and understanding what comes from IDPH and the governor's office to make determinations about um, how and when it's time to return to in-person learning. So we are we have a strong partnership with um, with the Chicago Department of Public Health, and they provide us with the, the data and the information that we need to be able to uh, work with the city and work with CDPH to make that decision about um, if it's safe to come back to in-person learning. Thank you, Chief McDade. I, I think the other facet of that is when and how we would communicate such changes, because I know uh, just talking with other CPS parents, um, there is a desire for some stability and certainty, even though things are constantly changing, maybe because they're constantly changing. And just if we're going to hybrid or if the option is there, would I find out Friday that it's happening on Monday or would I find out a month in advance? And those questions are coming up. Again, I don't know if they're answerable, but just One of the them. reasons that we, um, we moved to, made the decision to move to remote when we did was to do exactly what you're describing, to give our parents enough time um, to prepare and plan. And the same thing will hold true for any decision that will be made to um, move to some form of in-person um, hybrid in, in November will ensure that adequate time uh, for notifying families the same way that we did um, in this moment by engaging our families, sending out regular communications. Our CEO has sent out end of week communications almost every uh, uh, week, every other week since we moved into this space to make sure that parents are informed on what's happening with the district. And we'll, we will continue in that vein. Thank you. And I just, this isn't even really a question, but I was wondering if we could just, in Dr. Jackson, in your opening comments, you mentioned both Chicago Connected and the efforts that are being put into place to find community-based spaces um, for, for those who need help with supervision for their children if they have to work or whatever the case may be. Can you just lift up again, um, what are the best ways for folks to access those? I know clearly the surveys um, electronically, but after that is the next best step to contact your principal or is it to contact the central office kids number? I just wanna be able to make sure I'm pushing out the right information on that and just lift those up because I think it's so important and I'm glad it, you know, that the district is leading in these efforts. I can't hear you. Dr. Jackson, can the you unmute yourself? The survey is gonna be the best place to go and it ends this week. So we should um, continue to circulate that. Um, okay. We pushed it out through the, uh, 
email or Emma system that I talked about earlier. We've also asked our principals to share it directly with their families through their newsletters. Um, but uh, I think directing folks to the survey, we've also amplified it on social media. I'll lift it up again today and if you wanna retweet it and share. Once we get that list, because we are prioritizing families based on need and our capacity, um, we, we're going to start with the families in targeted communities who need additional support um, that are essential workers who, you know, but for this opportunity would really be in a, a position where they can't go to work. Um, so we want to provide some kind of relief for them. Um, and then based on our capacity and the need, you know, we'll kind of go down through a tiered system. Uh, but I'll send that out to you. Uh, I'll re-up that on my uh, Twitter feed and then you guys can, can re-amplify it from there. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments uh, before we move on? Uh, board members? Uh, did I hear someone? Yeah, presented by Edge. I just, I just yes. wanted to- Members to tell them. I just wanted to commend the, the team. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, rhetoric that that goods out there and uh we heard it's amazing some one of the speakers uh and i gotta tell you um i have not seen this much work and scenario planning uh in the background uh in truly trying to find a way to reach our students in the most effective way to get them to learn uh so i want to commend the entire team that has been uh, scenario planning all possible ways to get in front of the students. We all know that there is no substitute for in-person learning. And uh, I commend the, the administration and all the team in trying to find a ways to create a hybrid model to get in front of them, because let's not kid ourselves. Uh, this pandemic is only going to increase the divide. Uh, as much as we are trying to address it with all of the great work that we're doing through Chicago Connected with the, with the uh, devices that we're putting out there, the fact of the matter is, and, and Sendo alluded to this, the quality of education and the stickiness thereof, it's gonna have an ongoing impact. It's gonna have an ongoing impact in the subsequent schools. It's gonna have an ongoing uh, impact in jobs is going to have an ongoing impact to uh, college and, and opportunities at all. So I really want to commend uh, the, the entire team in all of the different scenarios and all the extra work that you put in trying to find a way to get in front of the, in front of the students uh, to help them uh, learn as much as possible in a safe manner. So uh, I know that there was a lot of requests, there was a lot of questions and uh, and you certainly have stepped up to, to the challenge. I also wanna uh, thank Helen in uh, putting some extra effort in behind the social and emotional uh, aspects of it. It's so crucial that we try to connect with, us, with the students. And listen, uh, it's not perfect, right? The, 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 what we're coming up with is not perfect. It really has been unprecedented, unprecedented but we got to make the best good faith effort that we can in order to address all the needs of our students so they can actually have a learning chance, a learning environment. And we need to connect with them the, the way you're doing. And if others have other suggestions, please send them in, right? It, this is not about Monday morning quarterbacking. This is about actually providing solutions that will get us to a better place. So if you have a better idea and a better suggestion, send them in because the team does listen as has been impacted in, in the revised uh, uh, frameworks that have been sent out. And listen, they will, they will, they will come to life as the team on the grounds uh, adjust them to the community and the different schools with the principals, with the administrations, and more importantly, with the teachers, right? Uh, at the end of the day, this is a framework uh, and there will be other best practices that will come up uh, as, as uh, they start to get implemented. And there will be bad practices and we can learn from both, right? And as we learn from the things that are not working, send those as well as the good practices so we can get to better and hopefully great uh, and hopefully in person as soon as we can. Okay. Thank you. 
uh, board members, we will now open up the floor for comments or questions on public agenda items. I would like to note that the following public agenda items, the capital plan, the budget, IGA, SROs, and the, the uh, our, uh, resolution 10 will be separate votes so you can provide your or have additional questions or comments once those items are up for a vote. Board members, are there any other comments or questions on the public agenda items? If not, we'll proceed. Uh, we will now proceed with the vote on public agenda items. Madam Secretary, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. I will begin with items on the public agenda, read the board report numbers and brief titles. For the record, as you noted, separate votes will be taken on RS2, the resolution adopting a final one-year capital improvement plan of the Board of Education of the City of Chicago for fiscal year 2021, RS3, the resolution adapting the annual school budget for fiscal year 2021, EX5, authorized entering into the amended and restated renewal of the intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Police Department of the City of Chicago for school resource officer services, and RS10, the resolution to ensure that the CEO and district leaders in consultation with school communities identify and recommend an alternative plan to ensure safe and supportive school environments. Mr. President, these separate votes will be taken after the last delegable board report on the agenda, which is AR1, and I will note that when we get to that point. Mr. President, I will continue with public agenda items that do require a vote. RS1 is the resolution regarding waiving the Illinois assessment of readiness requirement. We then have RS4, resolution authorizing the issuance of educational purposes, tax anticipation, warrants, and notes. RS5 is the resolution levying property taxes and authorizing and directing the filing of a controller certificate for fiscal year 2021 for school purposes. RS6 is the resolution levying property taxes and authorizing and directing the filing of a controller's certificate for fiscal year 2021 for the capital improvement, for capital improvement purposes. RS7 is the resolution authorizing payment to various providers for proportionate share of special education services to parentally placed private school students with disabilities. RS8 is the resolution authorizing payments to various providers for proportionate share of Title I, II, III, IV, USDA and ESSER goods and materials and services to private school students. RS9 is the resolution to authorize appointments of members to local school councils to fill vacancies. RU1, Mr. President, is to add section 6-6, health requirements on a final basis to chapter six of the board rules. EX1 is the transfer of funds. EX2, Mr. President, is to amend the current board report 140226EX6 to approve the holiday waiver. And that amendment, Mr. President, is to authorize the use of the school calendar to include the Veterans Day, November 11th for classes, parent teacher conferences, or teacher in service, or a teacher institute. And as stated previously, uh, this uh, allows the CEO additional flexibility in planning the school calendar by adding Re Veterans Day to the list of holidays that the district may use for classes, parent teacher conferences, or teacher in service, or teacher institute. If Veterans Day is used as a day of student attendance, schools will have a moment of silence and provide instructional activities on veterans. We then move on, Mr. President, to EX3. EX3 is to approve the 2020-2022 continuous improvement work plans for schools. EX4 is to authorize first and second renewal agreements with selected vendors to provide educational services to non-public schools. We then move on to ED1. ED1 is to amend the current board report for the calendar 200226 ED1 uh, to adopt the academic calendar for the 2021 school year. 
And Mr. President, uh, this amendment uh, to the school calendar will add the holiday uh, for November 3rd, 2020 as an election uh, day, state holiday per the new state law and to remove it as a day of student attendance. Uh, as noted previously, the district will also amend the school calendar to remove Veterans Day on November 11th, 2020 as a holiday and add it as a day of student attendance. We then have OP1, Mr. President. OP1 is to authorize the extension of the fourth renewal of lease with Ben Shalom Benai Sekhan Ethiopian Hebrew Congregation for the use by the Barbara Vick Village Pre-K Center located at 6601 South Kedzie Avenue. PR1, Mr. President, is to authorize the first renewal and amend agreement with Dorson Consulting, Inc. PR2 is to authorize the first renewal agreement with Careers through Culinary Programs, Inc. PR3, Mr. President, is to amend the current board report 190626PR3 um, for the second and final renewal agreement on the prequel uh, for the educational technology products. And this amendment, Mr. President, is to increase the spend authority from 2 million to 7 million and to remove various vendors uh, during this extension period. This amendment will also extend the term end date from October 31st, 2020 to January 31st, 2021. We then have Mr. President PR4. Um, this PR4 is to authorize the first renewal and amend agreement with ATI Holdings LLC. And for the record, Mr. President, I would like to note that PR4 will be withdrawn from the agenda. Moving on, we have PR5. Uh, this board report is to authorize the first and second renewal agreements with and new agreements with various vendors to provide safe Haven sites and services. PR6, Mr. President, is to re the report on the award of construction contracts and changes to construction contracts for the Board of Education's Capital Improvement Program. PR7 is to authorize the pre-qualification status of and first renewal agreements with various vendors uh, to provide school band and security uniforms, um, gym apparel, and spirit wear. PR8 is to authorize a second renewal agreement with Civic Solutions Group, LLC. We then have PR10, I'm sorry, PR9 to authorize the extension of the agreement with DDW government. PR10 is to authorize new agreements with various vendors for the purchase and lease of Windows and Chrome devices. And then we have PR11, Mr. President authorize a new agreement with Standard Insurance Company for life insurance, long-term disability, and voluntary benefit services. Mr. President, these items do require a vote. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll proceed with a roll call. Uh, Member Rome? Yes. Member Melendez? Member yes. Melendez, thank you. Vice President Revoluri? Yes. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. We have seven ayes and zero nays. Uh, these matters are adopted by the board. Mr. President, I'll continue with additional items on the public agenda that do not require a vote. We have FN1. This is the Chief Financial Officer Report for July 2020 on the emergency authority expenditures. Uh, PR12 is the Chief Procurement Officer Report for June 2020 on the delegated authority. We then have EX6. This is the report on principal contracts for new principals. And then we have EX7, the report on principal contracts for renewals, and um, AR1, the report on board report rescissions. Mr. President, these items just need to be accepted by the board. Please mark received and filed. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, we will now proceed with the separate votes as noted, and we'll begin with a separate vote on RS2. 
RS2 is the resolution adapting a final one year capital improvement plan of the Board of Education of the City of Chicago for fiscal year 2021. Is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second the motion. I second the motion. Yes, member Tyler, thank you. Mr. President, will there be any further discussion before proceeding with the vote on this matter? Uh, any more comments or questions? Uh, I don't hear none, so I think we can proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Member Rome? Yes. Member Melendez? Yes. Vice President Revoluri? I abstain. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. Thank you. And the tally stands at six ayes and one abstention. Uh, this matter is adopted by the board. Mr. President, moving on with the uh, separate vote for RS3. Uh, this is the resolution adapting the annual school budget for fiscal year 2021. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I second. And I will proceed with the roll call vote. Well, then. Let, let, let me let me ask if there are any other comments or, or questions regarding uh, the budget. If not, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll proceed with the roll call then on RS3 for the FY21 budget. Member Rome? Yes. Member Melendez? Yes. Vice President Revoluri? Yes. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. On the tally, Mr. President, we have seven ayes, zero nays, and no abstention. Uh, this matter is adopted by the board. Mr. President, we will now proceed with a separate vote on EX5. EX5 is to authorize entering into the amended and restated renewal of the intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Police Department of the City of Chicago for school resource officer services. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Is there a second? I second the motion. We will now open this matter up for discussion. Board members, any additional comments before proceeding with the roll call? Uh, hearing none. Yeah, uh, President Delay, yes, I have a uh, few things to say yes. about, about the IGA. Um, I would say that uh, in the past, um, the escrow program and the IGA in particular have had some gaps. Um, the IGA now contains the protections and procedures and guardrails about how schools work with police officers. Um, and so the IGA is where the, the oversight, the governance, the transparency, any consistency, any mandated training all live. Um, as a uh, uh, Chief Chow noted uh, the IGA has some significant changes from the one that this board passed last year around selection that's more intentional, um, has a clearer role for the principal as um, conveying the, the voice of the school. Um, both SROs and school personnel, I think, will be better prepared. And in particular, as several board members noted, will make it clear that SROs are not to be involved in disciplinary solution situations. Uh, which has been the case, but uh, clearly has not been um, standard practice in every school building every day, um, and that their purpose is to protect students. It's not to police them. Um, 
we have better steps to know what officers are doing. We have steps to know if the program is helping to keep students safe. Um, and we have a way for um, action when they're in, in situations where it's not, including an independent complaint process. And so this IGA is better than the previous one at keeping students safe, but it still has a lot of room to improve. Mm -hmm. um, the, as uh, both members Todd Breland and Rome noted, the evidence both here in Chicago and elsewhere in the United States raises many concerns about the implementation of SRO program and whether they are necessary or effective for student safety. But at the same time, it's not clear to me that the presence of FSROs is the root cause of escalated discipline situations or students' criminal justice involvement, or if it is one of several mechanisms. Um, I, I wanna make sure that, that we're thinking about what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that is that every school handles disciplinary situations in ways that prioritize student safety and student learning. If the police are getting called, rather than figuring out how to de-escalate the situation from within the school, we have to figure out what's happening and how to make that happen less. And whatever we do as a board, whatever uh, programs exist at a district, this is work that must happen at a school and an individual level. And with uh, this issue, whether it's uh, about discipline or safety, as with pretty much everything else in schools, student outcomes don't change until adult behaviors change. So if we remove SROs and the behavior of adults in schools doesn't change, we won't have addressed the problem. And I think our progress towards eradicating the school to prison pipeline, a worthy goal laid out by Chief Chow, could be stalled or slowed um, or worst case reversed. Um, and so I'm glad that this conversation has led attention to improving the SRO program, improving the IGA and shifting practice in schools, including the partnership with Lurie Children's. But there's a lot more to do to ensure that these changes are happening in individual schools every day. Um, school communities know what they need. Um, they have to work in partnership though with district experts to really create and implement alternatives to ensure all of our students are physically and psychologically safe and that they're supported in their learning and growth. This is an urgent need, but the process, if it's going to ensure that students and other stakeholders have voice and that the plans make sense and can actually be made a reality, uh, just can't happen overnight. Uh, like any change in schools, it will take time to make it happen. And so, you know, I think we have to figure out how to not only consider what happens with SRO program today, but also figure out clear plans about how students will be kept safe in our schools how we'll fund those, uh, those methods and to shift the mindsets and practice of the adults in schools so that we can actually achieve our goal of safety and success for all of our students. Thank you. Any additional comments? President, uh, I will continue, as long as I'm on the board, I will continue to work with uh, management. You know, again, thank you for the hard work that goes into this thought, my colleagues, all of us in this community stakeholders, because the ultimate goal for me, as I always say, is get this thing down to, to, to zero, but we just have to be intentional and at the same time, making sure that we're looking at, do, we're, we're connecting with all voices and stakeholders. Any additional comments? Okay, hearing none, please proceed with the roll call. Thank you, Mr. President. So we will proceed with the roll call vote for the IGA uh, on the SROs. And we'll begin with Member Rome. No. Member Melendez. Abstain. Vice President River Lurie. Yes. Member Todd Breland. No. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? 
Yes. And President Del Valle. Yes. On the tally, Mr. President, we have four ayes, we have two nays, and we have one abstention. We have the requisite votes for this matter to be adopted by the board. Moving on, Mr. President, we will proceed with a separate vote on RS-10. RS-10 is the resolution to ensure that the CEO and district leaders in consultation with school communities identify and recommend an alternative plan to ensure safe and supportive school environments. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? A second. Okay, we will now open this matter up for discussion. Board members, any additional comments before proceeding with the roll call? Mr. President? Board. Yes, Board I, Trust. Uh, uh, Member Trust. Uh, yes. Um, I just want to state that. Again, as I stated earlier, and I appreciate uh, Vice President Revoluri's uh, resolution because, you know, we do, when we talked about it, we do have to kind of give some real, alt you know, some alternative uh, plans to the local school county. We got to give them a menu option. It just, you know, shouldn't be SRO or nothing at all. But if there's some other alternatives, plans to be looked at and researched, you know, um, that I believe that, that that's the whole thing about having additional some type of something else. What if we do this in place of the SRO program versus okay, SRO or nothing? So that way schools and local school communities can have a, a menu of options that they can choose to look at. Uh, any other I'd, li I'd like um, to ask a question. I'm yes, unclear uh, what and perhaps Sendel can explain this. What is the intent of this resolution? I'm unclear what it does and doesn't do. It's a confusing document to me. Okay. Um, I'm happy to, if that's okay, President Del Valle. Yes, please. Sure. I, I've had many conversations with fellow board members and with others who have had similar questions to what uh, member Todd Breland just asked. And I, I think it would help to, to clarify the intent. Um, I think one thing that's been clear to me is that the, the discussion has largely been around the SRO program, but I think that's opened the door to um, a really important conversation about how to more broadly reimagine safety for our students. And you know, as Chief Chow has shared, as we've seen in, um, in data about CPS, uh, uh, alongside the academic progress of our students, the work on restorative justice, largely led by the Office of Safety and Security, has helped make progress at many of our schools. Uh, but practices that lead to adverse disciplinary outcomes or to police involvement still happen. Uh, and they are happening at schools with and without SROs. Uh, we, I believe, need to expand our thinking. We need to think about lasting change that benefits our students. And I think that means we need to provide schools with real alternatives and schools must change how they think and act around safety. And this is especially important for those students who are disproportionately affected by severe discipline, like out of school suspensions that deprive them of learning time and students who disproportionately are subject to criminal justice involvement. And this resolution is intended to move us forward so we are ensuring students physical and psychological safety by ensuring the district creates a plan for students to ensure safety without SROs. The, the timeline is intended to make sure that we do make progress, but allow both development of the alternative plans and allow time for engagement and feedback and revision so that the plan can be implemented at a, probably a, a significant number of schools. And so the resolution asks the district to develop this plan to offer schools a range of approaches to keeping their students safe, that those plans are based on best practices, 
that they give room to student communities to find solutions that meet their needs. And ultimately, they lead to aligned action by the adults so that we get the best outcomes for our students. And it's the responsibility of school communities, given our structure, to support school improvement. That's the core job of a local school council, and that's just as true for this important issue. And they need to follow an appropriate, open, and public process. They need to include the community to hear all members' voices, and they need to be informed about the facts of their situation and their options. And that represents some things that the district needs to do to, to help ensure that those steps happen. And if we can figure out how schools handle disciplinary situations in ways that prioritize student safety and learning, not calling the police um, because there are concerns, then we can get to the point where the school community works with and in partnership with district experts to implement these alternatives. And so a year from now, if we have a different set of choices for schools with clear alternative plans and a plan to fund those alternatives and a truly inclusive and informed process, I would guess the number of schools choosing to retain SROs as their plan for student safety will be different because that will be a different set of choices that's offered to schools than the votes that just happened this month. But I also recognize that every school is not the same. That transition could have a longer horizon in some schools than others. And that really it, what matters the most is that the adults in the building have a clear sense of how they can ensure that students are safe while not incurring all of these negative outcomes that are disproportionately impacting certain students. And so my hope is that this resolution clarifies what the options are and gives us a path forward that it takes into account the varied perspectives that many board members have mentioned and then says, this is the alternative plan that we as a board can select from and then that individual schools, if that's who's going to be making the decisions, uh, select from from there on. Can you clarify how that's different from what Chief Chow said earlier in terms of making safety plans already with schools and exploring um, options with communities, why, why, please clarify the need to direct the system to do this. Sure, um, because the safety plans that are made for, for schools at the moment, uh, including the 17 schools whose LSCs voted not to continue with SROs, as Chief Chow noted, they're relying pretty much entirely on protocols about how to deploy the resources that are already in the building. And so those are, you know, non-SRO safety plans, but I don't think they're the same idea as an alternative plan for safety. Um, and if we decide in the context of our vision and priorities, needs and resources as a district, that we are not in a position to do that, that, that may be the case. But I believe that we can get to a point where we are really providing different alternatives and not the, the choice that several board members raised earlier, that it's either an SRO or no SRO. And either way, of course, it is the responsibility of schools and the Office of Safety and Security to figure it out. It is absolutely our responsibility to keep them safe. But this changes the menu that we're selecting from. I think it clarifies the choices that are available. And I think it leads us uh, forward in a different way. I just want to... I'm still confused, I have to be honest, but I, I just want to say for sure this does not end the program in August 2021. Is that correct? I This is not a sunsetting of the SRO program. Is that correct? No, I believe that would be a board policy and would require. Okay, so that's kind of not action. something you're prepared to do. That's not something this resolution does. Are, are you, is that an intent of yours or no? I think we should be getting to that point. And then it requires five of us to to agree to that. Okay. Well, I just want to say, I, I still find this a, a confusing document. I feel like it has internal contradictions and is not clear to me in what actually would be implemented. So it's not something that I feel comfortable um, voting for because of those reasons. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, I have a question. Yeah, Member Melendez? Yes, uh, for Vice President Rivalori. 
um, you just said that you anticipate that this, that you hope or you would like to see, and if I'm misinterpreting your um, intentions, please tell me so, that you would like uh, the, us to move, or CPS to move, not necessarily us, but CPS to move towards a, a total uh, elimination of SROs in schools. Um, so it, do you think, it, why didn't you make that clear? In, in the document, why wasn't that a provision including it included in the resolution? Even not as a final and unique um, point, but as one of the things that maybe uh, board uh, the the board in its broadest um, um, interpretation. That means including management, including schools, excluding communities uh, would engage in thinking about. If I understand correctly, I think the main reason is that through the many conversations I've had with fellow board members, with students, with parents, principals, teachers, advocates with divergent opinions, I think the main thing that's really come clear to me is that the root cause of students' involvement with the criminal justice system is not solely SROs. I think there is definitely root causes in the community. We've talked about the effects of decades of segregation and disinvestment, but also there's effects that happen based on the choices of school communities. And I would say that school communities that decide that they need SROs when they have a different choice set, they are either responding to the realities of their situation in the best way they know how, or they might be also responding to their conceptions of what student safety looks like. And I think if we remove SROs as an option, that that would be good, but I don't think that removes the root cause. As we see in seeing the, the facts that there are students as young as primary grades who are becoming involved with the police because there is someone in the building who decides that the situation warrants involving the police. I don't know those situations. I don't know what I would have done in those situations, but that's not because there's an SRO in the building. There is a deeper root cause there. And I think we have to figure out how do we ensure that the people who are in our buildings have a path, have alternatives, and have a mindset that they are responding to disciplinary situations and even situations of genuine concern for student or staff safety, that they have other ways to respond to that than involving the police. Kendall, you said two things. One, you want to be certain what the options are and that's why you wrote this resolution. Can you sh point to the, um, the place in the resolution that actually makes certain what those options are specifically? And my second question is, um, you're bringing up the impact on students, but students are student voice um, is not a part of this resolution. Can you respond to that, please? Okay, I, I believe that's pretty clear in number one in the resolution that that we need that the resolution calls for the development of a plan that's provided to us as a board. That plan would have alternative systems of safety and specifically school safety plans without SROs. That's what it, uh, we, we have drafted in, in parts one and two, and that part two would require engagement with students among other stakeholders in each school community. President Galaya, can I have a follow Yes, uh, um, Member right Melendez. Please. I understand, you know, I um, your your point of view regarding that the negative impacts of SROs in schools are multi-layered and multi uh and that um, removing SROs will not necessarily have an impact on those larger societal um, negatives that we have associate with police departments now. 
the, if we look just at the, the impact on school, the research is pretty clear that there is, and you know, and still the the the, uh, the board, the, the uh, CPS data shows so that there is a disproportion in terms of who gets arrested and who is um, falls under the purview of SROs. That that is basic, primarily uh, black and brown students, and that their presence tends to um, worsen some of the, the traumatic experiences that we've mentioned before. Uh, so, you know, although I, I, I understand the need for community engagement and for ultimately um, giving me, uh, communities some flexibility if they want to keep their, um, their SRO, I think that in regards to our role as board members, do you don't you think that it, that the, the 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 impact that they the negative impact that they have on students of color sort of justifies our advocating or working towards or um, trying to to get uh, police officers out of school, not out of communities. I, I think that that is a different uh, agenda that pertains to uh, other organisms, not to the school board of education, but in regards to the negative impact, the trauma that is, has been shown by, the, by the, the research, that's pretty clear that there, you know, and, and that it, there's not a counterbalance of research that says, you know, they have all these, they bring all these advantages, however. Um, I would say that the issue really is that we as board members and even district leadership are not the ones who are in schools interacting with students every day. And it's really the choices that educators make, whether it's a safety situation, whether it's a disciplinary situation that starts the ball rolling towards either a restorative outcome or one that is less positive for students' safety and students' learning. And so to me, it's pretty clear. And if I were an LSC member and I were voting, I would take what you've just described uh, as understanding what we know about such programs and how they, um, how their outcomes, positive and negative, affect students and communities. And I would take my knowledge of the school community and I would make a decision. But I think it's on us, it's on our shoulders as a board and as district leadership to offer a choice that makes sense if the LSCs are the deciding bodies. And at the moment, I'm not comfortable that we're doing that. I think we need to take a step forward so that we're actually offering a choice to do so. I would also say that uh, I think I, I have come to understand the perspectives of uh, people with whom I think I share values, but may not uh, agree on the best course forward. And I think I don't know that making a black and white decision is going to get us to a better outcome for students. I think it is definitely more straightforward, um, but what matters is what happens in each of our school buildings every day of the year. And I would like that change to happen. I would like that change to be sustainable. And that, in my experience, working for educational change at the level of the classroom, uh, with small school districts, with multiple districts, uh, in multiple schools, changes that are imposed don't always lead to the outcomes that we desire. We need to create a path so that the adults in the building are pursuing a different approach to student safety and to student discipline. If that would happen without this resolution, that's totally fine. Um, I have sensed a lot of alignment on the goal, but some discomfort about the timeline. My, 
my attempt here is to clarify what we're doing, which apparently I've only partially succeeded at, um, and also to clarify the timeline so that we have a chance to look at something concrete and not um, only at abstract intentions, because even among people who state that they share the same aspirations, there have been extremely uh, heated conversations and disagreements, and I've been part of many of them, tens of them, over the last couple months. Uh, and I'm sure fellow board members have, and I'm sure hundreds of those are going on all around the city, including at LSC meetings. Um, and so I think once we're talking about a plan, we can have a very different conversation that will position us to move forward in a way that we have not been able to until this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your uh, Senator, your, the resolution in the uh, resolve section starts off by saying no later than March 21st, 24th, uh, the CEO shall provide to the board a comprehensive plan for schools currently using SROs to phase out their use. That line indicates if you vote for this resolution, if I vote for this resolution, it indicates that I support phasing out SROs. And phasing out means phasing out. That means that at some point, there will not be SROs in schools. That's the intent here. Um, yes, there's no timeline attached to that, but the exact timeline in terms of when that process is completed but there is a timeline for developing the comprehensive plan that comes to back, back to us as a board uh, that will result in the phasing out of SROs. And so if I'm not reading that correctly or interpreting that correctly, uh, Vice President Revoluri, can you correct me? Uh, absolutely, yeah, I, uh, with respect, I, I don't think that is a correct reading. Uh, it, the resolution calls for the provision of a plan. A plan has to have a date or else it's just an aspiration. The issue is that the way that we have posed the decision to LSCs this last month, it's for a year. And so next August, my understanding is that they would be making a decision again. And for them to have a real decision, they have to have both the understanding of what the status quo looks like to continue with the SRO program and what the alternatives look like. And so it's certainly there in the, the lead to the, the resolved section, as you mentioned. Um, and it's also there in number four, that there has to be a plan that could be implemented in August of next year because otherwise that's not really an alternative. That is, you can have a plan that says, well, this is what we're going to do at some point, but that is not an alternative that a school could select at that point. And so that's the importance of the timeline. And certainly the schools, the 55 schools that um, if there is in-person learning in some way this year that are using SROs to, uh, as part of their safety plan, they would be phasing out their use because they would be going from having SROs to selecting a different option. But I want every one of those schools to have that option. And so the plan that the district provides has to provide that option to every one of those schools. That is the intent of what I've written. I don't know if that helps, so please feel free to, to ask further questions. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, well, let's proceed with the roll call. Thank you, Mr. President. So we'll proceed with the roll call on RS10 for the resolution to ensure that the CEO and district leaders in consultation with school communities identify and recommend an alternative plan to ensure safe and supportive school environments. We will start off the roll call by uh, calling member Rome. No. Member Melendez. Abstain. 
Vice President Rivaluri. Yes. Member Tad Breland. No. Member Truss. Yes. Member Sotelo. Yes. And President Del Valle. Yes. Mr. President, the tally on the votes are, we have four affirmative votes. We have two nays and we have one abstention. This matter is adopted by the board. We have the requisite votes. We will now proceed with vote on executive session items. Madam Secretary, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. I will continue with executive session items from the General Council. These items do require a vote. The first report is to authorize continued retention of the law firm Salvatore Prescott Porter and Porter PLLC. The second report is the workers' compensation payment for lump sum settlement for Gerarda Loera, case number 19WC023873. The third report is workers' compensation payment for lump sum settlement for Patricia Sanders, case numbers 17WC008126 and 17WC008127. The fourth report, Mr. President, is workers' compensation payment for lump sum settlement for Raymond P. Santiago, case number 18WC14764. Mr. President, these items do require a vote. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, I'll proceed with a roll call. Member Rome. Yes. Member Melendez. Yes. Member Tad Breland. I'm sorry, Vice President Rebeluri? Yes. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. We have seven ayes and zero nays. These matters are adopted by the board. Mr. President, I will continue with an item from the Chief Executive Officer. This item does require a vote. This board report is to adopt finding that pupils are non-residents of the City of Chicago indebted to the Chicago Public Schools for non-resident tuition. And Mr. President, this item does require a vote. Is there a motion? So moved. I second the motion. Thank you, Board Member Melendez. We'll proceed with a roll call vote. Member Rome? Yes. Member Melendez? Yes. Vice President Rivaluri? Abstain. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. We have six ayes and one abstention. We have the requisite votes. This matter is adopted by the board. Mr. President, I will continue with items from the board. These items do require a vote. The first report is the resolution approving the Chief Executive Officer's recommendation to dismiss educational support personnel. The second report is the resolution approving the Chief Executive Officer's recommendation to dismiss probationary appointed teachers. And for the record, I would like to note that on August 21st, 2020, the board members and the office of the board received the CEO's recommendation to dismiss probationary appointed teachers pursuant to board rule 4-1 and 105 ILCS 5 slash 34-84. Her recommendation included the names of the teachers affected and the reasons. She also noted that the teachers affected will be notified of their dismissal after adoption of the resolution. And the third report, Mr. President, is the resolution authorizing the honorable termination of regularly, regularly certified and appointed teachers. And Mr. President, these items do require a vote. Is there a motion? So moved. 
Second. Is there a second? I second the motion. Thank you, Member Sotelo. I'll proceed with a roll call. Member Rome? Yes. Member Melendez? Yes. Vice President Rivaluri? Yes. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. Mr. President, we have seven ayes and zero nays. Uh, this, these matters are adopted by the board. Mr. President, and I believe board mem, I'm sorry, Vice President Rivaluri has a motion, please. Uh, I move that the record of proceedings of the regular board meeting of July 22nd, 2020, prepared by the board secretary be approved and that such records of proceedings be posted on the Chicago Board of Education website in accordance with section 2.06B of the Open Meetings Act. Is there a second? A second the motion. Thank you, I'll proceed with a roll call. Member Rome? Yes. Member Melendez? Yes. Vice President Rivaluri? Yes. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. We have seven ayes and zero nays, Mr. President. This motion is adopted by the board. Mr. President, I will continue with a real estate item and this item does require a vote. This board report is a resolution designating 5252 North Long Avenue, 5228 North Long Avenue, 5205 North Lieb Avenue, and 5410-12 West Foster Avenue for the former St. Cornelius School and contiguous properties for potential acquisition. Mr. President, this item does require a vote. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I second the motion. Thank you. I'll proceed with a roll call. Member Rome? Yes. Member Melendez? Yes. Vice President Rivaluri? Yes. Member Tad Breland? Yes. Member Truss? Yes. Member Sotelo? Yes. And President Del Valle? Yes. Mr. President, we have seven ayes and zero nays. This matter is adopted by the board. And Mr. President, there are no further items on the executive agenda. Thank you. And um, before we adjourn, I want to thank all the board members um, for the tremendous amount of time um, and effort, uh, energy that it, they have put into all these matters that were here before us today. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Elizabeth and, and Amy for all their work, uh, initial work. Um, on, on the SRO issue and, for, and thanks Sendo for, for the amount of time that he also spent on that issue. Uh, and of course, all of you, um, I think uh, your contributions have uh, made a tremendous difference in, in how we deal with the capital budget. I think we'll see some, some major improvements in that process for next year as a result of, of uh, of your very thoughtful and insightful questions and, and, and comments that were made during the briefings on the capital budget as, as well as uh, with individual contacts. Uh, I, again, um, I, I wanna thank Elizabeth for, for coming up with, with some very, very important questions uh, that have led to uh, a number of uh, ideas for, for changes. Uh, and so um, I, I don't think people realize you, that even though we do have these long meetings and today we've been at it for six hours, there, there are a lot more hours that go into all this prior to the board meeting on the part of board members. Um, and, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on this and people don't realize how much goes into it, um, but we do it. And because every board member believes strongly in, 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 in the work of this, of this board, uh, and in the work of CPS. Um, and I wanna thank uh, uh, Dr. Jackson and, and, and Latanya and, and, and Arnie and all the, uh, all the staff um, that worked very, very hard to get questions uh, 
to, uh, to get questions answered and, and to respond to all the, all the issues that have been raised and, and for their commitment to, to uh, help us to continue to, to improve the process um, that we de deal with uh, around the capital budget and the operating budget. Um, this is, as I indicated, um, the vote on the budget it is one that leaves us uh, not feeling fully satisfied, of course, because we don't know what lies ahead of us. Uh, we don't know what we'll, what we'll have to do within the next several months. Um, but we know that, that through our work, uh, we are moving the system forward. Um, and every board member is acting in what they feel is the best interest of our students, our families, um, and our, our, our city. So once again, thank you for all your work. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.